Chapter 1 Nightmare Begins A frail-looking young man with pale skin and dark circles under his eyes was sitting on a rusty bench across from the police station. He was cradling a cup of coffee in his hands, not the cheap synthetic type slum rats like him had access to, but the real deal. This cup of plant-based coffee, usually available only to higher rank citizens, had cost most of his savings. But on this particular day, Sonny decided to pamper himself. After all, his life was coming to an end. Enjoying the warmth of the luxurious drink, he raised the cup and savored the aroma. Then, tentatively, he took a small sip and immediately grimaced. Ah! So bitter! Giving the cup of coffee an intense look, Sonny sighed and forced himself to drink some more. Bitter or not, he was determined to get his money's worth, taste buds be damned. I should have bought a piece of real meat instead. Who knew actual coffee is so disgusting? Well. It's going to keep me awake, at least. He stared into the distance, dozing off, and then slapped himself in the face to wake up. TSK. What a ripoff. Shaking his head and cursing, Sonny finished the coffee and stood up. Rich people living in this part of the city were rushing past the small park on their way to work, staring at him with strange expressions. Looking haggard in his cheap clothes and from the lack of sleep, unhealthily thin and pale, Sonny was indeed out of his place here. Also, everyone seemed so tall. Watching them with a bit of envy, he tossed the cup into a garbage bin. I guess that's what three full meals a day would do to you. The cup missed the bin by a wide margin and fell on the ground. Sonny rolled his eyes in exasperation, walked over and picked it up before carefully putting it in the trash. Then, with a slight grin, he crossed the street and entered the police station. Inside, a tired-looking officer gave him a quick glance and frowned with obvious distaste. Are you lost, boy? Sonny looked around with curiosity, noting reinforced armor plates on the walls and poorly hidden turret nests in the ceiling. The officer, too, looked scruffy and mean. At least police stations remain the same wherever you go. Hey! I'm talking to you. Sonny cleared his throat. Uh, no. Then he scratched the back of his head and added. As demanded by the third special directive, I am here to surrender myself as a carrier of the nightmare spell. The officer's expression instantly changed from irritated to wary. He looked the young man over once again, this time with piercing intensity. Are you sure you are infected? When did you start showing symptoms? Sonny shrugged. A week ago? The officer became visibly paler. Shit. Then, with a hurried motion, he pressed a button on his terminal and bellowed. Attention. Code black in the lobby. I repeat. Code black. The nightmare spell first appeared in the world a few decades ago. Back then, the planet was just starting to recover from a series of devastating natural disasters and subsequent resource wars. At first, the emergence of a new disease that caused millions of people to complain about constant fatigue and sleepiness did not attract a lot of attention. But when they started to fall into an unnatural slumber, with no sign of waking up even days later, governments finally panicked. Of course, by then it was already too late, not that an early response could have made any difference. When the infected started dying in their sleep, their dead bodies turning into monsters, no one was ready. Nightmare creatures quickly overwhelmed national militaries, plunging the world into complete chaos. No one knew what the spell was, what powers it possessed, and how to fight it. In the end, it was the awakened those who survived the first trials of the spell and came back alive who put a stop to its rampage. Armed with miraculous abilities earned in their nightmares, they restored peace and created a semblance of a new order. Of course, it was only the first of the catastrophes brought upon by the spell. But as far as Sonny was concerned, none of it had anything to do with him, not until a few days ago, that is, when he first started having trouble with staying awake. For an average person, being chosen by the spell was as much of a risk as an opportunity. Kids learn survival skills and fighting techniques in school, on the off chance of being infected. Well-to-do families hired private tutors to train their children in all sorts of martial arts. Those from the Awakened clans even had access to powerful legacies, wielding inherited memories and echoes in their first visit to the dream realm. The richer your family was, the better your chances of surviving and becoming an Awakened were. But for Sonny, who had no family to speak of and spent most of his time scrounging for food instead of going to school, being chosen by the spell presented no opportunity at all. 
To him, it was basically a death sentence. A few minutes later, Sonny was yawning while several policemen were busy putting him in restraints. Soon he was fastened into a bulky chair that looked like a weird mix between a hospital bed and a torture device. The room they were in was situated in the basement of the police station, with thick armored walls and a formidable-looking vault door. Other officers were standing near the walls, with automatic rifles in their hands and grim expressions on their faces. Sonny did not particularly care about them. The only thing he could think about was how much he wanted to sleep. Finally, the vault door opened, and a gray-haired policeman walked in. He had a seasoned face and stern eyes, looking like someone who had seen a lot of terrible things in his life. After checking the restraints, the policeman glanced quickly on his wristwatch and then turned to Sonny. What's your name, kid? Sonny blinked a few times, trying to concentrate, then shifted uncomfortably. Sunless. The old policeman raised an eyebrow. Sunless? That's a strange name. Sonny tried to shrug, but found himself unable to move. What's so strange about it? At least I have a name. Back in the outskirts, not everyone even gets one. After another yawn, he added. It's because I was born during a solar eclipse. My mom had a poetic soul, you see. That's why he got this weird-ass name and his little sister was called Rain, back when she still lived with them, at least. Whether it was the result of poetic imagination or simple laziness, he did not know. The old policeman grunted. Do you want me to contact your family? Sonny simply shook his head. There's no one. Don't bother. For a second, there was a dark look on the policeman's face. Then his expression turned serious. All right, sunless. How long can you stay awake? Ah, uh, not long. The policeman sighed. Then we don't have time for the full procedure. Try to resist for as long as you can and listen to me very carefully. Okay? Not waiting for a response, he added. How much do you know about the nightmare spell? Sonny gave him a questioning look. As much as anyone, I guess? Who doesn't know about the spell? Not the fancy stuff you see in dramas and hear in the propaganda broadcasts. I mean how much do you really know? That was a hard question to answer. Don't I just go into the dream realm, kill a few monsters to complete the first nightmare, receive magic powers and become an awakened? The old policeman shook his head. Listen carefully. Once you fall asleep, you will be transported inside your first nightmare. Nightmares are trials created by the spell. Once inside, you will meet monsters, sure, but you will also meet people. Remember, they are not real. They're just illusions conjured up to test you. How do you know? The policeman just stared at him. I mean, no one understands what the spell is and how it works, right? So how do you know that they're not real? You might have to kill them, kid. So do yourself a favor and just think about them as illusions. Oh. The old policeman waited for a second, then nodded and continued. A lot of things about the first nightmare depend on luck. Generally, it shouldn't be overwhelmingly hard. The situation you're in, the tools you have at your disposal and the creatures you have to defeat should be within the range of your abilities, at least. After all, the spell sets up trials, not executions. You're a bit disadvantaged due to, well, your circumstances. But kids from the outskirts are tough. Don't give up on yourself just yet. Ah. Uh, Sonny was getting more and more sleepy. It was becoming hard to follow the conversation. About those magic powers you mentioned, you will indeed receive them if you survive until the end of the nightmare. What those powers will be, exactly, depends on your natural affinity as well what you do during the trial. But some of it will be at your disposal right from the start. The voice of the old policeman sounded more and more distant. Sonny's eyelids were so heavy that he was struggling to keep his eyes open. Remember, the first thing you must do once inside the nightmare is to check your attributes and your aspect. If you get a combat-oriented aspect, something like a swordsman or an archer, things will be easier. If it is reinforced by a physical attribute, then that's even better. Combat aspects are the most common, so the probability of receiving one is high. The armored room was growing dimmer. If you're unlucky and your aspect has nothing to do with combat, don't despair. 
Sorcery and utility aspects are useful in their own ways, you'll just have to be smart about it. There are really no useless aspects. Well, almost. So just do anything in your power to survive. If you survive, you will be halfway to becoming an awakened. But if you die, you'll open a gate for a nightmare creature to appear in the real world. Which means that my colleagues and I will have to deal with it. So, please don't die, sunless. Already half asleep, Sunny felt a bit touched by the policeman's words, or, at least, try to not die right away. The nearest awakened won't be able to get here for a few hours, so we would really appreciate it if you don't make us fight that thing ourselves. What? With that last thought, Sunny finally slipped into a deep slumber. Everything became black, and then, in the darkness, a faintly familiar voice rang. Aspirant. Welcome to the Nightmare Spell. Prepare for your first trial, Chapter 2 Slave Caravan. Sunny dreamt of a mountain. Jagged and lonesome, it dwarfed other peaks of the mountain chain, cutting the night sky with its sharp edges. A radiant moon bathed its slopes in the ghostly, pale light. On one of the slopes, the remnants of an old road stubbornly clung to the rocks. Here and there, weathered paved stones could be seen through the snow. To the right side of the road, a sheer cliff face rose as an impregnable wall. To the left, a silent black sea of nothingness indicated an endless fall. Strong winds crashed into the mountain over and over again, screaming in powerless rage. Suddenly, the moon fell over the horizon. The sun rose from the west, streaked across the sky and disappeared in the east. Snowflakes jumped from the ground and returned into the embrace of clouds. Sunny realized that he was seeing the flow of time in reverse. In an instant, hundreds of years flew by. The snow retreated, bearing the old road. Cold shivers ran down Sonny's back as he noticed human bones littering the ground. A moment later, the bones were gone, and in their place, a slave caravan appeared, moving backwards down the mountain in the clamor of chains. Time slowed, stopped, and then resumed its usual pace. Aspirant. Welcome to the nightmare spell. Prepare for your first trial. What, what the hell is this? Step. Step. Another step. A dull ache was radiating through Sonny's bleeding feet as he was shivering from cold. His threadbare tunic was nearly useless against the biting wind. His wrists were the main source of agony, badly hurt by the iron shackles, they sent a sharp pang of pain every time the freezing metal touched his broken skin. What kind of a situation is this? Sonny looked up and down, noticing a long chain winding up the road, with dozens and dozens of hollow-eyed people, slaves just like him, shackled to it at small intervals. Ahead of him, a man with broad shoulders and a bloodied back was walking with a measured gait. Behind him, a shifty-looking guy with quick, desperate eyes was quietly cursing under his breath in a language that Sonny did not know, but somehow still understood. From time to time, armed horsemen in ancient-style armor would pass by, giving the slaves menacing looks. However you judged it, things were really bad. Sonny was more bewildered than panicked. True, these circumstances were not like what the first nightmares were supposed to be. Usually, freshly chosen aspirants would find themselves in a scenario that presented them with a fair amount of agency, they would become members of privileged or warrior castes, with plenty of access to necessary weapons to at least try to tackle any conflict. Starting out as a powerless slave, shackled and already half-dead, was as far from being ideal as one could imagine. However, the spell was as much about challenge as it was about balance. As the old policeman said, it created trials, not executions. So Sonny was pretty sure that, to counter this abysmal start, it would reward him with something good. A powerful aspect, at least. Let's see, how do I do this? Remembering popular webtoons he read as a child, Sonny concentrated and thought about words like status, myself and information. Indeed, as soon as he focused, shimmering runes appeared in the air in front of him. Once again, Although he did not know this ancient alphabet, the meaning behind it was somehow clear. He quickly found the rune describing his aspect, and, finally, lost his composure. What? What the actual fuck? Name, Sunless, True Name. Rank, Aspirant. Soul Core, Dormant. Memories. Echoes. Attributes, Faded, Mark of Divinity, Child of Shadows. Aspect, Temple Slave. Aspect Description, Slave is a useless wretch with no skills or abilities worth a mention. 
A temple slave is just the same, except much rarer. Speechless, Sonny stared at the ruins, trying to convince himself that he was maybe just seeing things. Surely, he couldn't be that unlucky, right? No useless aspects my ass. As soon as this thought appeared in his mind, he lost the rhythm of his steps and stumbled, pulling the chain down with his weight. Immediately, the shifty guy behind him screamed. Whore's bastard. Watch where you're going. Sonny hurriedly dismissed the runes, which were only visible to him, and tried to recover his balance. A moment later, he was once again walking steadily, however, not before inadvertently pulling on the chain one more time. You little shit. I'm going to kill you. The broad-shouldered man in front of Sonny chuckled without turning his head. Why bother? The weakling will be dead by sunrise anyway. The mountain will kill him. A few seconds later, he added. It'll kill you and me, too. Just a bit later. I really don't know what the Imperials are thinking, forcing us into this cold. The shifty guy gasped. Speak for yourself, fool. I'm planning to survive. Sonny silently shook his head and concentrated on not falling again. What a charming pair. Suddenly, a third voice joined the conversation from somewhere further back. This one sounded gentle and intelligent. This mountain pass is usually much warmer this time of year. We just had really bad luck. Also, I would advise you against harming this boy. Why is that? Sonny turned his head slightly, listening. Haven't you seen the markings on his skin? He is not like us who fell into slavery due to debts, crimes or misfortune. He was born a slave. A temple slave, to be precise. Not long ago, the Imperials destroyed the last temple of the Shadow God. I suspect that this is how the boy ended up here. The broad-shouldered man cast a look back. So what? Why should we be afraid of a half-forgotten, weakling god? He couldn't even save his own temples. The Empire is protected by the mighty war god. Of course they're not afraid to burn down a few temples. But we here are not protected by anything or anyone. Do you really want to risk angering a god? The broad-shouldered man grunted, not willing to answer. Their conversation was stopped by a young soldier riding a beautiful, white horse. Clad in a simple leather cuirass, armed with a spear and a short sword, he looked dignified and noble. To Sonny's irritation, the asshole was really pretty, too. If this was a historical drama, the soldier would definitely be a male lead. What is going on here? There was no particular menace in his voice, even something resembling concern. When everyone hesitated, the gentle-voiced slave answered. It's nothing, sir. We are just all tired and cold. Especially our young friend over there. This journey is truly too hard for someone that young. The soldier looked at Sonny with pity. What are you looking at? You're not much older than me. Sonny thought. Of course, he didn't say anything out loud. The soldier sighed and took a flask from his belt before extending it to Sonny. Bear with it a little more, child. We will stop for the night soon. For now, here, drink some water. Child? Child? Due to his thin body and small stature, both caused by malnourishment, Sonny was often mistaken for someone younger. Usually, he didn't hesitate to use it to his advantage, but now, for some reason, being called a child really irked him. Still, he was really thirsty. He was just about to take the flask when a whip cracked in the air, and suddenly Sonny was in a world of pain. He stumbled, once again pulling on the chain and causing the shifty slave behind him to curse. Another soldier, this one older and angrier, stopped his horse a few steps back. The whip that sliced the back of Sonny's tunic open and drew blood belonged to him. Without even glancing at the slaves, the older soldier pierced his younger colleague with a disdainful glare. What do you think you're doing? The young soldier's face darkened. I was just giving this boy some water. He'll receive water with the rest of them once we camp. But? Shut your mouth. These slaves are not your friends. Understood? They're not even people. Treat them like people and they'll begin imagining things. The young soldier looked at Sonny, then lowered his head and put the flask back on his belt. Don't let me catch you making friends with slaves again, newbie. Or next time it will be your back tasting my whip. 
As if to illustrate his intention, the older soldier cracked his whip in the air and rode past them, radiating threat and anger. Sonny watched him go with well-concealed malice. I don't know how, but I will watch you die first. Then he turned his head and glanced in the direction of the younger soldier, who was falling behind with his head still lowered. And you, second, chapter three, the strings of fate. For a few minutes after that, Sonny was in a dark mood. But then he pulled himself out of it and inhaled deeply, trying to enjoy the fresh air. Indeed, air like that was hard to come by in the real world, microdust and other pollutants made it rough and unpleasant, not to mention the general stench of the outskirts. In the better parts of the city, sophisticated filtration systems worked diligently, however, filtrated air tasted sterile and stagnant. Only the very rich had access to truly pleasant breathing, and here he was, able to enjoy an unlimited amount of pristine, delicious air like a second-generation shable. Truly, being chosen by the spell has its benefits. If only there was no dreadful cold, his feet did not ache, and his wrists and back were not in agony. The slave caravan slowly dragged itself up the mountain, with more and more slaves stumbling and periodically falling to the ground. A couple of times, those who could not walk anymore were taken off the chain and unceremoniously tossed off the road, down into the abyss that loomed to the left of it. Sonny watched them fall with a bit of compassion. Poor fellows. Rest in peace, you pitiful souls. All in all, he was in good spirits. It was a bit strange to feel good amidst this disaster of a nightmare, but, thankfully, Sonny had time to prepare himself for this eventuality. When the symptoms of the spell first appeared, he did not handle it well. Dying before you even turned 17 was not something one could easily cope with. But, in the end, it only took Sonny several days to come to terms with it. After visiting his parents' makeshift resting place, well, actually, since he was too poor to afford even the cheapest slot in the remembrance facility, it was just two lines carved into an old tree, and adding a third line for himself, Sonny suddenly became relaxed and carefree. After all, he didn't have to worry about earning money, finding food, protecting himself and planning for the future anymore. Once the worst that could happen had already happened, what else was there to fear? So, becoming a slave and slowly freezing to death was not that much of a shock. Besides, he knew that cold would not kill him simply because he had already seen what fate was awaiting the caravan further up the mountain. The picture of piled bones littering the ground was still fresh in his mind. Most likely, it was a pack of monsters that were going to do the caravan in, and by the look of it, the attack was going to take place in a matter of hours, not days. So he still had a chance. Using the opportunity, Sonny decided to take another look at his status and summoned the runes again. The last time he was too outraged by the aspect and didn't study the attributes well. While not as important as one's aspect, the attributes were often the deciding factor between life and death. They represented one's natural traits and affinities, sometimes even providing passive abilities and effects. Faded, attribute description, the strings of fate wrap tightly around you. Unlikely events, both good and bad, are drawn by your presence. There are those who are blessed, and there are those who are cursed, but rarely both. Mark of divinity, attribute description, you bear a faint scent of divinity, as though someone briefly touched by it once, a long time ago. Child of shadows, attribute description, shadows recognize you as one of their own. Hmm. Interesting. Sonny quickly recognized the first attribute, faded, as the main culprit of his predicament. At first glance, it seemed to indicate that he was destined for a certain fate to die miserably and vanish without a trace, for example. But after reading the description, he realized that being faded actually just meant that improbable things had a higher chance of occurring when he was around. I guess this is how I managed to receive one of the super rare useless aspects and a weird variant of it, at that. If, faded, was his innate attribute, then the other two came from the, temple slave, aspect. Mark of divinity, was more or less straightforward, it was supposed to allow passage into certain sacred places inside the dream realm and enhance several types of sorcery. Since there were no sacred places in sight and Sunny's aspect had nothing to do with sorcery, it was useless, too. Child of Shadows, was a stranger one. He had never heard of it and had no idea what it was supposed to do, at least not until the sun hid behind the mountain and the sky began to darken. To his surprise, Sonny found himself able to see perfectly in the darkness, as though it was still as bright as day. This ability alone was nothing to scoff at, and it was quite possible that shadows would reward him with some other, yet unknown, gifts. Finally something good. I wonder if. 
Stop the caravan. Prepare to camp. Following the head soldier's order, the slaves stopped and fell to the ground, shivering and exhausted. The small clearing where the road widened was somewhat protected from the wind by a protruding mass of rock, but it was still too cold to rest with ease. The soldiers got busy herding the slaves into a tight circle, forcing them to share warmth, and lighting up a large bonfire in the center of the camp although not before tending to their horses. The heavy wagon carrying food, water and other cargo, to which the main chain was firmly affixed, was pushed forward to block the wind. While looking around, Sonny noticed the young soldier from before watching the mountain with a complicated look on his face. What a weirdo! Soon, the bonfire was blazing. The stronger slaves tried to find their way closer to the fire, while the weaker ones, like Sonny, were forced to sit at the outer end of the circle, with their backs freezing in the cold. Of course, any movement was encumbered by the fact that they were still shackled to the chain. That's why the familiar broad-shouldered slave ended up just where he started despite all of his efforts to get closer to the flame. Damn Imperials, he hissed, clearly irritated. The soldiers walked among the slaves, giving them water and food. Sonny, just like everybody else, received a few sips of icy water and a small piece of rock-hard, moldy bread. Despite its unappetizing look, he forced himself to eat the whole thing, just to be left as hungry as he was before. By the looks of it, he wasn't the only one. The shifty slave that had been walking behind him looked around in anguish. By all the gods, they used to feed me better even in the dungeons. He spat on the ground, desperate. And most of us innocent men in the dungeon were there waiting to visit the gallows, too. A few steps away from them, where the paved road ended and sharp rocks began, a scattering of bright red berries were growing from the snow. Sonny had noticed them before, clustering here and there along the road, and even noted how pretty those resilient things looked contrasted against the white. The shifty slave's eyes glistened as he tried to crawl towards the berries on all fours. I would advise against eating those, friend. It was the gentle-voiced slave again. Sonny turned around and finally saw him in the flesh for the first time. It was a tall man in his forties, lean and strangely handsome, with a dignified look of a scholar. How a man such as him ended up a slave was a mystery. Yet there he was. You and your advice again. What? Why? The scholar smiled apologetically. These berries are called bloodbane. They grow in the places where human blood was spilled. That's why there's always a lot of them along the slave trade routes. So what? The older man sighed. Bloodbane is poisonous. A few berries might be enough to kill an adult man. Curses. The shifty slave flinched back and glared at the scholar. Sonny did not pay them a lot of attention. Because, while looking around, he finally recognized the site of the camp as the place where, in his vision at the start of the nightmare, the bones of the slaves were buried under the snow. And he was willing to bet that whatever it was that killed them all was going to happen soon. As if to answer his thoughts, a thundering noise rang from above. And in the next second, something massive came crashing from the sky, Chapter 4 Mountain King. Turning in the direction of the thundering noise, many slaves rose their heads only to see rocks and heavy shards of ice raining on them from above. They instantly panicked, lurching away in a cacophony of screams. Shadows happily danced on black stones as, entangled by the thick chain, those slaves fell to the ground and pulled others with them. Sonny was one of the few that remained upright, mostly because he was ready for something like this to happen. Calm and collected, he gazed at the night sky, his attribute-enhanced eyes piercing the darkness, and took one measured step back. In the next second, a piece of ice the size of a man's torso hit the ground right in front of him and exploded, showering everything around with sharp shards. Others weren't that quick. As ice and stones continued to rain, many were wounded, and a few even lost their lives. Agonizing wails filled the air. On your feet, fools. Get to the wall. The veteran soldier, the one who had whipped Sonny a few hours before, was shouting angrily, trying to get the slaves to move towards the relative safety of the mountain slope. However, before anyone could heed his command, something massive came crashing down, sending a tremor through the stones beneath their feet. It fell right between the caravan and the mountain wall, plunging everything into silence for a few seconds. At first, it looked like a lump of dirty snow, roughly round in shape and as tall as a mounted horseman. However, once the creature unfurled its long limbs and rose, it towered over the stone platform like a nightmarish omen of death. That thing must be at least four meters tall, Sonny thought, a bit stunned. 
The creature had two stumpy legs, an emaciated, hunched torso and disproportionately long, multi-jointed hands, two of them, each ending with a set of horrifying bone claws, and another two, these ones shorter, ending with almost human-like fingers. The thing that at first glance looked like dirty snow turned out to be its fur, yellowish-gray and ragged, thick enough to stop arrows and swords. On its head, five milky, white eyes regarded the slaves with insect-like indifference. Beneath them, a terrible maw crowding with razor-sharp teeth was half open, as though in anticipation. Viscous drool was running down the creature's chin and dripping into the snow. What unnerved Sunny the most, though, were the strange shapes endlessly moving, worm-like, under the creature's skin. He could see them clearly because, unfortunately, he was one of those unlucky souls closest to the monstrosity, getting a nauseating first-row view. Well, that is just, too much, he thought, stupefied. As soon as Sonny finished that thought, all hell broke loose. The creature moved, slashing its claws in his general direction. But Sonny was one step ahead, without wasting a single moment, he jumped sideways as far as the chain allowed, conveniently placing the broad-shouldered slave between himself and the monster. His quick reaction saved his life, as those sharp claws, each as long as a sword, sliced through the broad-shouldered man a fraction of a second later and sent streams of blood flying through the air. Drenched in the hot liquid, Sonny hit the ground, and his fellow slave, now simply a corpse, fell on him from above. Damn! Why are you so heavy? Temporarily blinded, Sonny heard a chilling howl and felt an enormous shadow passing over him. Immediately after, a deafening chorus of screams filled the night. Not paying it any attention, he tried to roll the corpse to the side, but was stopped by a forceful lurch of the chain that twisted his wrists and filled his mind with white-hot pain. Disoriented, he felt himself being dragged a few steps, but then the chain suddenly slackened, and he was able to control his hands again. See, things could have been worse. Putting his palms against the dead man's chest, he pushed with all the strength he had. The heavy corpse stubbornly resisted all his attempts, but then finally fell sideways, setting Sonny free. However, he didn't get to celebrate this newly found freedom, as his blood suddenly turned to ice. Because at that moment, with his palms still pressed against the broad-shouldered slave's bleeding body, he clearly felt something wriggling under the dead man's skin. You just had to think about how things could get worse, right, you idiot, he thought, and then flinched back. Pushing the corpse with his legs, Sonny crawled as far away from it as he could, which was about a meter and a half, thanks to the ever-present chain. He quickly glanced around, noticing a mass of dancing shadows and the silhouette of the monster rampaging amidst the screaming slaves on the opposite end of the stone platform. Then he concentrated on the dead body, which was starting to convulse with growing violence. On the opposite side of the corpse, the shifty slave was looking at it with slackened jaw and a horrified expression on his face. Sonny waved to get his attention. What are you staring at? Move away from it. The shifty slave tried but immediately fell down. The chain was twisted between the three of them, pinned down under by the broad-shouldered man's weight. Sonny clenched his teeth. Right under his eyes, the corpse was going through a nightmare-inducing metamorphose. Strange bone growths pierced its skin, extending like spikes. The muscles bulged and wriggled, as though trying to change shape. The fingernails were turning into sharp claws, the face cracked and split bearing open a twisted mouth with one too many rows of bloodied, needle-like fangs. This is not right. Sonny twitched, feeling a strong urge to empty his stomach. Th, the chain. The scholarly slave was just a few steps behind the shifty one, pointing at his shackles with a face as pale as a ghost. That remark was far from helpful, but given the circumstances, his shock was understandable. Being shackled was bad enough, but being shackled to such horror was truly unfair. But Sonny's conclusion that things weren't right did not come from self-pity. He just meant that this whole situation was literally not right, the spell, mysterious as it was, had its own set of rules. There were rules for what type of creatures could appear in any given nightmare, too. Nightmare creatures had their own hierarchy, from mindless beasts to monsters, followed by demons, devils, tyrants, terrors and, finally, mythical titans, also known as calamities. The first nightmare was almost always populated by beasts and monsters, rarely with a demon mixed in. And Sonny had never, ever heard about anything stronger than a single devil appearing in it. However, the creature had clearly just created a lesser version of itself, an ability that belonged exclusively to tyrants, the sovereigns of the nightmare spell, and those above them. What was this tyrant even doing in a first nightmare? How powerful was that damn, faded, attribute? But there was no time to ponder. 
Unfair or not, there was only one person now who could save Sonny, himself. The broad-shouldered man, what was left of him, slowly rose, his mouth producing strange clicking noises. Without giving him time to fully come to his senses, Sonny cursed and jumped forward, grabbing onto the length of the slack and chain. One arm of the monster, now fully equipped with five jagged claws, shot forward to meet him, but Sonny sidestepped it with one calculated movement. What saved his skin this time was not quick reaction, but simple presence of mind. Sonny might not have learned any fancy combat techniques, since his childhood was spent on the streets instead of a school. But the streets, too, were a kind of teacher. He had spent his whole life fighting for survival, quite often literally. That experience allowed him to keep a cool head on his shoulders in the midst of any conflict. So instead of freezing or being consumed by fear and doubt, Sonny just acted. Stepping close, he threw the chain around the monster's shoulders and pulled, pinning its hands to its body. Before the creature, still slow and groggy from its transformation, could properly react, Sonny wrapped the chain around it several times, barely saving his face from being bitten off by the creature's terrifying maw. The good thing was, the monster couldn't move its hands now. The bad thing was, the length of the chain he used to immobilize it was gone, leaving almost no distance between them. You too. Sonny screamed, addressing his two fellow slaves. Pull on that chain as though your lives depend on it. Because they were. The shifty slave and the scholar gaped at him and then, understanding what he was thinking, started to move. Grabbing the chain from the opposite directions, they pulled as hard as they could, tightening its grip on the monster and not letting it shake loose. Great. Sunny thought. The monster bulged its muscles, trying to break free. The chain creaked, caught on the bone spikes, as though slowly breaking apart. Not so great. Without wasting any more time, he threw his hands in the air and caught the creature's neck with the short, thinner chain connecting his shackles together. Then he circled the monster with a quick step and pulled, ending up back to back with it as far away from its maw as he could. Sonny knew that he wasn't strong enough to strangle a man with his bare hands, let alone a weird, terrifying mutant like the one trying to eat him. But now, using his own back as a lever and the weight of his whole body to pull the shackles down, he at least stood a chance. He pulled down with all his might, feeling the monster's body pressing against him, bone spikes brushing against his skin. The monster continued to struggle, clicking loudly and trying to break the chain tying him down apart. Now it was just a question of what would break first, the chain or the monster itself. Die. Die, you bastard. Sweat and blood were rolling down Sonny's face as he was pulling, and pulling, and pulling down with as much force as he could muster. Every second felt like an eternity. His strength and stamina, what little he had to begin with, were quickly running out. His wounded back, wrists, and muscles pierced by the bone spikes were in agony. And then, finally, Sonny felt the monster's body go limp. A moment later, a faintly familiar voice rang in the air. It was the most beautiful sound he had ever heard. You have slain a dormant beast, Mountain King's Larva. Chapter 5 Broken Chains You have slain a dormant beast, Mountain King's Larva. Sonny fell to his knees, breathless. His whole body felt as though it just went through a meat grinder, even large amounts of adrenaline could not wash away all the pain and exhaustion. And yet, he was exhilarated. The satisfaction of killing the larva was so vast that he even forgot to be disappointed about not receiving a memory, the special item, tied to a dream realm inhabitant's essence, which was sometimes awarded by the spell to the triumphant awakened. A magic sword or a suit of armor would have come in handy right about now. Damn, he would even settle for a warm coat. Three seconds. You can rest for three more seconds, Sonny thought. After all, the nightmare was far from over. A few moments later, he forced himself to come back to his senses and looked around, trying to ascertain the situation. The larva was dead, which was great. However, he was still tied to it by the damn chain, the shifty slave and the scholar, both pale as death, were busy untangling it to buy the three of them at least some freedom of movement. Further away, torn bodies and pieces of flesh were lying on the ground. Many slaves were killed. A few had somehow managed to escape and were now running away. Fools. They're dooming themselves. The chain, as it turns out, was at some point broken in two, that's why it suddenly slackened when Sonny was being dragged by the mass of panicking slaves. If their shackles had a less sophisticated locking mechanism, he could have tried to free himself now. However, each pair was fixed to a specific link. Without unlocking them, no one was going anywhere. The tyrant, Mountain King, 
presumably, was hidden from sight by the bright glow of the bonfire. However, Sunny could feel its movements due to the subtle tremors spreading through the stones, as well as the desperate screams of those slaves who were yet to perish. An angry below or two could also be heard, indicating that some of the soldiers were still alive, desperately trying to fight the monstrosity off. What pulled his attention the most, though, was the fact that several of the maimed bodies were starting to move. More larvae? His eyes widened. One after another, for more corpses slowly rose to their feet. Each beast looked as disgusting as the first one had, and not a bit less deadly. The nearest was mere meters away from Sunny. Damn it all, he thought, and then, weakly, I want to wake up. As strange clicking filled the air, one of the beasts turned its head toward the three slaves and gnashed its fangs. Shifty fell on his ass, whispering a prayer, while Scholar just froze in place. Sunny's eyes darted to the ground, trying to find something to use as a weapon. But there was not a single thing he could use, full of vitriol, he simply wrapped a length of chain around the knuckles and raised his fists. Come at me, you bastard. The larva dashed forward with incredible speed in a flurry of claws, fangs, and terror. Sunny had less than a second to react, however, before he could do anything, a nimble figure moved past him and a sharp sword flashed in the air. The monster, beheaded with one strike, fell gracelessly onto the ground. Sunny blinked. What was that? Dumbfounded, he slowly turned his head and looked to his left. Standing there with a valorous expression was the handsome young soldier who had once offered him water. He looked calm and collected, if a little grim. There was not a speck of dirt or blood on his leather armor. He is. Awesome, Sonny thought before catching himself. Poser. I mean he's a poser. With a short nod, the soldier moved forward to face the remaining three larvae. But after taking a few steps, he suddenly turned around and gave Sonny a long look. Then, with one swift motion, the young warrior took something from his belt and threw it to Sonny. Save yourself. With that, he was gone to fight the monsters. Sonny reflexively caught the item and watched the soldier go. Then he lowered his gaze and studied the thing clutched tightly in his hand. It was a short and narrow iron rod with a straight bend on its end. A key. It's a key. His heart began to beat faster. It's the key to the shackles. With one last glance at the fierce battle starting between the young soldier and the larvae, Sonny dropped on one knee and began to maneuver the shackles, trying to get his hand into a suitable position to insert the key. It took him a few tries to understand how the unfamiliar lock worked, but then, finally, there was a satisfying click, and he was suddenly free. The cold wind caressed his bloodied wrists. Sonny rubbed them and smiled with a dark gleam in his eyes. Just you wait now. For a moment, visions of violence and revenge filled his head. Boy! Over here! Shifty was waving his hands in the air, trying to get his attention. Sonny briefly considered just leaving him to die, but then decided against it. There was strength in numbers. Plus, despite Shifty's previous threats to kill him and overall unpleasantness, Sonny would have felt bad leaving a fellow slave in chains especially since freeing him would not cost anything. He hurried over to the other two slaves and quickly unlocked their shackles. As soon as Shifty was free, he pushed Sonny away and did a little dance, laughing like a maniac. Ah! Free at last. Gods must be smiling upon us. Scholar was more reserved. He squeezed Sonny's shoulder in gratitude and smiled weakly, casting a tense look in the direction of the ensuing fight. Two of the three larvae were already dead, the third one was missing an arm but still trying to tear its opponent apart. The young soldier danced around it, moving with the graceful fluidity of a natural-born warrior. What are you waiting for? Run! Shifty made a move to run away, but was stopped by Scholar. My friend, I would. If you say advise again, I swear to gods, I will bash your head open. The two slaves looked at each other with open animosity. A moment later, Scholar lowered his eyes and sighed. If we run away now, we will surely die. Why? The older slave simply pointed at the tall bonfire. Because without that fire, we will freeze to death before the night is over. Until the sun rises, running away is suicide. Sonny did not say anything, knowing that Scholar was right. Actually, he realized it right after strangling the larva. No matter how terrible Mountain King was, the bonfire was still their only lifeline in this frozen hell. 
It was just as what the broad-shouldered slave, may he rest in peace, had said. There was no need for anyone to kill them, because the mountain itself would do it if given a chance. So what? I prefer freezing to death than being eaten by that monster anyway. Not to mention, ugh, turning into one of those things. Shifty was pretending to be brave, but there was no conviction in his voice. He glanced at the darkness surrounding the stone platform and shivered before taking a small step back. At this point, the third larva was long dead, and the young soldier was nowhere to be seen. He had probably gone to join the fight at the other side of the bonfire, leaving the three slaves alone at the mountainside part of the stone platform. Scholar cleared his throat. The monster might be satiated with those it had already slain. It might be defeated or driven away by the Imperials. In any case, if we stay here, we have a chance to survive, however small. But if we run away, our doom will be certain. So what do we do? Unlike Scholar, Sonny was sure that Mountain King would not be satisfied with killing just most of the slaves. Neither did he believe that a bunch of mortals would really be able to defeat it. Even if they were not normal people but awakened, a fight with a tyrant was not something one could easily survive, let alone win. But if he wanted to live, he had to get rid of that thing somehow. Let's go take a look. Shifty looked at him as though seeing a lunatic. Are you insane? You want to get closer to that beast? Sonny stared at him blankly, then shrugged and headed in the direction of the rampaging monster, Chapter 6 Confronting the Tyrant. Sonny was off to face against a nightmare creature. And not any creature, at that, but one of the fifth category, a dreaded, fearsome tyrant. The odds of survival were so low that anyone would have laughed in his face if he were to ever suggest attempting to fight it. If they weren't an awakened two or three ranks above the creature, of course, which Sonny certainly wasn't. And yet, he had to deal with this mountain king somehow to avoid an even more miserable death. The ridiculous degree to which the odds were stacked against him from the very beginning of this delayed execution had gotten old a long time ago, so he didn't have any more energy to think about it. What was there to fear, after all? He was already as good as dead. It's not like he could get any deader. So why worry? On the other side of the bonfire, things were turning from bad to worse. Most of the slaves were already dead. A few soldiers were still desperately trying to fight the monster, but it was clear that they weren't going to last long. Right in front of Sonny's eyes, the tyrant picked up a dead slave, dragging the chain up with him, and opened its terrifying maw wide. With one crushing bite, the slave's body was torn in half, leaving only bloodied stumps inside the shackles. Mountain King's five indifferent, milky eyes stared into the distance as he chewed, streams of blood flowing down its chin. Seeing that the creature's upper arms were busy, one of the soldiers screamed and lunged forward, brandishing his long spear. Without turning its head, the tyrant extended one of its shorter lower arms, caught the soldier's head in an iron grip and squeezed, crushing the poor man's skull like a soap bubble. A moment later, the headless body was tossed over the cliff and disappeared into the abyss below. Shifty doubled over, puking his guts out. Then he shakily rose to his feet and glared at Sonny. Well, we've taken a look, now what? Sonny did not answer, pensively observing the tyrant with his head slightly tilted to one side. Shifty stared at him some more, then turned to Scholar. I'm telling you, old man, the boy is sick in the head. How the hell can he be so calm? S-H-H-H-H. Lower your voice, fool. Blood drained from Shifty's face as he slapped himself, covering his mouth with both hands. Then he cast a fearful look in the direction of the tyrant. Luckily, the abomination was too busy feasting on the slaves, lucky ones who were already dead and unlucky ones who were still alive, to pay them any attention. Shifty slowly exhaled. Sonny was preoccupied with thinking, measuring his chances of survival. How do I get rid of that thing? He didn't have any special powers, nor did he have an army ready to bury the tyrant under a mountain of bodies. He didn't even have a weapon to at least scratch the damn bastard. Sonny moved his gaze and looked past the creature, into the endless darkness of the moonless sky. As he was watching the night, a bright flash streaked in the air and collided with one of the tyrant's arms, bursting into a rain of sparks. The young soldier, Sonny's heroic liberator, had just tossed a burning piece of wood at the monster and was now defiantly raising his sword. Face me, devil. A distraction. Just what I needed. Because there was no way for Sonny to kill the mountain king with his own two hands, 
he had decided to enlist some help. A human wouldn't be up to the task, so instead, he was planning to use a force of nature. Since I can't do the bastard in myself, let's make gravity do it for me. He was in the middle of thinking over the details of the plan when the young hero's foolish bravado presented an opportunity. Now everything depended on how long the pompous idiot would manage to stay alive. Come with me. Sonny said as he started running toward the far end of the stone platform, where the heavy wagon was perched dangerously close to the edge of the cliff. Shifty and Scholar shared a dubious look, but then followed, perhaps confusing his calmness with confidence, or maybe divine inspiration. After all, it was a widely known fact that crazy people were often favored by the gods. Behind them, Hero nimbly ducked under the tyrant's claws, slashing it with the sword. The sharp edge slid ineffectively across the dirty fur, not leaving even a scratch on the creature's flash. In the next second, the tyrant moved with frightening speed, throwing all four of his hands in the direction of its new, irritating foe. But Sonny had no way of knowing. He was running with all his speed, getting closer and closer to the wagon. Once there, he hurriedly looked around, checking if there were any larvae close by, and moved to its rear wheels. The wagon was left at the upper end of the stone platform, where it narrowed and turned back into the road. It was turned sideways to block the wind, with its front facing the mountain wall and its back facing the cliff. There were two large wooden wedges placed under the rear wheels to prevent the wagon from rolling backward. Sonny turned to his companions and pointed at the wedges. When I tell you, remove both of them. Then push. Understand? What? Why? Shifty stared at him with a dumbfounded expression on his face. Scholar just looked at the wedges and then at the tyrant. Hero, miraculously, was still alive. He was weaving between the creature's limbs, always just half a second away from being completely eviscerated. From time to time, his sword flashed in the air, but to no avail, Mountain King's fur was too thick, and his skin too tough to be harmed by mundane weapons. There was a hint of apprehension on the young warrior's face. All the other soldiers, as far as Sonny could see, were already dead. So he really needed that one to live a little bit longer. Don't die yet, he thought. To Shifty, he simply said. You'll see. The next moment, Sonny was running again, trying to follow the chain from the brace where it was affixed to the wagon. The thing he was searching for was hard to notice due to all the bodies, blood and viscera littering the stone platform, but for once, luck was on his side. A short amount of time later, he had found what he needed, the torn end of the chain. Finding the nearest set of shackles, complete with a horribly disfigured body of a slave locked in them, Sonny plopped down on his knees and started to fumble with the key. There was a muffled scream, and with a sideways glance, he noticed Hero flying through the air, finally caught by one of the tyrant's strikes. Incredibly, the young soldier managed to land on his feet, sliding several meters across the stones. All of his limbs were still in place, there were no terrible wounds on his body, either. Without skipping a bit, Hero rolled forward, picking up his sword from where it fell on the ground, and then rolled once more, this time sideways, narrowly avoiding a heavy stump from the creature's foot. Rolling? Who the hell rolls around in this situation? Without any more time to waste, Sonny finally managed to unlock the shackles. Shaking the dead slave out of them, he then promptly locked them once again, this time around the chain itself ending up with a makeshift slipknot and a loop. Now everything depended on his resolve, hand-to-eye coordination, and luck. Turning to Shifty and Scholar, who were still waiting by the wagon, he screamed. Now! Then, picking up a sizable length of chain, Sonny stood up and faced the tyrant. Hero spared him half a glance. His eyes lingered on the chain for a moment and then quickly followed it to the wagon. Then, without showing a hint of emotion, the young warrior doubled his efforts, drawing the creature's attention away from Sonny. So he's smart, too? What a scam! Clearing his head of all unnecessary thoughts, Sonny concentrated on the weight of the chain in his hands, the distance between him and the tyrant and his target. Time seemed to slow down a bit. Please, don't miss. Gathering all of his strength, Sonny spun and threw the chain in the air, as though a fisherman casting his net. The loop opened as it flew, closing in on the position of the fight between Hero and the tyrant. Sonny's plan was to place the loop on the ground close enough to them that, once one of the tyrant's feet landed in the trap, he could pull on the chain and tighten it around the monster's ankle. But his plan failed spectacularly. Which is to say, it was literally a spectacle. 
In the last moment, Mountain King suddenly flinched back, and instead of falling on the ground, the chain loop landed perfectly around its neck. A second later it tightened, acting as an iron noose. Sonny froze for a moment, not believing his eyes. And then clenched his fists, holding himself back from triumphantly shaking them in the air. Yes, he screamed inwardly. Moments later, the wagon would roll off the cliff, pulling the tyrant down with it. Sonny looked back to make sure, and instantly turned even paler than he usually was. Shifty and Scholar did manage to remove the wedges from under the wagon's wheels and were now desperately pushing it to the edge of the road. However, the wagon was rolling slowly, very slowly. Much slower than Sonny had anticipated. He turned to the tyrant, panicking. The creature, surprised by the sudden weight pressing down on its neck, was already raising its hands to tear the chain apart. Sonny's eyes widened. In the next second, Hero crashed into one of the tyrant's legs, throwing it off balance and buying them some time. Sonny was already running to the wagon, cursing loudly in his mind. Reaching it, he threw himself onto the damp wood alongside Shifty and Scholar, pushing with all the strength left in his rather small, but terribly beaten and enormously exhausted body. Roll! Roll, you creaky piece of shit! The wagon sped up a little, but was still rather slow in reaching the cliff's edge. At the same time, the tyrant finally managed to get a hold of the chain tied around its neck, ready to free itself. Now whether they lived or not was just a question of which thing would happen first, chapter 7 Three Slaves and a Hero. Roll, you creaky piece of shit. Sonny pressed himself against the wagon, pushing with all he had. Four powerful oxen that used to pull it were now dead, and instead of them, three tired slaves were trying to do the job. Even with the slope of the road helping them, the speed of the wagon was agonizingly slow. The tyrant, in comparison, was moving much faster. Pushing Hero back with a deadly swipe of his lower arms, he raised the other two to its neck and tried to grab the chain that was wrapped around it like a noose. However, this time Mountain King's fearsome physique turned into a disadvantage, its long, terrifying bone claws were perfect for tearing flesh apart, but they weren't the best tool for precise manipulations. It took the tyrant some time to get a hold of the chain without slicing its own neck open. By then, the wagon was nearly at the edge of the cliff. Come on. Just a little bit more. What followed happened very quickly. The wagon's rear wheels finally slid from the road, hanging over the dark, seemingly bottomless pit beneath. The creature turned, staring expressionlessly at the three slaves with its five milky, dead eyes. The wagon careened, throwing Shifty and Scholar off their feet, and then froze, balanced precariously on its middle axis. Sonny was the only one left standing. He cast a last glance at the towering monster, and then slammed his shoulder into the front of the wagon, putting all of his weight behind it. The wagon finally lost its balance and rolled over the edge, scraping its underside deafeningly against the jagged rocks. Sonny fell forward and landed on his knees, narrowly saving himself from tumbling down the cliff with it. Turning his head to the tyrant, he gave it a wicked smile. Mountain King made a move to lunge at the scrawny slave, but it was already too late. A moment later, the chain on his neck drew tight, and he was yanked back with tremendous force, flying over the edge of the cliff like a ragdoll. The creature fell into the darkness silently, as though refusing to believe that it was defeated by a tiny human. Go and die, bastard. Sonny thought. Then he took one deep, ragged breath and dropped to the ground, utterly exhausted. Is this it? Did I pass the trial? He rested on the cold stones, staring at the night sky, and waited for that faintly familiar but elusive voice to announce his victory. But instead of that, wave after wave of pain that he had earlier chosen to ignore finally started to catch up with his abused body. Sonny groaned, feeling hurt all over. The skin on his back, slashed by a slaver's whip and pierced by the bone spikes of a newborn larva, especially, was in agony. He was also starting to shiver, once again consumed by the dreadful cold. I guess not. His thoughts were slow and muddy. What else am I supposed to do? A dark figure appeared above him. It was Hero, looking calm and as handsome as ever. There were dirt and scratches on his armor, but otherwise, the young soldier appeared to be fine. He extended one arm to Sonny. Stand up. You'll freeze to death. Sonny sighed, accepting that his first nightmare was not over. Then he clenched his teeth and slowly rose to his feet, ignoring Hero's helping hand. Around them, there was a scene of utter carnage. Except for the three slaves and Hero, every member of the caravan was dead. 
Their bodies were littering the ground, horribly maimed or torn into pieces. Here and there, a repulsive carcass of a larva could be seen. Shadows cast by the bonfire were dancing happily across the stone platform, seemingly unperturbed by this morbid view. Sunny was also too tired to care. Shifty and Scholar were already up, looking at Hero with weary apprehension. With or without shackles, they were still slaves, and he was still a slave driver. Noticing their tense gazes, the soldier sighed, Come closer to the fire, all of you. We need to warm ourselves and discuss what to do next. Without waiting for their response, Hero turned around and walked away. After hesitating for a few moments, the slaves followed. A bit of time later, the four of them were seated around the bonfire, soaking up pleasant heat. Shifty and Scholar were close to each other, maintaining a safe distance from Hero. Sunny sat apart from everyone not because he had a specific reason to distrust one more than the others, but simply because he didn't like people in general. Growing up, Sunny was always a misfit. It's not that he had never tried to become close with someone, it's just that he seemed to lack the ability. Like there was an invisible wall between him and other people. If he had to put it in words, Sonny would say that he was born without a small, but important gear in his brain that everyone else seemed to possess. As a result, he was often baffled and stumped by human behavior, and his attempts to imitate it, however diligent, inevitably fell flat. This strangeness made others uncomfortable. In short, he was a bit different and if there was one thing people hated, it was those different from them. Over time, Sonny simply learned to avoid getting too close to anyone and settled comfortably into his outcast role. This habit served him well, since it not only made him self-reliant, but also saved him from being stabbed in the back by shady characters on multiple occasions. That's why he was not thrilled to share the rest of this nightmare with three strangers. Instead of trying to start a conversation, Sonny sat quietly by himself, lost in thoughts. After a few minutes, Hero's voice finally broke the silence. Once the sun rises, we will gather whatever food and water we can find and go back down the mountain. Shifty gave him a defiant look. Why should we go back? To be put in chains again? The young soldier sighed. We can go our separate ways once we leave the mountains. But until then, I'm still responsible for your lives. We can't continue up the road since the way over the mountain pass is long and arduous. Without the supplies that were stored on the wagon, your chances of making it are not high. That's why going back is our best hope. Scholar opened his mouth, planning to say something, but then thought better of it and remained silent. Shifty cursed, seemingly convinced by Hero's rational words. We can't go down. All three of them turned to Sonny, surprised to hear his voice. Shifty barked a laugh and glanced at the soldier. Don't listen to him, your lordship. This boy is, uh, touched by the gods. He's crazy, is what I'm trying to say. Hero frowned, looking at the slaves. The two of you are only alive thanks to this child's bravery. Aren't you ashamed to badmouth him so? Shifty shrugged, showing that he wasn't ashamed at all. The young soldier shook his head. I for one would like to hear his reasoning. Tell me, why can't we go down? Sonny shifted, uncomfortable in the center of everyone's attention. Because the monster isn't dead. Chapter 8 Nothing at all. Because the monster isn't dead. These ominous words hung in the silence. Three pairs of eyes widened, staring right at Sonny. Why do you say that? After thinking about it, Sonny came to the conclusion that the tyrant was, indeed, still alive. His reasoning was pretty straightforward, he did not hear the spell congratulating him on slaying the creature after it fell off the cliff. Which meant that it was not slain, but he couldn't explain that to his companions. He pointed up. The monster jumped from an incredible height to land on this platform. Yet it wasn't harmed at all. Why would it be killed by falling off the platform? Neither Hero nor the slaves could find a flaw in his argument. Sunny continued, which means that it's still alive somewhere down the mountain. So by going back, we will be delivering ourselves into its maw. Shifty cursed loudly and crawled closer to the bonfire, staring into the darkness with terror in his eyes. Scholar rubbed his temples, mumbling. Of course. Why didn't I realize myself? Hero was the most stoic of the three. After thinking it over, he nodded. Then we go up and over the mountain pass. But that's not all. 
He glanced in the direction where the tyrant had fallen. If the monster is still alive, there is a high possibility that it will return here and then pursue us. Which means that time is of the essence. We will need to move as soon as the sun rises. He gestured to the torn bodies littering the platform. We can't allow ourselves to rest the whole night anymore. We need to gather supplies now. If there was a chance, I would have liked to give these people at least a humble burial after gathering all that we can from then, but alas, fate has decided otherwise. Hero rose to his feet and brandished a sharp knife. Shifty tensed up and watched the blade carefully, but then relaxed, seeing that the young soldier showed no sign of aggression. Food, water, warm clothes, firewood. That is what we need to find. Let us split up and accomplish one task each. Then he pointed at himself with the tip of the knife. I will carve the oxen carcasses to get us some meat. Scholar looked around the stone platform, most of it drowning in deep shadows, and grimaced. I'll look for firewood. Shifty also glanced left and right, with a strange gleam in his eyes. Then I'll go find us something warm to wear. Sunny was the last one left. Hero gave him a long look. Most of our water was stored on the wagon. But each of my fallen brothers was carrying a flagon. Gather as many as you can find. Sometime later, far enough from the bonfire to be hidden in the shadows, Sonny was looking for dead soldiers with half a dozen flagons already weighing him down. Shivering in the cold, he finally stumbled on the last broken body clad in leather armor. The old veteran, the one who had whipped him for trying to accept Hero's flask, was badly injured and dying, but, miraculously, still clinging to life. Horrible wounds were covering his chest and stomach, and he was clearly in a lot of pain. His time was running out. Sonny knelt beside the dying soldier and looked him over, searching for the man's flagon. What irony, he thought. The older man tried to focus his eyes on Sonny and weakly moved his hand, reaching for something. Sonny looked down and noticed a shattered sword lying on the ground not far from them. Curious, he picked it up. Are you looking for this? Why? Are you guys like Vikings, longing to die with a weapon in your hands? The dying soldier didn't answer, watching the young slave with some unknown, intense emotion in his eyes. Sonny sighed. Well, it might as well do. After all, I promised to watch you die. With that, he leaned forward and slit the old man's throat with the sharp edge of his broken blade, then threw it away. The soldier twitched, drowning in his own blood. The expression in his eyes changed, was it gratitude? Or hatred? Sonny did not know. Illusion or not, it was his first time killing a human. Sonny expected to feel guilt or fear, but actually, there was nothing at all. It seemed that, for better or worse, his cruel upbringing in the real world had prepared him for this moment well. He sat quietly near the old man, keeping him company on this last journey. After a while, the spell's voice came whispering into his ear. You have slain a dormant human, name unknown. Sonny flinched. Oh, right. Killing people is also an achievement, as far as the spell is concerned. They don't usually show this in webtoons and dramas. He registered that fact and put it away. But, as it turned out, the spell wasn't done speaking. You have received a memory. Sonny froze, opening his eyes wide. Yes. Come on, give me something good. Memories could be anything, from weapons to enchanted items. One received from a dormant rank enemy wouldn't be too powerful, but it was still a boon, weightless and undetectable, able to be summoned from nothingness with a simple thought, a memory was incredibly useful. What's more, unlike corporeal things, he would be able to bring it back with him to the real world. The advantage of having something like that back in the outskirts was hard to overestimate. A weapon. Give me a sword. Received a memory, silver bell. Sunny sighed, disappointed. Well, with my luck, what was I expecting? Still, this thing was worth investigating. Maybe it had a powerful enchantment, like being able to send out destructive sonic waves or repelling incoming projectiles. Sunny summoned the runes and concentrated on the word silver bell. Immediately, an image of a small bell appeared in front of his eyes, with a short string of text below. Silver bell, a small memento of a long-lost home, which once brought its owner comfort and joy. Its clear ringing can be heard from miles away. What a piece of crap, Sonny thought, dejected. His first memory turned out to be pretty much useless, like everything else he possessed. He was almost starting to see a theme in how the spell was treating him. 
No matter. Sonny dismissed the runes and then got busy removing the dead man's fur cloak and warm, sturdy leather boots. As an officer, the quality of these clothes was a notch above those of the simple soldiers. After putting them on, the young slave finally felt warm for the first time since the nightmare began, not considering the short time he had spent near the bonfire. Perfect, he thought. The cloak was a bit bloodied, but then again, so was Sonny. He looked around, easily piercing the veil of darkness with his tenebrous eyes. Hero and Scholar were still in the middle of their tasks. Shifty was supposed to be looking for winter clothes, but was greedily pulling rings off the dead men's fingers instead. Unseen to them, Sonny hesitated, considering if he had really thought things through well. His companions were unreliable. The future was too uncertain. Even the requirements of passing the nightmare remained a mystery. Any decision he could make would have been a gamble, at best. Still, he had to make some if he wanted to survive. Not wasting any more time thinking, Sonny picked up the flagons inside. They spent the rest of the night seating with their backs against the bonfire, staring fearfully into the night. Despite the exhaustion, no one could sleep. The possibility of the tyrant coming back to finish the four survivors off was too frightening. Only Hero seemed to be fine, calmly sharpening his sword in the bright light of the dancing flames. The sound of the whetstone scraping against the blade was somehow comforting. At the break of dawn, when the sun had lazily begun to warm up the air, they loaded themselves with all the supplies they'd managed to gather and set out into the cold. Sonny looked back, taking in the sight of the stone platform for the last time. He had managed to get past the place where the slave caravan was supposed to perish. What was going to happen next? No one could tell, Chapter 9 Wishful Thinking. There was a problem. They were planning to follow the road up to the mountain pass and then over it, getting as far away from the scene of the massacre as they could before the night came. However, the road was no more. At some point during the last months, or maybe even just yesterday, a terrible rockfall occurred, obliterating whole segments of the narrow roadway and making its other parts untraversable. Sonny stood on the precipice of a vast chasm, looking down with no particular expression on his face. What do we do now? Scholar's voice was muffled by the collar of his scavenged fur cloak. His follower, Shifty, angrily looked around. His gaze stopped at Sonny, a suitable victim, to vent his frustration. I'll tell you what we need to do. Get rid of some dead weight. He eyed Sonny's fine boots and turned to Hero. Listen, your lordship. The boy is too weak. He is slowing us down. Plus, he's weird. Doesn't he give you the creeps? The young soldier answered with a judgmental frown, but Shifty wasn't done. Look. Look how he's glaring at me. I swear to gods, ever since he joined the caravan, nothing had gone right. Maybe the old man was right, the boy is cursed by the shadow god. Sonny struggled to not roll his eyes. It was true that he was unlucky, however, the whole truth was opposite to what Shifty was trying to insinuate. It was not that he had attracted misfortune to the slave caravan, on the contrary, it was because the caravan was doomed to begin with that he had ended up here. Scholar cleared his throat. But I've never said that. Whatever. Shouldn't we get rid of him just in case? He can't go on for much longer anyway. Scholar gave Sonny a strange look. Perhaps Sonny was getting paranoid, but there seemed to be a bit of calculating coldness in the older slave's eyes. Finally, Scholar shook his head. Don't be too hasty, my friend. The boy might prove useful later on. But? Hero finally spoke, putting an end to their quarrel. We're not going to leave anyone behind. As for how much longer he'll be able to endure, just worry about yourself. Shifty clenched his teeth, but then just waved a hand. Fine. So what do we do then? The four of them looked at the broken road, then down the slope of the mountain, and finally up, where a sheer cliff wall was broken apart by the falling rocks. After a bit of silence, Scholar finally spoke. Actually, in the old days, there used to be a path leading to the peak of the mountain. It was sometimes used by pilgrims. Later, the empire had widened parts of the path and built a proper road on top of it, now leading to the mountain pass instead of the peak, of course. He looked up. The remnants of the original path should still be somewhere above us. If we reach it, we should be able to find our way back to the undamaged section of the road. 
Everyone followed his gaze, shifting uncomfortably at the prospect of climbing the treacherous slope. Except for Hiro, of course, who remained as calm as a saint. Due to the rockfall, the slope wasn't an almost vertical wall anymore, but still, the incline was quite sharp. Shifty was the first one to speak. Climb that? Are you insane? Scholar helplessly shrugged. Do you have a better idea? No one did. After a bit of preparation, they began the ascent. Shifty and Scholar stubbornly carried the weapons they had picked up off the dead soldiers' bodies, but Sonny, with some regret, decided to leave his newfound short sword behind. He knew that this climb was going to test the limits of their endurance. The sword might not have seemed to be that heavy right now, but every extra gram of weight was bound to feel like a ton all too soon. As the weakest member of the group, he was already struggling to keep up, so there wasn't a lot of choice. Shedding a few kilograms of iron was the right thing to do. Walking up the mountain road with the weight of the supplies on his shoulders was already hard enough, but climbing up the mountain itself turned out to be pure torture. Just half an hour later, he felt like his muscles were going to melt, with his lungs on the verge of imploding. Clenching his teeth, Sonny continued to move forward and up. He had to constantly remind himself to watch his footing, too. On this unstable, icy slope one misstep was enough to send a man tumbling down to his death. Just think about something pleasant, he thought. But what happy thoughts could he summon? Failing to come up with something else, Sonny began to imagine what reward he was going to receive at the end of this trial. The boon of the first nightmare was the most important thing given to an awakened by the spell. Sure, later trials could provide them with more abilities and vastly improve their power. But it was this first one that determined what role an awakened would be able to play, how great their potential would be, and what price they would have to pay, not to mention giving them the necessary tools to survive and grow in the dream realm. The main benefit of the first nightmare's boon was simple, yet possibly the most important, after completing their trial, aspirants were bestowed with the ability to perceive and interact with soul cores. Soul cores were the basis of one's rank and power. The stronger your core was, the greater your might would grow. The same went for nightmare creatures, with a deadly caveat that, unlike humans, they could possess multiple cores a lowly beast had just one, but a tyrant like Mountain King had five. Coincidentally, the only way to improve your soul core was to consume soul shards scavenged from the corpses of other Dream Realm inhabitants. That's why Awakened went out of their way to battle powerful nightmare creatures despite the risk of death. The second benefit was less straightforward, but nevertheless vital. After completing the first nightmare, Aspirants were elevated to the rank of dreamers, colloquially known as sleepers, and gained access to the dream realm itself. They would enter it on the first winter solstice after passing the trial and remain there until an exit was found, thus becoming fully awakened. That time between finishing the first nightmare and entering the dream realm was very important, as it was the last chance to train and prepare yourself a person would receive. In Sunny's case, that time was only about a month, which was as bad as it gets. And then there was the final benefit, unique to every aspirant passing the trial, the first aspect ability. This was the magic power that elevated awakened above mundane humans. Aspect abilities were diverse, unique, and powerful. Some could be categorized into types like combat, sorcery, and utility, but some were simply beyond imagination. Armed with the power of their abilities, awakened had been able to save the world from the flood of nightmare creatures. However, that power came with a catch. With their first ability, every awakened also received a flaw, sometimes called the counter. These flaws were as diverse as abilities, ranging from comparatively harmless to crippling, or, in some cases, even fatal. I wonder what type of ability a temple slave would get, Sonny thought, not too optimistic about his prospects. The choice of flaws, on the other hand, seems to be almost limitless. Let's hope my aspect will evolve at the end of this fiasco or, even better, change completely. If the aspirant performed especially well, there was a chance of his given aspect going through an early evolution. Aspects, just like soul cores, had ranks based on potential power and rarity. The lowest rank was called dormant, followed by awakened, ascended, transcendent, supreme, sacred and divine, although no one has ever seen the last one. With the amount of crap it had put me through, the spell, if it has any conscience, has to give me at least an awakened aspect right? Or maybe even an ascended one. Finally, there was a tiny possibility of receiving a true name, something like an honorary title bestowed by the spell to its favorite awakened. The name itself had no benefit, 
but every famous awakened seemed to have one. It was considered to be the highest mark of excellence. However, the number of people who had managed to get a true name during their first nightmare was so small that Sonny didn't even bother thinking about it. Who needs excellence? Give me power. He cursed, feeling that this attempt at wishful thinking had only made him more depressed and angry. Maybe I'm allergic to dreaming. An allergy like that would be truly ironic, considering that he was destined to spend half of his remaining life in the dream realm if he even survives long enough to get there, that is. However, Sonny's mental escapade was not completely useless. Looking up from the slippery rocks under his feet, he noticed that the sun was already considerably lower. Come to think of it, the air also seemed to be much colder. At least it helped me pass the time, Sonny thought. The night was approaching, chapter 10 first man down. By the time they decided to stop, Sonny was on the verge of fainting. After hours and hours of traversing the rough mountain slope, his body was almost at its limit. However, to everyone's surprise, Shifty seemed to be doing even worse than him. The roguish slave's eyes were muddy and unfocused, aimlessly wandering around. His breath was ragged and shallow, as though something was exerting pressure on his lungs. He looked feverish and unwell. As soon as Hero found a suitable place for a camp, Shifty simply collapsed on the ground. The most unnerving part about all of this was the lack of angry cursing that they had already gotten used to. The slave lay silent and motionless, with only movements of his chest betraying that he was still alive. Several moments later, he uncorked his flagon with a shaky hand and greedily drank a few large gulps. Conserve your water, Hero said, a hint of concern somehow finding its way into his usually stoic voice. Disregarding these words, Shifty drank more, emptying the flagon completely. Scholar didn't look much better than him. The arduous climb took a heavy toll on the older slave. Despite the unbearable cold, he was sweaty, with bloodshot eyes and a grim expression on his face. Being the weakest of the three, Sonny had somehow managed to endure the best. Can't we just melt the snow once there's no more water? Hero gave Scholar a complicated look. There might come a time when we won't be able to make a fire as to not attract unwanted attention. No one commented, knowing perfectly well whose attention they had to avoid. The memory of Mountain King's horror was still fresh in their minds. Luckily, today Hero had managed to find a natural alcove in the mountain wall, perched precariously behind a narrow ledge. The fire was well hidden by the rocks, allowing them to enjoy its warmth without the fear of being noticed. No one was in the mood to talk, so they just roasted slices of oxen meat above the flames and ate in silence. By the time the skies had turned completely black, Shifty and Scholar were already asleep, lost in the thrall of their own nightmares. Hero took out his sword and moved to the edge of the rock outcropping. Try to rest, as well. I'll take the first watch. Sonny gave him a nod and lay down near the fire, dead tired. Falling asleep inside a dream was a new experience for him but, unexpectedly, it turned out to be quite mundane. As soon as his head touched the ground, his consciousness slipped into darkness. After what felt like only a second, someone had gently shaken him awake. Groggy and disoriented, Sonny blinked a few times, finally noticing Hero hovering above him. These two didn't look too well, so it's better to give them some time to recover. Don't let the flames go out and wake us up once the sun starts to rise. Or if, if the beast appears. Sonny silently rose and changed places with Hero, who added a couple of logs into the fire and was soon fast asleep. For a few hours, he was on his own. The skies were black, with dim stars and a sharp crescent of the newborn moon. However, its light was not enough to pierce the darkness that enveloped the mountain. Only Sonny's eyes seemed to be able to do so. He sat quietly, looking down the way they came. Despite the fact that they had managed to climb quite high during the previous day, he could still see the distant ribbon of the road. He could even trace it back to the stone platform where the fight with the tyrant had taken place. The tiny dots littering the stones were the dead bodies of the slaves. As he was watching them, a dark figure slowly crawled on the platform from beneath the cliff. It stayed motionless for a while and then moved forward, scraping its claws against the ground. Every time a claw hit one of the bodies, the tyrant would grab and bring it to its maw. The wind brought the muffled sounds of crunching bones to Sonny's ears. He flinched, accidentally pushing a small rock off the ledge. It fell, hit the slope and then rolled down, causing a few more to follow. The noise of these falling rocks sounded like thunder in the silent night. 
Far below, the tyrant suddenly turned its head, looking directly at Sonny. Sonny froze, petrified. He was scared to make even the tiniest sound. For a while, he even forgot to breathe. The tyrant was staring directly at him, not doing anything. A few torturous seconds passed, each feeling like an eternity. Then the tyrant calmly turned away and continued to devour dead slaves, as though he had not seen Sonny at all. It's blind, Sonny suddenly understood. He inhaled, watching Mountain King with widened eyes. It was true. The creature could not see. Looking back at everything that had happened earlier, he grew more and more certain of his guess. Those milky, expressionless eyes. Come to think of it, he never saw the tyrant moving them at all. And back when Sonny was pushing the wagon off the cliff, the tyrant only reacted after the wagons had started to fall, scraping loudly against the rocks. Of course. It was all making sense now. At the break of dawn, Sonny had woken the others up. Hero had hoped that a full night's rest would do Shifty and Scholar some good, but his hopes were crushed. Somehow, the two slaves looked even worse than before. It was as though yesterday's climb had overstrained Scholar too much. However, Shifty's condition could not be explained by simple overexertion. He was deadly pale and shaky, with half-conscious eyes and a lost look on his face. What's wrong with him? Scholar, who himself was not doing very well, helplessly shook his head. It might be the mountain sickness. It affects different people differently. His voice sounded raspy and weak. I'm fine, assholes. Get out of my face. Shifty had trouble forming full sentences, but still insisted that he was all right. Hero frowned and then took most of the supplies the defiant slave was supposed to carry before adding them to his own load. After hesitating a little, he gave some to Sonny, too. Did anything happen while we were asleep? Sonny stared at him for a few seconds. The monster ate the dead. The young soldier's frown deepened. How do you know? I heard it. Hero moved to the edge and looked down, trying to make out the distant stone platform. After a minute or so, he clenched his jaw, showing signs of uncertainty for the first time. Then we'll have to move faster. If the creature is finished with all the bodies, it will come for us next. We need to find that old path before nightfall. Frightened and dejected, they set out again and continued to climb. Sonny was slowly dying under the weight of the added load. Thankfully, Shifty and Scholar had already drunk most of the water, lightening it a little. This is hell, he thought. They climbed higher and higher and higher. The sun was climbing with them, slowly approaching the zenith. There was no talking, no laughs, only strained breathing. Each of the four survivors was concentrated on his own steps and footing. However, Shifty was falling farther and farther behind. His strength was abandoning him. And then, at some point, Sonny heard a desperate scream. Turning around, he only had time to see a panic-stricken face. Then Shifty fell backward, his foot slipping on an ice-covered rock. He hit the ground hard and rolled down, still trying to grab onto something. But it was too late. Frozen in place and powerless, they could only watch as his body tumbled down the slope, leaving bloody marks on the rocks. With each second, Shifty looked less like a man and more like a ragdoll. A handful of moments later, he finally came to a halt, hitting the top of a large, protruding stone in a pile of broken flesh. Shifty was dead, Chapter 11 Crossroads. The three of them stood motionless, looking down in uneasy silence. What happened to Shifty didn't come as a shock, but it was still a hard thing to digest. An ominous feeling settled in their hearts seeing the broken body of their companion. It was too easy to imagine one of them sharing the same fate. No one knew what to say. After a minute or so, Scholar finally sighed. It's a good thing that you took most of the supplies he had been carrying. A bit heartless, but not wrong, Sonny thought, giving the older slave a careful look. Scholar frowned, realizing that his mask of a kind-hearted gentleman had slipped for a second, and hurriedly added in a somber tone. May you rest in peace, my friend. Wow. What a performance. Actually, Sonny had not believed in his benevolent act for a second. Every kid from the outskirts knew that people who acted kind for no reason were the ones to be most wary of. They were either fools or monsters. Scholar didn't seem like a fool, so Sonny became cautious of him from the moment they met. He got this far by being a mistrustful cynic, and there was no reason to change now. We have to go. 
Hiro said, casting one last look down. His voice was even, but Sunny could feel a well of emotion behind it. He just couldn't tell what that emotion was. Scholar sighed and turned away, too. Sonny stared at the bloodied rocks for a few more seconds. Why do I feel so guilty, he thought, bewildered by this unexpected reaction. He got what he deserved. A little unsettled, Sonny turned around and followed his two remaining companions. Just like that, they left Shifty behind and continued to climb. At this altitude, traversing the mountain was getting harder and harder. The wind was slamming into them with enough force to throw a person off balance if they were not careful, making every step seem like a gamble. The air was becoming too thin to breathe. Due to the lack of oxygen, Sonny was starting to feel dizzy and nauseated. It was as though they were all slowly suffocating. Altitude sickness was not something one could overcome with effort. It was subtle and overbearing at the same time, affecting the strong and the weak with no regard to their fitness and endurance. If his luck was bad, an elite athlete could succumb to it faster than a random passerby. It was just a question of your body's innate aptitude and adaptability. Lucky ones were able to get over it after experiencing mild symptoms. The others were sometimes crippled for days or weeks, suffering from all kinds of torturous side effects. Some even died. As though all that wasn't bad enough, it was getting colder, too. The warm clothes and fur weren't enough to keep the chill at bay anymore. Sonny felt simultaneously feverish and freezing, cursing every decision he had made in his life to end up here, on the endless icy slope. This mountain was not a place for humans. And yet they had to go on. A few hours passed. Despite everything, the three survivors continued to struggle forward, slowly moving higher and higher. Wherever that old path scholar had talked about was, by now, it couldn't have been far. At least that's what Sonny was hoping for. But at some point, he started to doubt if the path even existed. Maybe the older slave lied. Maybe the path was long ago destroyed by ravages of time. Maybe they had already missed it without even noticing. Just as he was about to fall into despair, they finally found it. It was weathered and narrow, barely enough for two people to walk side by side. The path wasn't paved, but rather cut from the black rock by some unknown tool or magic, winding its way up the mountain like a tail of a sleeping dragon. Here and there, it was hidden beneath the snow. But most importantly, it was flat. Sonny had never been that happy to see something flat in his life. Without saying a word, Scholar dropped his rucksack and sat down. He was deathly pale, gasping for air like a fish out of water. Despite that, there was a slight grin on his face. Told you. Hiro gave him a nod and looked around. A few seconds later, he turned back to the triumphant slave. Stand up. It's not time to rest yet. Scholar blinked a few times, then glanced at him with pleading eyes. Just, just give me a few minutes. The young soldier was going to retort, but Sonny suddenly put a hand on his shoulder. Hiro turned to face him. What is it? It's gone. What is gone? Sonny gestured down, back the way they came. Shifty's body. It's gone. Hiro stared at him for a few moments, clearly failing to understand what Sonny was trying to say. Oh, right. They don't know that Shifty's name is Shifty. Ahem. Awkward. He wanted to explain, but both Scholar and Hiro seemed to have grasped his meaning. Simultaneously, they moved to the edge of the stone path and looked down, trying to spot the place where Shifty had met his end. Indeed, the splattering of blood could still be seen on the jagged rocks, but the corpse itself was nowhere to be found. Scholar flinched back and crawled as far away from the edge as he could. The young soldier also backed away, instinctively grabbing the handle of his sword. The three of them exchanged tense looks, clearly understanding the implication of Shifty's disappearance. It's the monster, Scholar said, even paler than before. It's following us. Hero gritted his teeth. You are right. And if it is that close, we will inevitably be forced to fight it soon. The idea of fighting the tyrant was as frightening as it was preposterous. He might as well have said that they will all be dead soon. The truth of it was painfully clear to both Sonny and Scholar. But the older slave, surprisingly, did not look panicked. Instead, he lowered his gaze and quietly said. Not necessarily. Hiro and Sonny turned to him, all ears. The young soldier raised an eyebrow. 
Explain? Here it comes. Scholar sighed. The beast had traced us this far in just a day. That means that there are two most probable possibilities. Either it is smart enough to realize where we are going, or it is following the scent of blood. After a bit of thinking, Hiro nodded, agreeing with this logic. The older slave smiled slightly and continued. Whether it is one or another, we can throw him off our trail and buy some time. How do we do that? Despite the urgency in Hiro's voice, Scholar hesitated and remained silent. Why are you not answering? Speak. The older slave sighed again and slowly, as though against his will, answered. Sonny was waiting for this moment for a while now. We'll just have to make the boy bleed. Drag him down the path, then leave him there as bait and go up instead. His sacrifice will save our lives. Right on time. If Sonny wasn't mad and scared witless, of course, he would have smiled. His judgment, it seems, was eerily on point. Affirmation was always nice, but not in the situation where being right also meant potentially being used as monster bait. He remembered the words Scholar had spoken back when Shifty was campaigning to have Sonny killed, don't be too hasty, my friend. The boy might prove useful later on. These words, which had sounded benevolent then, now turned out to hide a much more sinister meaning. What a bastard. Now it all depended on whether or not Hero would decide to follow through with Scholar's plan. The young soldier blinked, astonished. What do you mean, make him bleed? Scholar shook his head. It's simple, really. If the monster knows where we are going, we have no choice but to abandon our plans to reach the mountain pass and go over the peak of the mountain instead. If the monster is following the scent of blood, we have to use one of us as bait to mislead it. He paused. Only by leaving a bleeding man further down the path can we reliably avoid the pursuit no matter how it is tracking us. Hero stood motionless, his eyes jumping between Scholar and Sonny. After a few seconds, he asked. How can you bring yourself to propose something so vile? The older slave masterfully pretended to look aggrieved and somber. Of course, it pains me. But if we do nothing, all three of us will die. This way, at least, the boy's death will save two lives. The gods will reward him for his sacrifice. Gee, what a silver tongue. I'm almost convinced myself. The young soldier opened his mouth, then closed it again, hesitating. Sonny was silently watching the other two survivors, measuring his chances of coming on top in a fight. Scholar was already halfway to being a corpse, so overpowering him would not be a problem. Hero, however. Hero presented an obstacle, Chapter 12 The Smell of Blood. Right now, that obstacle was looking down, avoiding Sonny's gaze. His hand was resting on the sword handle. As always, the young slave had no idea about what was going on inside Hero's perfectly shaped head. The uncertainty was making him nervous. Finally, after some time had passed, the soldier spoke. I have only one question. Both Sonny and Scholar stared at him while holding their breaths. Yes? You said that one of us must be sacrificed to save the other two. Why him? From what I see, you are far closer to the grave. A great question. I was just about to ask it myself. Sonny turned to the older slave, trying very hard to suppress a mocking grin. But to his dismay, Scholar had an answer ready. Before the first attack, he was already bleeding because of your senior's whip. During the attack, he was drenched in the blood of a fellow slave. His cloak, too, was soaked in it when the previous owner died. The boy already reeks of blood. Keeping him alive will put us in danger. That's why he is the best choice. The grin died before reaching Sonny's face. Curse you and your big brain. Scholar's reasoning was appallingly solid. Hero listened, his expression growing darker with each word. Finally, he looked at Sonny, a dangerous light shining in his eyes. That is true. Sonny felt his mouth getting dry. Cold sweat was running down his spine. He tensed, ready to act. But at that moment, Hero smiled. Your logic is almost unassailable, he said, unsheathing the sword. However, you failed to account for one thing. Scholar raised an eyebrow, trying to hide his own nervousness. What might that be? The young soldier turned to face him, the smile disappearing from his face. Now, he was radiating thick, 
practically palpable killing intent. It's that I know who you are, your grace. I also know what you've done, and how you ended up a salve. Just one of the revolting crimes you have committed would be enough to make me want to kill you. So if there is someone among us who deserves to be sacrificed, it's you. Scholar's eyes widened. But, but the smell of blood. Don't worry about it. I'll make you bleed enough to overpower whatever residual scent the boy carries. It all happened so fast that Sonny barely had time to react. Hero lunged forward with a speed that seemed almost inhuman. A moment later, Scholar was shrieking on the ground, his leg broken with one strike from the flat side of the young soldier's sword. Not giving him an opportunity to recover, Hero stomped on his other leg, and a sickening sound of shattering bones could be clearly heard. The shriek turned into a sobbing howl. Just like that, Scholar was done for. The brutality of Hero's actions was in such stark contrast with his usually graceful demeanor that Sonny felt blood turning to ice in his veins. This was, scary. The soldier gave him a calm look and said in a placid tone. Wait for me here. Then he grabbed the older slave and dragged him down the path, soon disappearing behind a rock outcropping. After a few minutes, terrible screams could be heard echoing through the wind. Sonny was left alone, trembling. Crap! This is, this is too much. He still couldn't believe how sudden Scholar's demise came to be. And how ruthless it was. Some time later, Hero was back, acting as though nothing had happened. But it was exactly that normalcy that unnerved Sonny the most. After sorting through the contents of Scholar's rucksack and throwing most of the firewood out, the young soldier put it over his shoulder and nonchalantly turned to the young slave. Let's go. We need to hurry. Not knowing what to say, Sonny gave him a nod and headed forward. Now there were only two of them left. It was sort of stupid, but Sonny suddenly felt lonesome. Walking on the stone path was much easier than scaling the mountain wall. He even had time for unnecessary thoughts. A strange feeling of melancholy descended on Sonny, somehow, he began to feel that the end of this nightmare, whatever it might be, was not far off now. They walked in silence for some time before Hero spoke. Don't feel guilty about what happened. It's not your fault. The decision was mine, and mine alone. The young soldier was a few steps ahead, so Sonny couldn't see his face. Besides, if you knew this man's sins, actually, it's better that you don't. Just trust me when I say that killing him was an act of justice. I wonder which one of us feels guilty. These people, always trying to rationalize their actions, always desperate to maintain an illusion of righteousness even while doing most foul things. Sonny hated the hypocrisy. Not getting an answer, Hero chuckled. You don't like to talk, do you? Well, fair enough. Silence is gold. They didn't speak again after that, each preoccupied with their own thoughts. The sun was setting, painting the world into a million shades of crimson. This high up, the air was clean and crisp, pierced by streams of scarlet light. Below them, a sea of maroon clouds was slowly rolling past the mountain. The stars and the moon had begun to reveal themselves in the vermilion sky. It was quite beautiful. However, Sonny could only think about how cold it was going to be once the sun fully disappears. Before that happened, Hero had found them a shelter. Not far from the path, hidden behind some tall rocks, was a narrow crevice that extended into the slope of the mountain. Happy to be safe from the piercing wind, they explored the crevice and ended up in a small, well-concealed cave. Sonny made a move to unbundle some firewood, but Hero stopped him with a shake of his head. Today we will camp without making a fire. The beast is too close. Camping without the warm flames to keep them company was not going to be pleasant, but at least they weren't going to freeze to death inside the cave. In any case, the alternative was too frightening. Sonny sat down, putting his back against the cave's wall. Hero settled opposite of him, looking downcast and thoughtful. He was obviously in a strange mood. If nothing else, it was apparent from the fact that today, for the first time, the young soldier had failed to care for his sword after making camp. Soon, the sun was gone, and their small cave became completely dark. Sonny, of course, could still see perfectly well, Hero, on the other hand, was now completely blind. In the darkness, his handsome face looked noble and, for some reason, sorrowful. Sonny studied it, not willing to fall asleep. After a while, Hero suddenly spoke in a quiet voice. You know, it's strange. Usually, I can feel someone's presence even in absolute darkness. 
But with you, there's nothing. It's like you are just one of the shadows. With only silence to answer him, he smiled. Are you asleep? The question echoed in the darkness. Sunny, who had never spoken with Hero unless there was an urgent need to, and even then only using a few words at best, felt like there was a strange intimacy between them now. That's why he decided to talk. Maybe the darkness gave him courage. Besides, there was an occasion. Why? Are you waiting for me to fall asleep before you kill me? Or will you do it in the morning? Chapter 13 Moment of Truth The smile froze on Hero's face. He lowered his head, as though in shame. After a minute or so passed, shrouded in heavy silence, he finally answered, Yes. I thought that if I do it when you sleep, you won't have to suffer. Unseen to him, a bitter grin appeared on Sonny's face. A long sigh escaped from the young soldier's lips. He rested his back against the cave's wall, still not looking up. I don't expect you to forgive me. This sin, too, will be mine to bear. But, please, if you can, find it in your heart to understand. If things were different, I would have gladly faced that monster to let you escape. But my life does not belong to me alone. There is an unencompassable duty I am sworn to fulfill. Until it's done, I cannot allow myself to die. Sonny laughed. You people. Look at you. Planning to kill me and still insisting on having a good excuse. How very convenient. I really hate hypocrites like you the most. Why don't you be honest for once? Don't give me that crap, just say it. I'm going to kill you because it's easy. I'm going to kill you because I want to survive. Hero closed his eyes, his face full of sadness. I'm sorry. I knew you wouldn't be able to understand. What's there to understand? Sonny leaned forward, anger coursing through his veins. Tell me. Why do I have to die? The young soldier finally looked up. Even though he couldn't see in the dark, he turned his face in the direction of Sonny's voice. That man was a villain, but he was also right. The scent of blood is too heavy on you. It will attract the beast. You can just let me go, you know. We'll part ways. After that whether or not the monster finds me won't be your problem. Hero shook his head. Dying in that creature's maw is too cruel a fate. It's better if I do it myself. You are my responsibility, after all. How noble of you. Sonny leaned back, dejected. After a short while, he quietly said. You know, when I just came here, I was ready to die. After all, in this whole world, two worlds, actually, there's not a single soul who cares whether I live or die. When I'm gone, no one will be sad. No one will even remember that I existed. There was a forlorn look on his face. A moment later, however, it was gone, replaced by mirth. But then I changed my mind. Somewhere along the way, I decided to survive. I must survive, no matter what. Hero gave him a thoughtful look. To live a life worth remembering? Sonny grinned. A dark gleam appeared in his eyes. No. To spite you all. The young soldier was silent for a few moments, then nodded, accepting this answer. He rose to his feet. Don't worry. I'll make it quick. Aren't you overly confident? What makes you think you'll be able to kill me? Maybe I'll kill you instead. Hero shook his head. I doubt that. But in the next second, he staggered and fell on one knee. The young man's face turned deathly pale, and with a pained groan, he suddenly vomited blood. A satisfied smile appeared on Sonny's face. Finally. Finally. Hero was standing on his knees, the lower part of his face covered in blood. Astonished, he was staring at his hands, trying to understand what had happened to him. What, what magic is this? With wide eyes and a pale face, he turned to Sonny. Was, was that thief right? Did you put the curse of the shadow god on us? Sonny sighed. I wish that I had the ability to throw divine curses around, but no. To tell you the truth, I don't have any abilities at all. Then. How? The young slave shrugged. That's why I poisoned you all. Hero flinched, trying to comprehend his words. What? 
After the tyrant first attacked, you send me to search for water. While gathering flagons from the dead soldiers, I squeezed bloodbane juice into each one except my own, of course. Not enough to taste it, but enough to slowly kill anyone who would drink from them. The soldier gritted his teeth, struggling through pain. A sudden realization appeared on his face, so that's why the other two were in such bad shape. Sonny nodded. Shifty drank the most, so his condition worsened the fastest. Scholar was also not long for this world, but you finished him off before the poison could. Yourself, however, it was as though Bloodbane had no effect on you at all. I was really starting to get worried. Hero's face darkened. I see. I understand. He thought about something, then looked at Sunny with surprise. But, but back then you didn't know that we will turn on you. Sunny just laughed. Oh, please. It was obvious. Shifty was the kind of man who would kill for a pair of boots. Scholar was like a wolf in sheep's clothing. People are selfish and cruel in the best of situations, was I supposed to believe that those two weren't going to do something terrible to me when faced with certain death? Hero spat more blood. Then, what about me? You? A disdainful expression appeared on Sonny's face. You are the worst of them. Why? Sonny looked at him and leaned forward. I might have not learned much in my short life, but I do know one thing, he said, all traces of humor gone from his voice. Now there was only cold, callous contempt. Sonny's face hardened as he spat. There is nothing more pathetic than a slave who begins to trust his slaver. Hearing these words, Hero lowered his head. I see. Then, suddenly, he laughed. You, you are a wicked little shit, aren't you? Sonny rolled his eyes. There's no need to be rude. But Hero wasn't listening to him. Good. This is good. My conscience will be clearer. The young slave sighed in irritation. What are you mumbling about? Just die already. Hero chuckled and suddenly pierced him with a stare. Somehow, he didn't look so sick anymore. You see, that plan would have worked if I was a normal human. But, alas, my soul core has awakened long ago. I've slain countless enemies and absorbed their power. Bloodbane poison, unpleasant as it might be, can never kill me. Crap. Sonny turned around and tried to run away, but it was already too late. Something hit him in the back, sending his body crashing into the rock wall. With a scream, he felt a sharp pain piercing his left side. Rolling out of the cave, Sonny clutched his chest, scrambled back onto his feet and ran, trying to escape the narrow crevice. He managed to reach the old path, finally being able to see the stars and the pale moon shining brightly in the night sky. But it was as far as he was able to get. Stop. As the cold voice sounded behind him, Sonny froze. If Hero really had an awakened soul core, he had no chances of getting away from him. In a fight, he had no chances at all. Turn around. The young slave obediently turned, holding his hands up. He looked at Hero, who was wiping the blood off his face with a displeased look in his eyes. The two of them stared at each other, shivering in the murderous cold. Was it worth it? No matter. Despite it all, I will be true to my promise. I'll make it quick. The soldier unsheathed his sword. Do you have any last words? Sonny did not answer. However, a small silver bell suddenly appeared in his hand. Hero frowned. Where were you hiding that thing? Sonny shook the bell. A beautiful, clear ringing sound flowed over the mountain, filling the night with an enchanting melody. What are you doing? Stop. The young slave dutifully stopped. What was? Right under Hero's bewildered eyes, the silver bell disappeared into thin air. He looked at Sonny, stumped and suspicious. Tell me. What did you just do? But Sonny didn't answer. In fact, he hadn't said a single word ever since escaping the cave. Right now, he wasn't even breathing. Hero, on the other hand, continued to speak. Tell me right now, or you will regret it. He scowled. Why are you not saying anything? The shivering boy just stared at him, completely silent. No, he was staring into the darkness behind him. Hero's eyes widened. What, Chapter 14 Child of Shadows? Sonny had no choice but to resort to one last, desperate gamble. 
he had no chance against the enemy in a direct confrontation, at least not without an advantage. Bloodbane poison was supposed to be his hidden card, but turned out to be nearly useless. Being able to see in the dark did not help that much, too, somehow, Hero was able to perceive their surroundings even without any light. Whether he was using his sense of hearing or some magical ability, Sunny did not know, not that it mattered now that they had left the cave and were standing under the moonlit sky. Now he had only one advantage left. The fact that he knew that the tyrant was blind, and Hero did not. Acting on that knowledge, however, was easier said than done. But what else could he do? That's why he tried to stay as quiet as possible and rang the silver bell. If the description did not lie, its ringing could be heard from miles away. Surely, the tyrant was going to hear it, too. Now Sonny only had to stay silent, stall for time and hope that the monster would come. As he did so, Hero's bewilderment slowly turned into anger. Tell me right now, or you will regret it. His voice was quite threatening, but still, the young slave did not answer. He just shivered in the cold and tried not to moan despite the pulsing pain in his chest. Why are you not answering? But Sonny did not dare to answer. He held his breath and watched, horrified, as the familiar colossal figure appeared behind Hero. His lungs were on fire, and his heart was beating like crazy. It was beating so loud that he was even afraid that the blind tyrant would hear it. But, of course, it couldn't be louder than Hero's voice, who was still talking, turning himself into the only source of noise on this mountain. At the last second, a hint of understanding appeared in the young soldier's eyes. He began to turn around, his sword rising with lightning speed but it was too late. A massive hand appeared from the darkness and caught him into an iron grip. The bone claws scraped against the armor, pulling it apart. Mountain King dragged Hero back, paying little attention to the sword biting into its wrist. Viscous saliva was streaming from its opened maw. Petrified by fear, Sonny slowly turned his back to them and took a couple of steps up the old, winding path. Then he darted away, running as fast as he could. Behind him, a desperate scream tore apart the silent night. Then a hungry roar followed. It seemed that Hero wasn't going down without a fight, even though his fate was already sealed. But Sonny didn't care. He was running away, climbing higher and higher. I'm sorry, Hero, he thought. I did say that I will watch you die, but, as you know, I am a liar. So go and die on your own. A lonesome dark mountain stood tall against the raging winds. Jagged and proud, it dwarfed other peaks of the mountain chain, cutting the night sky with its sharp edges. A radiant moon bathed its slopes in the ghostly light. Under that light, a young man with pale skin and black hair reached the peak of the mountain. However, his looks didn't match the magnificence of the scene, wounded and staggering, he looked pathetic and weak. The young man looked like a walking corpse. His coarse tunic and cloak were torn and smeared with blood. His sunken eyes were cloudy and lifeless. His body was bruised, beaten, and cut. There were specks of bloody foam on his lips. He was hunched over, cradling the left side of his chest. Each step caused him to moan, ragged breath barely escaping through gritted teeth. Sonny was hurting all over. But most of all, he was cold. So, so cold. He just wanted to lie down in the snow and fall asleep. But instead, he continued walking. Because he believed that the nightmare will be over once he reaches the peak. Step. Step. Another step. Finally, he had made it. At the highest point of the mountain, a vast expanse of flat rock was covered with snow. In the center of it, illuminated by moonlight, stood a magnificent temple. Its colossal columns and walls were cut from black marble, with exquisite reliefs decorating the Stygian pediment and broad frieze. Beautiful and awesome, it looked like a palace of a dark god. At least it did once. Now, the temple was in ruins, fractures and cracks marred the black stones, parts of the roof had collapsed, letting in ice and snow. Its tall gates were broken, as if smashed into pieces by a hand of a giant. Still, Sonny was satisfied. Found you, he said in a hoarse voice. Gathering the last of his strength, the young slave slowly limped in the direction of the ruined temple. His thoughts were muddled and confused. See this, hero, he thought, forgetting for a second that hero was already dead. I've made it. You were strong and ruthless, and I was weak and timid. Yet now you are a corpse, and I am still alive. Isn't it funny? He stumbled and groaned, feeling the edges of his broken ribs cutting deeper into his lungs. 
blood was dripping from his mouth. Dead or not, Hiro had gotten in good with that single strike. Actually, it's not. What do any of you even know about being ruthless? Poor fools. In the world where I come from, people had thousands of years to turn cruelty into an art. And as someone on the receiving end of all that cruelty, don't you think I would know more about being vicious than you ever could? He was getting closer to the temple. Truth be told, you never stood a chance, wait. What was I thinking about? A moment later, he had already forgotten. There was only pain, the dark temple, and the overpowering desire to sleep. Don't fall for it. It's just hypothermia. If you fall asleep, you'll die. Finally, Sonny reached the steps of the Black Temple. He started to climb them, not noticing thousands of bones that were scattered around. These bones once belonged to humans and monsters both. All of them were killed by the invisible guardians still lingering around the temple. As Sonny was climbing the steps, one of the shapeless guardians approached him. It was ready to snuff out the spark of life that was burning weakly in the defiler's chest, but then stopped, sensing a faint, strangely familiar scent coming from his soul. The scent of divinity. Sorrowful and lonesome, the guardian moved aside, letting Sonny pass. Oblivious, he entered the temple. Sonny found himself in a grandiose hall. Cascades of moonlight were falling through the holes in the partially collapsed roof. Deep shadows were surrounding these circles of silver light, not daring to touch them. The floor was covered in snow and ice. At the far end of the hall, a large altar was cut from a single piece of black marble. It was the only thing inside the temple untouched by snow. Forgetting why he came here, Sonny headed for the altar. He just wanted to sleep. The altar was dry, clean, and as white as a bed. Sonny climbed on it and lay down. It seemed like he was going to die. He was okay with it. Sonny tried to close his eyes, but was stopped by a sudden noise coming from the direction of the temple's entrance. He turned his head to look, not even a little bit curious. What he saw would have sent chills running down his spine if he wasn't so cold, tired, and indifferent. Mountain King was standing there, looking at him with its five blind eyes. He was still massive, terrifying, and revolting. Worm like shapes were still moving frantically under its skin. It was sniffing the air, salivating. Then it opened its maw and moved forward, slowly approaching the altar. What an ugly bastard, Sonny thought, and suddenly clutched his chest, convulsing in a fit of torturous coughing. Bloody foam flew from his mouth and fell on the altar. However, the black marble soon absorbed it. A second later, it was as pristine as it was before. The tyrant was just about to reach Sonny. It was already stretching its hands to grab him. I guess this is the end, he thought, resigned to his fate. But at the last second, suddenly, the voice of the spell resounded in the dark temple. You have offered yourself as a sacrifice to the gods. The gods are dead and cannot hear you. You soul bears the mark of divinity. You are a temple slave. Shadow God stirs in his eternal slumber. He sends a blessing from beyond the grave. Child of shadows, receive your blessing. Under Sonny's astonished eyes, the shadows crowding the great hall suddenly moved, as though coming alive. Tentacles of darkness surged forward, entangling Mountain King's arms and legs. The mighty tyrant struggled, trying to get free. But how could it resist the power of a god? The shadows dragged Mountain King back pulling in different directions. The tyrant opened its maw, and a furious howl escaped it. The next second, its body ruptured, torn apart into pieces. Blood, viscera, and severed limbs fell on the floor in a crimson torrent. Just like that, the horrible creature was dead. Sonny blinked. Once again, he was alone in the ruined temple. The great hall was dark and silent, and then the spell whispered. You have slain an awakened tyrant, Mountain King. Wake up, sunless. Your nightmare is over. Prepare for appraisal, Chapter 15 Shadow Slave. Prepare for appraisal. Sonny found himself in a space between dream and reality. It was an endless black void illuminated by a myriad of stars. Between those stars, countless strings of silver light were woven into a beautiful and inconceivably complex net, forming various nexuses and constellations. It was truly breathtaking. Somehow, Sonny understood that he was seeing the inner workings of the nightmare spell. He also couldn't help but think that it looked a lot like the celestial equivalent of a neural network. If so, was the spell alive? 
This was a question that countless people had been asking themselves for the past few decades. The best answer they had come up with was that there was no way to know. The spell was neither alive nor dead, neither sentient nor mindless. It was more of a function than a creature. But Sonny was in no mood to ponder philosophical questions. He was eagerly awaiting his boon. The spell was still appraising his performance. However, the first reward had nothing to do with it. You have received a memory, Puppeteer Shroud. Yes. Sonny felt incredibly elated. He was almost ready to do a happy dance. That memory belonged to Mountain King, who was an awakened tyrant, which meant that the memory itself was of the awakened rank. Getting it was a stroke of incredible luck. There were seven ranks to everything in the spell. These ranks were, in order of growing power, dormant, awakened, ascended, transcendent, supreme, sacred and divine, with the exclusion of nightmare creatures who were ranked as dormant, awakened, fallen, corrupted, great, cursed and unholy. From the spell's point of view, Sonny was a dormant human. Having a memory of a higher rank than his own soul core would be of great help once he enters the dream realm. The power gap between different ranks simply could not be overestimated. He wanted to take a look at the puppeteer's shroud, but there was no more time. The spell was done with its appraisal. Here in the void, its voice didn't sound subtle and familiar anymore. Rather, it seemed like the universe itself was speaking. Sonny held his breath, listening. Aspirant. Your trial is over. A nameless slave ascended the Black Mountain. Both heroes and monsters fell by his hand. Unbroken, he entered the ruined temple of a long-forgotten god and spilled his blood on the sacred altar. The gods were dead, and yet they listened. You have defeated a dormant beast, Mountain King's larva. You have defeated three dormant humans, names unknown. You have defeated an awakened human, Oro of the Nine. You have defeated an awakened tyrant, Mountain King. You have received the Shadow God's blessing. You have achieved the impossible. Final appraisal, glorious. Your treachery truly knows no bounds. That final part was not really necessary, as far as Sonny was concerned, but he was still pretty satisfied with the praise from the spell. He felt like his chances of evolving his aspect to an awakened, or even ascended one, were pretty high. His overall power was still dependent on the rank of his soul core, which would remain dormant until much later but the rank of the aspect itself would do wonders for his overall potential. Dreamer Sunless, receive your boon. He was an aspirant no more. Sunny grinned. You have been bestowed a true name, lost from light. His jaw dropped. A true name. He had received a true name. Never in his wildest dreams did Sunny dream of becoming one of the chosen few to accomplish such feat and in his very first nightmare to boot. Not even all of the saints could boast of having one. He was an elite now, a bona fide cream of the crop. He was going to be rich, but the rewards kept coming. Your aspect is ready to evolve. Evolve aspect? What kind of a question is that? Sonny crossed his fingers and said yes. Dormant aspect temple slave is evolving. New aspect acquired. Aspect rank, divine. Sonny fell over. Aspect name, shadow slave. Divine, it's divine. Sonny was standing on his knees, stupefied. The shock was so great that for a second there he lost all control over his limbs and fell. It said divine, right? He raised a trembling hand and rubbed his eyes, making sure that he was awake. Or rather conscious, since, technically, he was still sleeping in the underground vault of the police station. Confused by all this terminology, Sonny silently summoned the runes and found the lines describing his aspect. Aspect, shadow slave. Aspect Rank, Divine. Aspect Description, You are a miraculous shadow left behind by a dead god. As a divine shadow, you possess plenty of strange and wondrous powers. However, your existence is empty and lonesome. You mourn the passing of your former master and long to find a new one. Innate Ability, Shadow Bond. Ability Description, Find a worthy master and let them know your true name. Once they recite it out loud, you will be bound to their will, unable to disobey any command. It is improper for a shadow, let alone a divine one, to walk around without a master. That was, a lot to digest. First of all, Sonny felt his heart beating faster. He heard it right. All the suffering and horror he had experienced in the first nightmare paid off in the end. A divine aspect, he had received a divine aspect. Anything above awakened was rare and immensely valuable. 
people with ascended aspects were rare enough to be fought over by various factions. The factions themselves were built around singular powerhouses with transcendent or supreme aspects. And he had never, ever heard of anyone acquiring a divine one. Never. Anything with the divine prefix was so hard to find that it mostly lived in the realm of myths and legends. After all, the human race had not reached that high yet, it was only slightly more than a decade since humans managed to finally conquer the third nightmare and receive the ability to evolve their cores to transcendent rank. As transcendents, or saints, as they were called in the real world powerful awakened ruled over the dream realm, but even they did not dare to face nightmare creatures of higher ranks. Subsequently, there were not a lot of memories and echoes of supreme rank around, let alone sacred, or divine. The same went for aspects. And yet Sonny just got one, he grinned, driven half-mad by joy and arrogance. However, his jubilation was a little muddied. After all, there was that weird innate ability. Of course, he had no intention of becoming someone's magical slave, with no free will of his own. To hell with that, but it wasn't that bad. All he had to do to avoid that fate was to conceal his true name. No one except for him could see his status. That meant that Sonny just had to keep his mouth shut, and no one will know that he even had one. It meant giving up on all the benefits that someone who was bestowed a true name after the first nightmare was entitled to, but it all paled in comparison with a divine aspect. Not a problem, Sonny thought with a smirk. If the spell had the ability to laugh, it would surely do so after hearing his thoughts. However, it didn't. Instead, it began to speak again. The first seal is broken. Awakening Dormant Powers, Chapter 16 Rebirth Sonny felt something waking up inside of him. With a startled cry, he clutched his chest and stared into the darkness, trying to understand what was happening. The feeling was not painful or unpleasant, yet it was like nothing he had ever experienced. It was as though his soul was being shaken awake, infused with strange new energy. However, that energy did not come from some outside source. Rather, it was coming from within, as though it had always been there, sleeping. The energy filled every fiber of his being. Sonny felt his emotions becoming clearer and sharper. Then, his body began to change, too. He felt as though a miniature star was burning in the center of his chest, waves of heat were radiating from it, slowly reaching his stomach and shoulders, then his arms and legs, then his hands and feet. Under that heat, his bones, muscles, organs and blood vessels were being rebuilt and revitalized. Sonny felt like he was being reborn. He was becoming stronger, faster, healthier. It was euphoric. With each second, his transformation was becoming more profound. New confidence settled in Sonny's heart. He was not a weak, frail street kid anymore. He was not as vulnerable against anyone who would wish to bully him as he was in the past. With his powers awakened and his will tempered by the horrors of the first nightmare, he was now someone you would not want to cross. After some time had passed, the star burning in his chest finally cooled down. The heat was replaced with a soothing coldness. That coldness washed over Sonny's body, taking away all the aches and discomforts that had been accumulated there over the years. Then it moved up, reaching his brain and, finally, his eyes. His vision strangely doubled. He could still see the void populated by an endless pattern of stars. But he could also see something different. A silent, calm dark sea illuminated by a lonely black sun. From his previous knowledge, Sonny knew that this was his so-called sea of soul. But he also knew that it was supposed to look quite different. For starters, it was supposed to be much more lively. The star hanging above, the visual representation of his soul core, was supposed to be burning with bright light, filling the soul sea with a warm, blinding shining. However, Sonny's soul was dark and lightless. That's strange. He took a look at the black sun. At a closer examination, it actually turned out to be transparent. It's just that with no other major source of light around, the star had appeared to be as dark as its surroundings. Also, no one was supposed to be here except for him. It was his soul, after all. But Sonny had a nagging feeling that somewhere just beyond the periphery of his vision, hidden in the darkness, shapeless forms were constantly moving. No matter how he turned his head, he couldn't catch a clear glimpse of them. And yet the feeling would not go away. Not wishing to waste any more time on this right now, Sonny turned back to the black sun and finally spotted two spheres of light orbiting around it, as though caught in the soul core's gravity well. A subtle smile appeared on his face. 
These were his memories, Silver Bell and Pupiter's Shroud. Later, there would be dozens of such spheres here. If he was lucky, he would even acquire an echo or two. The spell's voice suddenly pulled him out of the Sea of Soul. Awakening Aspect Ability. This is it. The moment of truth, Sunny thought. Divine aspect or not, his immediate future still depended on the first aspect ability he would receive. His role in the dream realm would be based on its characteristics. If it was a combat ability, he would be most useful on the front lines of the bloody battles against the nightmare creatures. If it was tied to sorcery, he would likely become a powerful but fragile ranged fighter. If it was something having to do with utility, he would be a vitally important part of the behind-the-scenes workings of the dream realm. Utility abilities were also extremely valued in the real world, where Awakened performed many tasks that kept it going. If he was lucky, he could even become a healer. Healers were very rare, and as such, sought after specialists. Aspect Ability Acquired Aspect Ability Name, Shadow Control Sunny hurriedly summoned the runes. He wanted to go to the description of his new ability right away, but then decided to give his overall information a look first. Name, Sunless True Name, Lost from Light Rank, Dreamer Shadow Core, Dormant Shadow Fragments, 12 slash 1000 What? What is that? Where the rank of his soul core was supposed to be written, a mysterious shadow core appeared instead. Sunny looked at it, blinking. He had never heard of anyone having a different kind of core before. Was he that unique? This enigmatic shadow core would certainly explain why his sea of soul looked so strange. And also. He moved his eyes down, noticing the shadow fragments counter. Usually, there was supposed to be an indicator of the number of soul shards consumed. However, it was nowhere to be seen. Do I, do I actually have a completely different progression path than all awakened? The idea was as exciting as it was frightening. Not having to fight for resources with anybody else was an incredible advantage. Most of the human society in the dream realm was built around the acquisition of soul shards. If he had no need to gather them to evolve, not only would he be able to become more powerful with incredible speed, he would also be completely self-sufficient. On the other hand, he had no idea how to acquire these shadow fragments. However, he had gotten 12 of them somehow already, so whatever it was that he had to do, he had already done it in the first nightmare. I'll have to explore this carefully. Satisfied with this decision, Sunny continued to study the runes. Memories, Silver Bell, Puppeteer's Shroud. Echoes. Attributes, Faded, Mark of Divinity, Child of Shadows. Aspect, Shadow Slave. Aspect Rank, Divine. Aspect Abilities, Shadow Control. Aspect Ability Description, Your Shadow is more independent than most. It is an invaluable helper. What is that supposed to mean? Sunny held his breath and began to read the description again, but at that moment, a new set of runes appeared just below it. Simultaneously, the spell's voice resounded in the black void. All power has a price. You have received a flaw. Your flaw is... Sonny read the runes, and his eyes widened in horror. Oh, no. No, 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 chapter 17 Three simple words. He closed his eyes, then opened them again, hoping that the runes would disappear. Please, be gone. Please. But the runes were still there, shining slightly, as though mocking him. Flaw, clear conscience. Flaw description, you cannot lie. Sonny stared at these three simple words, feeling like there was a bottomless abyss opening right beneath his feet. The spell, which was usually frivolous with its descriptions, decided to be straight and on point this time. There were only three words. They left him no room to maneuver. Can't lie. I can't lie? Me? How am I supposed to live if I can't lie? Sonny's very survival was predicated on his ability to deceive and outsmart other people. Even the spell itself congratulated him on his treachery. Without the ability to lie, he wouldn't be able to achieve anything. Not to mention, his heart suddenly felt as though it was about to stop. If he could only tell the truth, how was he supposed to hide his true name? Wouldn't anyone be able to turn him into an obedient slave by simply asking a couple of innocent questions? S.H. Sonny was about to scream and curse, but at that moment, the spell spoke again. Wake up, lost from light. The black void spun and disappeared. Sonny opened his eyes. The armored ceiling of the police station's vault hang above him. 
No one would call its aesthetics beautiful, but to him, it was the most majestic sight. Only now did he realize how much he had missed the real world. It was safe and familiar. There were no monsters or slavers, well, at least officially. There was no constant fear of torturous death. It was home. In addition, Sonny felt incredible. The cold that had crept deep into his bones during the nightmare was gone, taking with it all the pain that his wounded body had been enduring day after day. His feet and wrists were not in agony, his back had forgotten the bite of the whip, and he could even breathe without feeling the sharp edges of his broken ribs cutting deeper and deeper into his lungs. What a blessing! The sudden disappearance of pain, coupled with the new vitality that permeated his body, almost made Sonny cry. I really survived. He slowly looked down and then froze, breathless. On a cheap plastic chair placed beside his reinforced medical bed sat the most beautiful woman he had ever seen. She had short, raven black hair and icy blue eyes. Her flawless skin was smooth, supple, and as white as snow. Actually, this was Sonny's first time meeting someone as pale as he himself was. However, while Sonny's pallor looked strange and unhealthy, the beautiful stranger was nothing short of striking. The woman seemed to be in her late twenties. She was wearing a dark blue uniform with silver epaulets and black leather boots. The jacket of her uniform was casually unbuttoned, revealing a black tank top beneath. Currently, she was stretching her arms above her head, clearly bored and sleepy. The gesture forced the thin fabric to tighten, provocatively accentuating her full breasts. Mesmerized, Sonny almost missed the fact that there was a shoulder insignia on the woman's left sleeve. There were three stars on it. Three stars, huh, he thought, distracted. Three stars means an ascended, huh, yeah. Wait. An ascended? But before Sonny could fully digest the meaning of this word, he realized that the woman was staring at him, too. What are you looking at, she said, not a gram of humor in her voice. Sonny blinked a couple of times, embarrassed, and quickly came up with an excuse. Then he opened his mouth and answered. Your breasts. A second later, his eye widened in absolute horror, because he wasn't planning to say those words at all. His mouth moved on its own. A wave of terror suddenly drowned his mind. The woman slowly smiled with a dangerous gleam in her eyes. Then, without any warning, she moved her hand and slapped Sonny across the face. Sonny's whole body was turned around. If it wasn't for the restraints holding him in place, he would have probably flown off the bed. For a moment, he even saw stars but it could still be considered getting off lightly. An ascended, the woman was an ascended. She could have torn his head clean off with a flick of a finger. Why did he have to offend someone so powerful, of all people? Meanwhile, the woman cleared her throat and crossed her arms. Are you awake now? Sonny held his numb cheek and carefully nodded. Good. Let me give you a piece of advice. Don't just say anything that comes to your mind. Especially to girls. It's not like you haven't seen a girl before, right? Say thank you. I definitely will not. Sonny thought, but instead, his mouth moved on its own, and he said. I've seen plenty, but no one as beautiful as you. Then he flinched back, his face as red as a lobster. The woman stared at him for a few seconds and then burst into laughter. I see you haven't met a lot of awakened then. By awakened standards, I'm below average. Sonny glanced at her with doubt. The woman shook her head. As your soul core develops, the body gets rid of all its imperfections. So it's hard to find an unattractive awakened, especially among the stronger ones. Live long enough, and you might just become a flower boy yourself. Then she gave him a thorough look and added. Well, maybe. In any case, since you're awake welcome back to the land of the living. Congratulations on surviving your first nightmare, Sleeper Sunless. Sleeper Sunless. That was how people would address him now, at least in the short span of days until the winter solstice after that, he would either return from the dream realm as an awakened or not return at all. It felt strange to have a title put before his name. In the past, Sonny was rarely even addressed by name. People mostly called him things like boy, punk, brat, or hey, you. But now he even had a title. Sleeper sunless. Actually, the correct term was dreamer. But humans had their own set of words for those infected by the nightmare spell. Carriers who had just finished their first nightmare were called sleepers because of how they interacted with the spell. 
Basically, once his spirit enters the spell, his body was going to fall into slumber. That slumber would continue for days, weeks, or even months, however long it takes him to escape the dream realm. Hence the term sleeper. Once he escapes and becomes an awakened, he would live his life normally during the day and return to the dream realm every time he falls asleep. The awakened were called the same by the spell and the humans. That word was also sometimes used as a general term for all carriers. Then, if he were to decide to enter a second nightmare and manage to survive, he would become an ascended, people called them masters. Masters could enter and exit the dream realm as they wished. Some even chose to never come back there at all. More than that, they traveled between the worlds physically, not just in spirit. And then, above the masters, there were saints, those who had conquered the third nightmare and earned the right to call themselves transcendent. They were as powerful as demigods, and even more rare. Not only could they travel between the real world and the dream realm, but they could also take others with them. But coming back to masters, the beautiful woman stood up and approached the reinforced medical bed. With practiced moves, she began to undo the restraint holding Sunny in place. I am ascended Jet. You can call me Master Jet. These past three days, I was on watch duty due to your nightmare. Right, before I fell asleep, the policeman told me that an awakened would arrive in a few hours to monitor my condition. To kill the nightmare creature if, if I die and let it through. Sonny was unwilling to open his mouth, terrified that all sorts of truths would come spilling out. But there were things he simply had to know. Master Jet? I have a question. Go on. Why would a master be put on watch duty? Isn't it, below your pay grade? Jet gave him a dark look. You're smarter than you seem. Recently, there was a lot of gates opening in this sector. Most of the local awakened are either wounded or occupied with the cleanup. Or dead. It's always like that close to the winter solstice. She opened the final restraint and took a step back. Plus, there's not a lot of awakened who, like me, directly work for the government. It's by far the least lucrative or glorious carrier one of us can choose. Would you abandon wealth and fame to work abysmal hours and risk your life, fueled only by altruism and sense of duty? Sonny wanted to say something flattering. Instead, he looked Master Jet right in the eyes and smirked. Of course not. I'm not an idiot. Damn this damn flaw. Damn. She stared at him with a humorless expression. Sonny thought that he was going to get slapped again, but instead, Jet smiled. See, I was right. You really are smart. Chapter 18 Absence of Light Sonny was enjoying a hot shower. After their short conversation, Master Jet had sent him to clean himself, saying that he reeked of nightmare. The unnatural slumber of the spell would slow down the body's metabolism, and the medical apparatus he had been strapped into was supposed to take care of the rest, but he was still asleep for three whole days. Even if only psychological, the scent of bloodshed and despair lingered around him. Ah, I'm in heaven, Sonny thought, willing himself to temporarily forget about the looming disaster of the flaw. He was alone in the police station's showers, relaxing under the streams of hot water. After a bit of time had passed, Sonny reluctantly turned the tap off and walked over to the towel rack. Coincidentally, he saw himself reflecting in the mirror. The changes in his physique were subtle, but noticeable. His pale skin seemed a little healthier, his muscles a bit more pronounced. He looked slender and lean instead of emaciated and frail, as he did before. There was a slight luster to his dark hair and a shine to his eyes. However, he was still rather diminutive. Not exactly a picture of masculine handsomeness, to say the least. Flower boy, huh? Sonny thought, full of bitterness. Then he suddenly froze, noticing something strange. As he was looking at himself in the mirror, the reflection of his shadow seemed to move. It was as though the shadow lowered its head and quietly facepalmed. Sonny quickly turned around, piercing his shadow with a nervous look. However, everything seemed normal. The shadow was doing exactly what it was supposed to do, repeating his every motion. I clearly saw you move, he said, feeling a bit strange. You have just moved on your own, right? Sonny glared at the shadow which obediently glared back. Did you move or not? The shadow enthusiastically shook its head. What the? What do you mean, no? You've just moved your head. 
Do you think I'm a fool? The shadow seemed to think for a bit and then shrugged. Sonny was left with his mouth agape. Your shadow is more independent than most. It is an invaluable helper, he muttered finally. Right. This was how the spell had described his aspect ability. But what exactly could his shadow do? He decided to experiment a little. Hey, you. Tell me what you can do. The shadow was silent and motionless. Right. It doesn't have vocal cords. As though that made any sense. Shadows were not supposed to have muscles either, and yet it knew how to move. Uh, show me? No reaction. It seems the shadow was content pretending to be an ordinary, lifeless blob of darkness. Sunny sighed. I'm doing this wrong. Independent or not, the shadow was still a part of him. It was a manifestation of his aspect ability. So instead of asking the shadow, he really should have been asking himself. Not going to talk, are you? Sonny closed his eyes and directed his perception within, exploring himself for the first time since returning to the real world. He felt the beating of his heart, the steady rising of his chest, the slight chill of the shower room. He heard droplets of water falling on the tiled floor. Felt the movement of filtered air against his skin. And there, on the verge of his consciousness, something new. A completely new sense. Sonny concentrated on it, and suddenly a whole other world opened to him. It was hard to describe with words, just like one would have trouble explaining how hearing or touch feels. It was as though he could communicate with vast forms that crowded around him and receive an understanding of both their own shape and the surrounding space, guided by the different degrees of pressure they exerted on his mind and each other. That understanding came naturally and instantaneously, like an instinct. These forms were shadows. And among them, one not the largest one, but the deepest, didn't feel like an external entity. It was like a part of his soul. Once Sonny grasped the feeling of it, he could sense the shadow just like he sensed his limbs. The only thing was that his limbs were made out of flesh, and the shadow was made from the absence of light. Sonny opened his eyes and looked at the shadow. Then, with a thought, he willed it to raise an arm. The shadow raised an arm. He willed it to sit, stand, turn around, kick. Then he willed it to change shape, turning into a circle, then a line, then a monster. And finally, back to his own silhouette. The shadow was mercurial and fluid, like water. The only constant was its size. Ha! How about that? The shadow pouted, then reluctantly raised its thumbs. But how are you useful? He willed the shadow to strike the towel rack. It obediently moved and delivered a powerful kick. Of course, since it was just a shadow, its leg passed over the towels harmlessly, not even causing them to sway a little. Is that all you can do? In his mind, the image of shadow tentacles tearing the mighty tyrant into little pieces cracked and shattered mercilessly. It seemed he would not be competing with Shadow God anytime soon. How regretful. The shadow looked at him with disdain. Then it shrugged and stopped moving altogether, clearly offended. Sunny sighed and took a towel off the rack. All right. I will explore it later. A few minutes after that, he was wearing a clean police issued tracksuit and heading for the cafeteria. Master Jet was waiting for him at one of the tables, with two trays full of steaming synthetic food in front of her. Help yourself. Sonny glanced at the cheap gruel, which was not so different from the stuff he used to consume in the outskirts, and sighed. Somehow, he had expected his first meal after becoming a sleeper to be more lavish. Still, it was food. He sat down and began to wolf down the gruel ravenously. He was very, very hungry. In the process, his thoughts began to wander. Sonny stole a glance at Jet and wondered. The spell told him to find a master, and the next thing he knew there was a woman calling herself master right in front of him. He tried to imagine being an obedient slave to someone like her. Weird thoughts started to appear in his mind. You know what, Sonny, he thought with dark irony. Knowing your luck, this would be a perfect moment for her to ask. What are you thinking about? Sonny choked on the gruel. He felt his mouth beginning to open and put all of his will into staying silent. A second passed without him saying anything. Then a weird pressure appeared in his mind, which soon turned into blinding pain. He endured it for a couple more seconds before giving up. I was thinking that it would be a perfect moment for you to ask me about what I am thinking, he finally said. Jet gave him a weird look. All right. 
Are you almost finished with your food? Sunny nodded. Then I'll begin. As per protocol, I am obligated to inform you of a few things. It is mostly a formality. First of all, concerning your nightmare. She glanced at him and sighed. You are entitled to receive free psychological counseling. No matter what traumatic experience you have encountered, there is no shame in asking for help. Your mind is as important as your body, it's only right to keep it healthy. Are you interested? Sonny shook his head. Jet shrugged and continued. As you wish. You can also talk to me. Was it very hard? How could he answer? It was simultaneously much worse than I expected and exactly as bad as I expected. She nodded, satisfied with that explanation. That's a good attitude. I won't pry any further. Us outskirt rats are way more resilient than people think. Sunny looked at her in surprise. Master Jet, you grew up in the outskirts? She grinned. What? You can't tell because of my exquisite manners and polished exterior? He blinked a couple of times, surprised. I couldn't tell at all. After thinking for a while, he added. Are there a lot of people like us among the awakened? Jet's smile disappeared. No. There's not. In fact, they can be counted on one hand. As expected. Odds were really stacked against people like them. That made the three stars on Jet's insignia even more exceptional. One day, I'll be a master too. If she can do it, why can't I? So, what happens now? What else are you obligated to tell me? Sonny had no idea what he was supposed to do after leaving the police station. The winter solstice was just several weeks away. Jet leaned back and answered. That's basically it. There are some additional hoops to jump through, mostly having to do with your family, but, well. I've read your file, so I know it doesn't apply. The only thing left is to decide how you will be preparing for your first journey into the dream realm. She looked at her communicator and grimaced. I must stay, your luck is exceptionally bad. There's not a lot of time at all. First of all, you are free to do what you want. No one is forcing you to make a certain decision. That is to say, you can choose to prepare on your own, or not prepare at all. Party until the lights go out. Sonny was not very well versed in partying, however, I would advise against that. As a sleeper, you are also entitled to enroll in the Awakened Academy. You'll be provided with food, lodging and a wide choice of preparatory classes. This late into the year, you won't be able to learn a lot. But it's better than nothing. She was silent for a few seconds, then added. More importantly, you will get acquainted with most of the people who will enter the dream realm with you. Some of them might become your companions for life. And some may end up trying to end that life once we're inside the spell, Sonny added, reading between the lines of what Master Jet had said. So, what do you say? Do you want me to take you to the academy? Sonny thought about it. Strangely, his flaw was silent, not forcing him to answer one way or the other. Is it because I haven't made up my mind yet? Finally, he looked down at his empty tray and made a decision. Free lodging and food, you say? Yeah. I want to go to the academy. Chapter 19 Crossing the Bridge Sonny was standing in front of the massive, seemingly indestructible red gates of the awakened academy. The academy was, in fact, a city within the city. It was built like a fortress, with a high wall made of hard alloy, deep moat and numerous large caliber turrets which were placed in certain positions to create a deadly air suppression dome. No nightmare creature, not even colossal titans, were supposed to be able to break through its defenses. It was a legendary place. Actually, many of the most popular webtoons, youth dramas and novels took place right behind that wall. Adventures, rivalries and romantic entanglements of the young awakened heroes were the mainstream theme of modern entertainment. Never in his wildest dreams did Sonny imagine actually becoming one of these heroes. Of course, how things really were differed a lot from how it was portrayed in the media. More than that, he had only four weeks to spend here before venturing into the dream realm. Even if he wanted to, there was not enough time for any type of entanglement. And he definitely did not want to. 
He had to learn how to survive, not waste time on such nonsense. The snow was slowly falling to the ground. It was cold and silent in front of the academy gates. Except for Sonny, there was only one other person, another new sleeper, if he had to guess. It was a tall, slender girl of around his age, with clear gray eyes and a detached look on her face. She had strange, silver-white hair that was cut short and neatly parted to the side. Just like him, she was dressed in a police-issued tracksuit and had no personal belongings with her. On her head, there was a pair of old-fashioned headphones. She was calmly listening to music while they waited. There was a certain vibe to the silver-haired girl. It was sort of as though she was apart from the world. She looked confident and self-sufficient, but also a bit lonely. Sonny wasn't going to start a conversation. Who knew what kind of situation he would put himself in due to that damn flaw? It was better to keep to himself. He glanced at the girl and sighed. I wonder what flaw does she have? Finally, the gates began to open. The giant, ridiculously thick sheet of reinforced metal slowly descended, creating a long bridge. Sonny looked ahead with grim determination. Master Jet's parting words echoed in his mind. On their drive to the academy, Sonny didn't speak much, looking at the sights of the city that were flying past the window of Jet's personal transport vehicle. Actually, it was his first time sitting in a PTV, most people in the city couldn't even dream about getting a license and purchasing a vehicle like that, having to do with public transportation. He had ridden in the back of a police cruiser once or twice, but that was a completely different experience. At some point, Master Jet looked at him and said, Since we both come from the outskirts, I'll give you three pieces of advice. Whether you listen to me or not is your business. Sonny turned his head, waiting. First, once you're registered in the academy, they'll offer you psychological counseling again. There will also be a valuable reward for sharing your experiences in the nightmare and the details of your appraisal. You'll be able to receive a soul shard, maybe even several of them. He frowned. Are you trying to convince me to visit a psychiatrist again? Jet shook her head. No. I'm telling you to refuse. Surprised, Sonny raised his eyebrows. Why? There was a pause before she answered. You're too green to understand, but out there in the dream realm, nightmare creatures are not the only danger. Once you grow powerful enough, humans will become an equal threat. The less they know about your aspect, the better. So that's how it is. The easiest way to defeat a powerful awakened is to use their flaw. That's why young fools in the academy are encouraged in various ways to share the details of their aspects. I'm not saying that the government will leak your information, but once two people know a secret, it's no longer a secret. And there's a lot of people working for the government. That made a lot of sense. Thank you, Master Jet. She gave him a nod. Second, there will be a lot of courses to choose from. All types of combat training, deep dives into nightmare creature categories and vulnerabilities, basics of various types of sorcery, artifact study, and so on. Sonny gulped. Actually, he was already agonizing about what weapon to train with. Four weeks was not enough to master a weapon, but at least he would have a basic understanding of it. Disregard all of that. The only course you have time to attend is wilderness survival. He blinked. What? Jet glanced at him. It's different for city kids, who learn all sorts of useful things in school and from their tutors. But we don't have that advantage, do we? What was the biggest threat to your life during the nightmare? Sonny thought about it. On the surface, the most dangerous thing he faced was the tyrant, followed by Hero. Aro of the Nine. But actually, what almost killed him in the end was the cold. Jet smiled. Smart. You only know how to survive in the city. But the dream realm is mostly made of wilderness. Do you know how to make a fire? How to procure food. How to find safe shelter. No. Fighting monsters is important, but it'll be useless if you die of hunger or exposure to the elements. Trust me. I've learned it the hard way. Sonny nodded, angry at himself. It was so obvious, yet he never even thought about these seemingly simple things. He was blinded by his past habits and experience. Human brains were like that. Once accustomed to a certain way of living, it was hard to see past the already familiar routines. 
It was lazy thinking at its worst. At that point, Master Jet had stopped the car and opened the door, getting out. Sunny followed her and was momentarily stunned, staring at the colossal metal gates in front of them. This was, the famous Awakened Academy. After a few seconds, he shook off his amazement and turned to his senior. This is as far as I go, she said, looking cheerlessly at the walls of the academy. I've already notified them. Someone will come fetch you in a while. There was something dark in the depths of her icy blue eyes. Sonny suddenly felt a cold feeling spreading through his body. What's the third advice? Master Jet glanced at him, then sighed. Remember, no one can survive in the dream realm alone. That's not an opinion, that's a fact. Try to get along with your peers, even if they don't treat you well. It might save your life. Then she suddenly smiled and patted him on the shoulder. You've done well to survive until now. Alive in the future, too. Then she got back into her PTV and drove off. Just like that, she was gone. The end of the metal bridge hit the special grooves in the ground and stopped moving after a set of loud clicks. Sonny looked ahead, wondering what kind of life he was going to be living in the next four weeks. Keep your flaw and aspect secret, learn to survive in the wilderness, be nice to other sleepers. It didn't sound too hard, but, for some reason, he was sure that these weeks were going to be as challenging as his first nightmare. Or maybe even worse. Seemingly free of such concerns, the silver-haired girl walked forward and stepped on the bridge. Sunny sighed and reluctantly followed Chapter 20 Outcast once again. The sleeper part of the compound was relatively small and situated in the southern part of the academy, surrounded on all sides by training fields and parks. It was a low, modern building constructed with reinforced materials. Like the majority of buildings in the academy, most of it was hidden below the ground, leaving only a couple of floors above it. With its white, pristine alloy walls and wide windows, it must have looked beautiful in the summer, contrasted against all the greenery around. Inside, the building was spacious and well-lit. Sunny and the silver-haired girl were taken to a large hall where a hundred or so of young men and women, sleepers of the same unfortunate timing as the two of them, were already waiting for the beginning of the induction ceremony. Most of them were nervous, tense, and excited. Logistics of the academy were a constant headache for the administrators since the rate at which the spell infected people was always chaotic. There was no way to orderly structure for batches of sleepers to undergo any type of standardized education on a shared schedule, some of them had a full year to prepare for the dream realm, some only months, some even mere days. That's why these induction ceremonies were held each month at the beginning of the year and then every week once the winter solstice began to loom near. Some of the sleepers in the hall had to wait days to be inducted, while Sunny had lucked out and was delivered to the academy just hours before the scheduled event. Once inside the hall, he understood two things. Firstly, everyone was well-dressed and in possession of a suitcase, a duffel bag, or at least a backpack carrying their personal belongings. They were obviously coming prepared, most likely from home, sent off by their families. So Sunny and the silver-haired girl, who came empty-handed and wearing simple police-issued clothes, were not a norm like he had assumed, but actually an eye-catching anomaly. Right. That makes sense. Secondly, Master Jet was not being overly humble when she called herself below average by awakened standards. Even though these young people were just starting their paths as awakened, their looks were dazzling. Everyone was handsome, beautiful, and radiated health. He swallowed. Still, I feel like none of them compare. She might not be as perfectly shaped, but... I don't know, she has a presence. It's like shadows become deeper and the temperature drops by a couple of degrees when she's in a room. Was this the difference between a sleeper and a master? But all of these thoughts were just him trying to postpone the inevitable. Sonny already knew that he was in for a wild ride, because he could not lie, and all of these excited youths, regardless of their clothes, gender and looks, wanted to do one thing, talk. Every one of them wanted to talk with fellow sleepers. They wanted to discuss their nightmares, their future journey into the dream realm, and everything in between. They wanted to ask questions. They wanted to be asked questions. They wanted to discuss something important or just chit-chat about stupid things. Everyone wanted to share. It's a nightmare. Sunny moaned, disturbed and fearful. I'm doomed. Then, with a bit of grim determination, he gritted his teeth and slowly exhaled. Just think about it as a continuation of your trial. 
You survived the Black Mountain, so you can survive this, too. He had faced heroes, villains, monsters, and even gods. Was he going to be afraid of a bunch of teenagers? He might have underestimated how scary teenagers can be. In half an hour, pretty much everyone in the room hated his guts. After a short series of conversations, Sonny had acquired a reputation of an obnoxious, foul-mouthed pervert. This reputation was quickly solidified. He was slapped a few times and even punched once. He also discovered a couple of new things about his true self, namely, that deep down inside he was apparently rude, arrogant, and more than a little bit lustful. The conversations went something like this. Look at all these young people. How many do you think will return from the dream realm? How many will perish? What do you think our own chances of survival are? I don't know, but I'm pretty sure that a pompous fool like you will die first. Or. I even received an armor-type memory in my nightmare. It's an enchanted robe. Would you like to see? Actually, I would prefer to see you without a robe. Or. Then those lowlights began to rob the bodies. It was disgusting. They even took their shoes. What kind of degenerate would take a dead man's shoes? I once killed a man and took his boots. They were nice boots. What? You killed someone just for a pair of boots? Of course not. There were other reasons. I also took his cloak. Once again an outcast, Sonny was eventually left alone. People seemed to be avoiding him. Unperturbed, he found a quiet corner and stood there, glad that no one wanted to talk to him anymore. His face hurt, and there was blood dripping from his nose. Being ostracized from a group was nothing new, but it still stung. However, he was smiling. Because in the process of turning the whole batch of sleepers against himself, Sonny had discovered something vital. He learned how to control his flaw. Once asked a question, he could not keep quiet. He also couldn't lie. However, after a lot of experimentation, Sonny had found out that with a bit of practice, he could influence the exact way the truth eventually came out. It was like this, after receiving a question, his mind automatically produced a truthful answer. After that, the flaw would force him to say that answer aloud. Refusal to speak would result in the buildup of pressure, then piercing pain. The longer he kept quiet, the worse the pain would become. Eventually, he would have to surrender and reveal the truth. However, in these moments, between receiving the question and surrendering to the pain, the actual wording of the answer could be changed. The more it strayed from the initial thought, the more resistance he would meet once again in the form of pressure, then pain. It still had to be truthful, but it didn't have to be so stark. For example, if Master Jet were to catch him staring again and ask what he was looking at, instead of embarrassing himself Sonny would have been able to endure a bit of pain and simply say you. That would still be the truth, however, the result would be entirely different. Hidden in the corner, Sonny grinned as he observed the sleepers. This is good. This is great. This is something I can work with. After all, one didn't have to lie to deceive a person. Sometimes, truth was the best material for creating deceit. If used with a certain devious type of intelligence, truth could be as misleading as lies. For example, in one of his previous conversations, Sonny had confessed that he had once stolen boots from a dead man. The other guy was horrified and asked if he had really killed someone just for a pair of boots. The answer the flaw forced him to give was that there were other reasons and that he had also taken the man's cloak. The true reason for killing the veteran slaver was that he had whipped Sonny a few hours prior. Besides, he was already dying. The cloak had nothing to do with the killing itself. However, the wording of the answer created an impression that it did. Thus, two truthful statements, when put together, created an effect akin to a lie. This was just a simple example. With a lot of effort and intense thinking, Sonny could create other types of manipulative truths. It was going to be extremely difficult and risky, but it could be done. He just needed a bit of luck. It was time to put his theory to practice. Sonny didn't forget what his main goal was to make sure that no one ever finds out his true name. To achieve that, he had to create an impression that he was the most pathetic, weak person in this whole building. Someone who would never receive a positive appraisal, let alone a divine aspect and a true name. However, since this would be a lie, he couldn't just go and say it. 
So how was he to convince everyone that he definitely did not have a powerful aspect and an impressive record with the spell? His eyes fell on a particular group of sleepers. There were five or six of them, gathered around a tall, confident young man. The young man had brown hair and a gentle, handsome face. His eyes were green, with a hint of friendly humor. His posture, figure and attentive gaze betrayed someone who went through extensive training. Everything about the young man screamed of nobility and strength. Just at that moment, one of his companions was saying with a tone of amazement. Ascended? You have received an ascended aspect? What, what was your appraisal? The young man smiled humbly. Oh. It was excellent. Sonny stopped in front of the group, as though by accident. After hearing the young man's answer, he frowned and looked at him with disdain. Then, with a voice full of utter bewilderment, Sonny said. Ascended, excellent? That's it? What's the big deal? Chapter 21 First Performance His words hung in silence. The sleepers looked at Sonny with a hilarious assortment of emotions, ranging from bewilderment to shock. The young man with humorous eyes just smiled politely. To be honest, getting an ascended aspect during the first nightmare was extremely rare. He was certainly someone special, maybe even outstanding. Actually, despite their apparent differences, the young man somehow reminded Sonny of Hero. Aro of the Nine. There was a special type of calculating coldness hidden deep inside their eyes. He had encountered such people before, mostly among the veterans of various street gangs in the outskirts. They simply called this type of coldness murder math. Basically, it was a habit experienced fighters developed no matter where they were and what mood they were in, there was always a sober part of their minds constantly calculating the most efficient way of killing the person in front of them, just in case such need arises. Ugh. Why do I have to antagonize someone like that, of all people? But Sonny really had no grounds to complain. After all, he brought this on himself. After a few seconds, one of the young man's companions finally blinked and said. Ah, uh, friend, you must not know a lot about the spell. Caster's results are truly remarkable. Then, with a furtive glance at the remarkable caster, he added. He is a legacy, after all. An actual, living and breathing descendant of an awakened clan? Sonny re-evaluated his opinion of the humorous young man. Legacies were known to be trained for their eventual entrance into the spell from the moment they could walk. For them, being infected was a certainty instead of a possibility. They were extremely formidable people. Just great, he thought bitterly and made his frown deepen. Are you trying to pull a prank on me? You call this remarkable? The bewilderment in the eyes of these sleepers was slowly being replaced by hostility. Listen, friend. If you don't think that an ascended aspect is remarkable, then please share with us your own amazing results. What, pray tell, was your appraisal? Castor himself was still keeping quiet and smiling. However, his defenders were growing restless. This was exactly what Sonny wanted to happen. He smiled with utter contempt. I would let you know, my appraisal was, uh, it was glorious. Yes, glorious. And the aspect I acquired was of the divine rank. After that, he received a number of strange looks. No one had ever received a divine aspect before, so, of course, they were starting to think that he was a lunatic. But there was still a sliver of doubt, maybe that strange guy was a descendant of a powerful clan? A peerless prodigy? Maybe his appraisal was, indeed, glorious. Sonny had to dispel that tiny bit of doubt. Mind you, I'm not some lofty legacy. Put. I'm from the outskirts. I've never even received combat training. All that training and he only got an excellent? What did he do during the nightmare, pick his nose the whole time? The expressions of all the sleepers that were listening to his bragging instantly changed. An outskirt rat with no training, yeah, sure. Who was he trying to fool? Finally, with the same polite smile, Castor spoke. Glorious? That is interesting. Would you mind telling us what were your achievements in the nightmare? Sonny grinned. Sure, no problem. First of all, I killed an, uh, an awakened tyrant. Every uh cost him a couple of moments of intense pain, but he didn't let it show on his face. His expression was nothing but smug and confrontational. 
The mere mention of a tyrant, let alone an awakened one, made a couple of sleepers smile with ridicule. Oh, really? How did you kill it? An arrogant look appeared on Sonny's face. How? Let me tell you, I didn't even have to lift a finger. I just spat, and it was torn to pieces. Which was true. Sonny had spat a mouthful of blood on the altar, and as the result, Mountain King was ruthlessly dismembered by Shadow God. Someone openly laughed. This guy is either insane or purposefully messing with us. Listen here, shorty. Have some decency, okay? Who would believe such a lie? Sonny was genuinely angry. He wanted to retort, saying that he wasn't short. But he couldn't, because that would be a lie, damn it. So, instead, he just gritted his teeth and said with a voice full of outrage. I can't answer that, because it's not a lie. Are you really insisting that you had killed an awakened tyrant a tyrant? And with a bit of spit no less? Sonny knitted his brows. That's the truth. More laughter followed. Crazy bastard. He actually believes in his own crap. Insane, he's insane. Unexpectedly, Castor stopped his companions. Guys. After the laughter quieted down, he asked in a friendly manner. What else did you achieve? What? That wasn't enough? Sonny raised his chin. Let me think. Oh. I also killed an awakened swordsman. Really? How did you do that? Acting as though he was a little bit embarrassed, Sonny looked down. That, actually, that time I had to lift a finger. I even had to shake it a couple of times. That was enough to kill him, though. He was holding the silver bell between his fingers, which led to Hero being attacked and eventually killed by the tyrant. So, technically, all his statements were true. What a crackpot. Ha! Can you believe this idiot? Poor bastard. Not only is he weak, he's also lost it. Castard gave his companions a long look and then turned to Sonny. Anything else? Sonny blinked. Time for the finishing touch. Something else? Uh. Well. Oh, right. I communicated with a bunch of gods, even though they were all dead. I made one of them wake up. He gave me a blessing. I was blessed by a god, do you all understand? The sleepers were silently shaking their heads or looking at him with pity. Castor sighed, I see. Well, in comparison to your achievements, mine do look rather average. Thank you for sharing with us. I hope you'll be as successful once we enter the dream realm. Sonny smiled with a look of smug superiority on his face. You better believe it. With that, he turned around and walked away. Ah. That's a job well done. He was pretty sure that after this performance, no one would ever believe that he actually had some kind of a powerful aspect or did anything worthy of notice during the nightmare. He only told them the truth, and yet managed to make everyone believe in the opposite of the truth. Such an incredible feeling. What did they think of him now? They thought that he was weak, grew up without any education in the outskirts, and had no training. More than that, he was apparently either insane or incredibly stupid. His temper was terrible. Truly pathetic and pitiful fellow. Now, whenever he was asked about his aspect, he could just honestly say that it was of the divine rank and be laughed at. People would rather believe that the spell had ceased to exist than that he was someone noteworthy. He could even scream about his accomplishments from the roof, and no one would believe him. Subsequently, no one would ever suspect that he had a true name. Just you wait, fools. One day I'll be the one laughing. As Sonny was walking away, he heard one of the sleepers talking to Castor. Why didn't you put that lunatic in his place? He has belittled you. After a short pause, Castor answered. His voice sounded low and mellow. Poor kid must have lost his mind in the nightmare. It often happens. He'll most likely die soon, so being kind is the least I can do. The corner of Sonny's mouth twitched. What a nice guy. He knew that Castor's words were based on a false assumption, but, for some reason, still felt a cold chill running up his spine. Chapter 22 Corpse Corner Satisfied with his performance, Sonny walked back to the deserted corner of the hall. 
He felt people looking at him with mockery, contempt, and pity. No one seemed to be willing to stay close to him. It was just as well, he didn't want to be bothered anyway. Still, weren't their reactions a bit exaggerated? It's not like he was carrying an infectious disease. Well, except for the spell. But it wasn't really a disease, which everyone here should have known already. Finally, he extricated himself from the crowd and reached the corner. For some reason, sleepers were unwilling to approach it, currently, there was only one girl sitting quietly on the bench. Sunny gave her a look. The quiet girl was delicate, demure, and very pretty. Her clothes were tidy and neat. They weren't very expensive, but still rather tasteful. With her pale blonde hair, big blue eyes and exquisite face, she looked like a beautiful porcelain doll. She was subtly breathtaking. However, there was something wrong with her. Sunny frowned, trying to understand what exactly about the girl made him uncomfortable. After a while, he realized that her empty, expressionless stare was reminding him of Mountain King. Startled, Sunny understood that the girl was blind. It took him a couple of seconds to compose himself. What a shame. A bit disheartened, he carefully sat on the opposite end of the bench. The girl wouldn't have survived the first nightmare if she had been blind prior to entering the spell. Which meant that she lost her sight as the result of the appraisal. It was her flaw. Suddenly, Sonny felt very apprehensive. A cold sensation spread through his chest, and I thought my flaw was bad. No matter what aspect ability the blind girl had received in exchange for her sight, it was effectively a death sentence. A blind person had no chances of surviving in the dream realm, at least not with a dormant core. In some sense, the girl was already dead. She was effectively a walking corpse. Feeling extremely disturbed, Sonny turned away and studied the crowd of sleepers. Now he understood why people were trying to avoid this corner. The girl was surrounded by an invisible, but almost palpable aura of death. Sleepers usually weren't very superstitious, but anyone would feel uncomfortable in her company. Armed with this knowledge, Sonny suddenly saw a pattern in how the young people in the hall were grouped. Instinctively, they all tried to stand close to those of their own circumstance. At the far end of the hall, closest to the stage, were one or two small groups. People in these groups were distinct from the rest of sleepers. They were all confident, calm and had an air of readiness. These were the legacies, they were trained for the spell since birth and had the highest chances of survival. Castor especially stood out from the rest. Next to them was a larger number of expensively dressed young people. They were lively and excited, and only a little nervous. They were the scions of rich and high-ranking citizens. Their training was pretty good since such families had ample funds to hire private tutors, even awakened ones. Their chances of survival weren't bad. Then there was the largest part of the crowd, which consisted of kids from middle-class families. They might not have had the privilege of training under awakened tutors, but their education wasn't bad. The government spent a lot of effort to put all the necessary knowledge and skills into the school curriculum, preparing potential sleepers in advance. Some of them might have received additional training in private. To survive, these sleepers would need to put in a valiant effort and also have a bit of luck. But it wasn't improbable. Consequently, they were tense and nervous. And lastly, there was Sunny and the blind girl. The corpses. From the point of view of other sleepers in the hall, their chances of survival were close to zero. How charming. This was how the young sleepers had subconsciously divided themselves. The only exception from this rule was the silver-haired girl, who stood alone and apart from everyone, seemingly indifferent to tension and nervousness that permeated the air. She was leaning against a wall with her eyes closed, still listening to music. But regardless of their group and level of training, everyone was already tired of waiting. When will the damn induction ceremony start? Sonny thought, irritated. As though answering his thoughts, a tall man in a dark blue uniform appeared on the stage. Not only was he tall, he was actually almost a giant. Sonny even wondered if the man's mother had sinned with a bear. Of course, it was impossible bears had gone extinct long before the spell even appeared. But he once saw pictures in a book, and they looked sort of similar. A bear-like nightmare creature, then. The giant man had wide shoulders, an athletic build, and a gorgeous brown beard. His eyes were calm and serious. After reaching the center of the stage, he gave sleepers a long look. When his gaze reached the deserted corner, 
Sonny suddenly felt nervous. Uh. I sure hope he doesn't have a telepathic ability. Otherwise, he might separate me from a limb or two on behalf of his mother. The man didn't pay Sonny a lot of attention and returned his gaze to the front rows of the crowd. Finally, he said in a deep, reverberating voice. I am awake and rock. Sleepers, welcome to the academy. Everyone listened without making a sound. In less than a month, you will be summoned to the dream realm. Some of you might think that you are well prepared. You're wrong. The spell is merciless and cunning. The moment awaken begin to think too much of themselves, they die. I've seen countless sleepers like you lose their lives. I've also seen experienced masters lose theirs. Even saints are not assured to survive. Thanks for the encouragement, Sonny thought sarcastically. In the following four weeks, we will do everything in our power to increase your chances of survival. You will receive training from the best instructors in the world. However, don't be misled by their fame, in the end, whether you return from the dream realm alive depends only on one person, you. The responsibility to survive is yours, and yours alone. Except for the legacies, sleepers were looking at each other with growing fear in their eyes. Awakened Rock continued. You are not children anymore. It's a shame, because you ought to be. But the spell has decided otherwise. You have been to the first nightmare, so you already know what it's like. Your parents, your teachers and your friends can't help you anymore. Haven't had any of those in a long time. While listening to Rock's speech, Sonny couldn't help but feel a little excluded. It was all old news to him. However, he understood the instructor's purpose, he had to make young sleepers afraid, because fear was the only thing that would keep them alive. Finally, the speech got to the important part. Awakened Rock paused, giving kids listening to him a few moments to digest his words. Then, with a short nod, he continued. Now we will talk about the difference between nightmares and the dream realm, chapter 23 Dreams and Nightmares. That was something Sonny was keenly interested in. Of course, he had a general knowledge of how things were set inside the spell. But the first nightmare had already shown him that reality was different from how it was portrayed in popular culture in a number of small, but infinitely important ways. He needed to separate truth from the myths. And, of course, it was very advantageous to hear it from the mouth of someone who had actually been to the dream realm. So Sonny was all ears. Awakened Rock began to speak. Most people are aware of what nightmares are because they have an impact on the real world and their lives. All of you have been warned before entering the first nightmare that, should you perish there, a nightmare creature would be allowed to cross the threshold and enter reality. Yup, that was the reason why Master Jet had to wait patiently by his side, prepared to deal with the monster if it appears. First nightmares are unique, because each of them is individual. That's why only a single creature can appear. However, starting from the second nightmare, things become much more dangerous. These nightmares are not tied to an infected person. Instead, they are born in the dream realm. While the seed of the nightmare is growing, any number of awakened can attempt to conquer it. Hunting down nightmares was the main responsibility of the awakened. Sonny knew that much. Should they all die or fail to find the seed before it matures, a gate will open in the real world, letting through countless monsters. You all know the consequences. Other awakened will be forced to withstand the onslaught on this side, but then there can be massive destruction or losses among the civilian population. Opening gates were something that every person on the planet feared. It was also the second disaster brought upon by the spell after the initial appearance of the nightmare creatures. The main difference was that, in that initial wave, there were only dormant beasts. However, gates had ranks of their own, and any type of creature could potentially step through. Not long before Sunny was born, a rank 5 gate opening left a whole continent uninhabitable. Luckily, high rank gates were very rare. Awakened Rock's voice grew solemn. So it is not wrong to say that the purpose of the awakened is to enter the dream realm, seek out maturing nightmares and close them before any harm could befall the real world. From this, you can see that the dream realm and the nightmares are connected, but are not one and the same. If nightmares are the destination, then the dream realm is the road. But it is also so much more. Very romantic. Does Awaken Rock have poetic inclinations? 
Simply put, the dream realm is a world. It is vast, mysterious, and mostly unexplored. It is also dead. There is no life out there except for the nightmare creatures, corrupted ecosystems, and now us. But it wasn't always dead. We can tell that once, a long time ago, the dream realm was home to several primitive civilizations. There are a lot of ruins buried in its soil. From what Sunny knew, those lost civilizations were not really primitive, it's just that their development was centered around soul cores and mysticism as opposed to technology. So, basically, miracles and magic. What were their names? How did they fall? No one knew. Maybe they were destroyed by the spell. We don't know if the dream realm exists inside the spell as one of its illusions, just on an unimaginably larger scale, or if it's real, with the spell only serving as a pathway between two realities. However, we do suspect that the illusions conjured up inside the nightmares are based on its history. They are replicas of past events, somehow reconstructed from the depths of time. So, there might have been a real slave caravan on that black mountain once, a long time ago. Sonny remembered how time seemed to move in reverse at the beginning of his nightmare. He thought about how things would have ended up without his involvement. Did the nameless temple slave perish in Mountain King's Maw with the rest of the caravan? Somehow, he felt that the nameless slave was not that simple. Otherwise, why would the spell remember him? And what about Hero? Was he able to escape? I wonder. There are four main differences between the dream realm and the nightmares. Firstly, it doesn't have a story. There is no predetermined conflict you are forced to resolve. You can move freely and explore, provided that you have the strength to stay alive in the wilderness. Most people tend to stay close to one of the human citadels. That's good to know, Sunny thought, unconvinced. Sure, there were no predetermined conflicts in the dream realm. But with his, fated, attribute, he was pretty certain to end up in some kind of trouble. So that Freedom Awaken Rock had mentioned was relative in his case. Meanwhile, the instructor continued. Secondly, as I have already mentioned, there are no people in the dream realm except for those who came from the real world. There are only monsters. Some of them can mimic human appearance, though, so be mindful of that. Sonny felt cold sweat running down his back. Nightmare creatures mimicking humans? So creepy. Since when was that a thing? Why hasn't he ever heard about it? He stole a glance at the legacy standing in the first row and noticed that they did not show any sign of surprise. So, they knew. Thirdly, unlike the first nightmare, no nightmare creatures will appear in the real world if you die in the dream realm. It may sound cruel, but that's a good thing. Awakened forces are already spread thin. If we had to monitor every sleeper, we wouldn't have resources to handle more important matters. Considering that each sleeper could spend weeks, sometimes even months in the dream realm, there was ruthless logic in that statement. And lastly, and most importantly, unlike nightmares, which are bound by the rules of fairness, there is no limit to what kind of creature you can meet in the dream realm. During its trials, the spell won't pit a dormant human against an opponent many ranks above them. Oh really? Sonny sneered. However, he was forced to agree with Awakened Rock. Even though both Hero and Mountain King were way out of his league, they were still just one rank above him, but in the dream realm, no such restrictions exist. Theoretically, you can stumble upon an unholy titan and die before even realizing what happened. So be careful and stick to the regions with enemies on par with your own rank. It's not an ironclad guarantee, but at least there will be less of a chance of you biting off more than you can chew. Sticking to a region populated by nightmare creatures below his rank was even better. That was exactly what Sunny was planning to do. Awakened Rock paused for a few moments, studying the faces of sleepers in front of him. Then he added. When the solstice comes, you will be drawn into the dream realm. The exact location of where you will appear can't be predicted in advance, but there is a high chance that many of you will find yourselves in close proximity to each other. Band together and proceed to the nearest human citadel. Each citadel is built around a gateway. Once you reach it, you will be able to return. Gateways were special portals that served as exit points from the dream realm. Once sleepers reached such a portal, they would be able to escape back to reality and become awakened. 
Their core would evolve, and they would also receive a second aspect ability. After that, they would return to the dream realm each time they fall asleep. If you can't locate or are unable to reach the nearest human citadel, search for an unplaned gateway. It will usually be inside or near the most prominent landmark of the region. Work together to defeat its guardians and come back alive. He gave them a heavy look. That is all for today. Next, follow the instructions sent to your communicators to find your assigned dormitory. Once settled, you may proceed to the cafeteria for some late supper. There will be a round of interviews after that to prepare your suggested curriculums. Get a good night's rest. Your training starts tomorrow. With that, he gave them a short nod and left. Sunny sighed. Can't be predicted in advance, huh? With his luck, he would either drop right in the middle of a prosperous human citadel and immediately roll into a gateway, or appear in some region of the dream realm so remote and deadly that no one had ever heard about it or returned from it alive. Let's hope for the former. Since he couldn't do anything about it, Sonny wasn't very worried. There was something much more important on his mind, what, exactly, do they serve here for supper, chapter 24 moving up in the world? Everything having to do with sleepers was situated in the same building. Sonny followed the instructions sent to his communicator and quickly found the dormitories, which were situated on one of the lowest levels. To his surprise, he actually got a whole room to himself. It had a bed with a soft mattress, a table, a dresser, and even a separate bathroom. The materials were new and aesthetically pleasing, the air crisp and sterile. It was warm inside, and the outer wall was equipped with a hidden screen that seamlessly imitated a wide window opening to a picturesque vista of a snowy park. There were even several sets of clothes with the academy emblem provided to him for free. How extravagant, Sonny thought, a little stunned. Rationally, he understood that such an arrangement was not really luxurious. However, to him, who grew up wandering the outskirts, this room was like a palace. He scratched his head. Looks like... I've made it? Sonny glanced around, then winked at his shadow and smiled. I guess we're moving up in the world, huh? The shadow didn't respond, apparently not very impressed. Perhaps it didn't care about such things. Right, what would a stupid shadow know? Sonny changed into new clothes and studied himself in the mirror. Then, remembering something, he summoned the runes. He finally had time to study the puppeteer's shroud. Memory, puppeteer's shroud. Memory rank, awakened. Memory type, armor. Memory description, a worm of doubt once found its way into a righteous king's heart. With time, the king was devoured from inside and became its puppet. A lifetime later, the puppeteer worm escaped from the king's dead body, leaving behind a cocoon of black silk. No one knows where it went, however, once people dared to approach the silent castle, they found the silk among the mountains of gnawed bones and fashioned it into an armor. Sunny made a sour face. That is not that terrifying. Yeah. I'm not creeped out at all. Come to think of it, the first creature he killed was called a larva. If he were to assume that Mountain King was a mature puppeteer worm and already a tyrant, then what the hell would it transform into after becoming a moth? No, it's better not to think about it. With a sigh, he summoned the puppeteer's shroud. Thin black threads immediately appeared around his body and wrapped it into a set of armor. It was made of dark gray, soft fabric with several elements, such as bracers and shoulder guards, fashioned out of black, lusterless leather. The armor was light, understated and did not restrain his movements at all. It also made no sound when he moved. Perfect equipment for someone who likes to lurk in the shadows. Sunny smiled. He knew that this armor would be tough to pierce for any creature below the awakened rank, which gave him a great advantage in dealing with all dormant monsters. He also felt a sort of strange, faint calmness while wearing it. A worm of doubt, does it have enhanced protection against mental attacks? Somehow, he was sure of it. A great trophy. He wouldn't expect anything less from the memory of a powerful tyrant. The only problem was that the puppeteer's shroud was obviously not meant to be worn on top of a full set of clothes. Quite satisfied, Sonny dismissed it and left his room, heading for the cafeteria. Not bad, not bad, he thought, recalling all the rewards he had received during and after the first nightmare. The supper turned out to be as lavish as the dormitory. Sonny's wish to taste real meat finally came true, not only was it freely available to sleepers, there wasn't even a limit to the amount each of them could eat. 
More than that, there were rice, bread, various side dishes, sauces, fresh vegetables, fruits, and all kinds of delicious beverages. Extravagant. Sonny thought, steering clear of the coffee. After building a small mountain of food on his plate, he found an empty seat and, for a while, forgot about the world's existence. As juicy, textured, perfectly seasoned meat filled his mouth, Sonny's vision suddenly was full of stars. He had to hold back an exhilarated moan. And to think, he could have lived like that for a whole year. Damn spell, why didn't you infect me a few months ago? He concentrated on the food, decimating the whole plate in no time. Satiated and more than a little gorged, Sonny longingly looked back and thought about getting another serving. But it was already time for his appointment with the academy personnel. Full of regret, he stood up and left the cafeteria. Soon, he found himself in a small office, sitting across from an administrative worker. The worker was very friendly, and started the interview right away. Just like Master Jet had warned him, Sonny was offered psychological counseling again. Remembering her advice, he refused, and the interview smoothly switched to questions about his aspect. He didn't want to give up information about his abilities, but also knew that he had to tell the worker something. Luckily, the questions were worded in a way to put sleepers at ease. As such, most of them started with nice and polite preambles like would you like to tell me or if you're willing to share, which gave Sonny an opportunity to give neutral answers. Would you mind telling me about the type of aspect ability you received, as in combat, sorcery, utility? He did mind, but had to be careful. Uh, I'm not sure. I haven't had time to understand it well. That's all right. Are you able to directly deal damage with your ability? I guess not. Earlier, I wasn't even able to harm a towel. Things went on like that. In the end, Sonny shared just enough information to create an impression that his aspect was weak, harmless, and most likely having something to do with utility. After that, he returned to his room, undressed, and went to sleep. Sonny thought that falling asleep for the first time after the nightmare would be weird, but in fact, it was surprisingly easy. Lying on a soft mattress, with his skin against clean bedsheets and a fluffy pillow under his head, he slept like a baby. Early in the morning, Sonny washed up in his private bathroom and, bursting with energy, hurried to get breakfast in a happy mood. The cafeteria was a bit crowded. After filling his plate with all kinds of delicious stuff, he quickly realized that the only place he could sit was near the blind girl from yesterday. Her table was empty, since no one wanted to be close to her. Sonny grimaced. It seemed that the two of them were doomed to be outcasts together for the remaining four weeks. He also felt uncomfortable in the company of someone who was practically a dead person, but there wasn't much of a choice. Losing his good mood, he sat at the blind girl's table and gave a precursory nod to the social worker who was helping her get around. After that, he tried to pretend that they didn't exist and concentrated on his food. However, before he could finish, a sudden commotion drew his attention. What's going on? He looked up and noticed that a lot of sleepers were gathered around the large screen hanging on the wall of the cafeteria, their faces filled with excitement and awe. On the screen, a list of names was displayed, ranking the new batch of sleepers from weakest to strongest, most likely deduced from the results of the interviews. Not particularly interested, he quickly found his own name near the bottom of the list. The only sleeper who the academy judged to be less likely to succeed than him was the blind girl. Turns out, her name was Kasha. But the commotion was a bit too loud to be just the result of the ranking. Curious, he moved his gaze up. The sleepers were restless. How, how can this be? I'm not seeing things, right? What kind of a monster is she? Castor was placed in second place. And right above him, the portrait of the silver-haired girl could be clearly seen. To the right of it, two simple lines of text were displayed. Name, Nephi's. True name, Changing Star, Chapter 25 Wilderness Survival. So, the silver-haired girl, Nephi's, also received a true name in her first nightmare. To get his own, Sonny had to deal with Hero and Mountain King while possessing a completely useless aspect and impossible feat that seemed to have pleased the spell very much. I wonder how she had gotten hers. Sleepers in the cafeteria were struck dumb by the revelation of this achievement. They were staring at the screen with astonishment, fear and admiration. Listening to their excited whispers, Sonny felt a childish desire to scream me too. I have one too. But, of course, he kept quiet. Looking around, 
he noticed Caster's gaze fixed on the screen. There was a strange, somber expression on the humorous young man's face. But the weird thing about it was that, as far as Sonny could tell, Caster wasn't looking at the line of text containing the true name. Instead, he was staring at the line of text that read Nephi's, as though the girl's actual name held more meaning to him than the one given by the spell. Interesting. Do they know each other? Why would a lofty legacy know someone who came to the academy in a police-issued tracksuit? And speaking of Nephi's, where was she? Sonny glanced around the cafeteria and quickly noticed the silver-haired girl, who was sitting quietly in a corner with a cup of coffee in her hands. She wasn't paying a lot of attention to the commotion, seemingly immersed in her thoughts. Her gray eyes were serious and distant. A sleeper with a true name? That's impossible. It's technically possible. Smile of Heaven received her true name in the first nightmare, I think. But yeah, I'm doubtful. Maybe she lied in the interview? Are you stupid? If it was that easy to deceive the administrators, the crazy pervert from yesterday would have been in the first place instead. Sonny's face twitched. Crazy pervert, huh? Well, why don't we just ask her? Suddenly, there was a deafening silence in the cafeteria. Following the suggestion, sleepers stopped talking and turned around, staring at Nephi's. However, no one seemed to have the courage to approach her first. Finally sensing something, she raised her eyes and looked at them with surprise. MMM. What? Even the blind girl, Kasha, turned in the direction of her voice. After a couple of moments, Castor suddenly walked over and made a small bow. Lady Nephi's. I am Castor from the Hanley clan. I see that your trial went well. Lady? Why is he addressing her that way? And he had to introduce himself, so, they don't know each other? Interesting. Nephi seemed to be a little bit perplexed by the question. After thinking for a while, she smiled brightly and shrugged. It is what it is. Castor awkwardly returned the smile. I see. I am very glad that you returned unharmed. Ah, uh, not that I doubted your abilities. Nephi's nodded. Thank you. After that, she returned to her coffee, indicating that the conversation was over or simply oblivious to everyone's attention. Sonny sighed. How mysterious. There were a lot of thoughts on his mind. However, none of them could distract him from the most important thing, breakfast. A few seconds later, he had forgotten all about the awkward dynamic between Castor and Nephi's and was happily shoveling down his food. The wilderness survival classroom was spacious, tastefully decorated, and completely empty. Sonny even thought that he was mistaken, but then spotted a gloomy instructor sitting behind a wide wooden desk. Noticing him, the instructor perked up. Come in, young man. He was a lively old man with messy gray hair, absent-minded eyes and a pair of bushy eyebrows that seemed to jump around on their own. I'm awake in Julius. You can call me teacher Julius. Sit down, sit down. What's your name? Sonny obediently sat down. It's sunless. Julius raised his eyebrows. Ah. What an ominous name. But that is good, very good. After all, we have to deal with a lot of ominous things. Sonny carefully looked around. Uh. I'm sorry, teacher. Did I come too early? No, no, you're right on time. Are other students late? The instructor grunted with incredible contempt. No one else is coming. Those brutes are only interested in swinging their fists and swords around. Very few are smart like you and know the true value of knowledge. Oh. So it was that unpopular. Sonny inwardly sighed, hoping that he won't regret the decision to abandon combat training in favor of this course. Say, young man, why did you choose wilderness survival, of all things? There was no point in hiding the true reason. Not that Sonny would have been able to anyway. The Awakened that monitored me during the first nightmare, Master Jet, had advised me to study it above all things. A very wise advice. That master truly knows what's important, wait. Did you say Jet? His eyes widened. Soul Reaper Jet? That murderous savage? H.M. Who would have thought that a barbarian like her would know the value of intricate knowledge? Soul Reaper? Sonny's curiosity was picked. 
Teacher, do you know Master Jet? Julius carefully looked behind his back before answering. Who doesn't know the Soul Reaper? She might not be the most powerful awakened out there, but she is certainly one of the most feared. That's because her aspect abilities disregard flesh and target soul cores directly. Which means that no amount of armor, damage resistance and physical protection can stop them. He leaned forward. The only good thing is that she's young and not likely to become a saint anytime soon, or even ever. Yes, luckily, there's a very low probability that she'll ever advance. Sunny blinked. Why? Julius looked at him as though trying to comprehend how someone could be so ignorant. Because of her problematic personality, of course. Who would want to help a psychopathic killer become a saint? You need a team of outstanding companions and a lot of support to attempt conquering the third nightmare. Soul Reaper Jet isn't, wait. Suddenly, Julius frowned and leaned back. Why am I gossiping with you? You're too young to know such things. More than that, it's not in my character to badmouth others behind their backs. I would beg to differ, Sonny thought sarcastically, but didn't say anything out loud. He already got a lot of juicy information out of teacher Julius. Maybe choosing wilderness survival was the right choice after all. Let's get back to your curriculum. What other courses are you taking? Sunny sighed. None. For the next four weeks, I'll be fully concentrated on wilderness survival. Julius stared at him for a whole minute, an expression of utter astonishment written clearly on his face. Then, slowly, an excited gleam appeared in his eyes. Finally, he grinned. Wonderful. This is wonderful. You're such an astute young man. Don't you worry. In four whole weeks, I will make you immortal. Sonny's lessons with teacher Julius started pleasantly and without much tension, but just an hour later, he felt like his head was ready to explode. There was so much new information, and all of it was so strange and counterintuitive for someone who had never left the walled-off, sheltered confines of the city. From time to time, Julie escaped at Sonny's lack of knowledge and relevant experience. However, he had a good attitude and an endless enthusiasm for teaching. Whenever Sonny stumbled, he would patiently slow down and allow his student to catch up. The curriculum that Julius planned out was practically insane. There was an endless amount of theoretical knowledge to learn, practical lessons both in virtual reality and the real world, numerous subjects and weird things to study. There were even several lessons dedicated exclusively to learning the basics of several dead languages of the dream realm. Why would I need to learn new languages? Sonny thought with self-pity. The spell automatically translates everything. But Julius was uncompromising. The spell is not a translator. Do you think it has the time to express the intricacies of human speech? Let's say you're seeking shelter in a ruin and find an inscription that reads certain death ahead. There are 30 words for death in the rune language. Just by knowing the runes, you'll be able to deduce what kind of danger there is. On the first day, they studied until the sun was about to set. Only then did Julius decide to let Sonny go. Mentally exhausted and lamenting the fact that he had to miss lunch and dinner, Sonny decided to gently remind his teacher about the importance of food for maintaining high levels of concentration tomorrow. After returning to his room, he fell on a chair and stared blankly into the distance for a while. Then, as though remembering something, Sonny turned to his shadow. Right. He had a lot to accomplish before supper. He observed the shadow for a few seconds and then grinned. Let's see what you can really do, Chapter 26 Changing Star. Sonny was pretty sure that his shadow was capable of much more than just being a silent follower. After all, the spell had described it as being an invaluable helper. It was now up to him to find out how exactly shadow control could be of help. As in many other matters having to do with aspects, there was a certain level of instinctual understanding buried deep inside his subconscious. This understanding was either given to him by the spell or was something innate to every awakened. Sonny just had to sense the subconscious knowledge and learn how to put it into practice. Once again, he concentrated on sensing his body and spirit, then commanded the shadow to perform a series of simple motions. With each of them, he was growing more and more familiar with the feeling of controlling the shadow. Pretty soon, it was as natural to him as breathing and walking. The shadow felt like a part of his body. Satisfied with this initial result, Sonny carefully gave it a new command. 
Without pause, the shadow separated itself from the soles of his shoes, walked to the other end of the room and turned around, staring at him in slightly mocking silence. Sonny was left without a shadow. This is not scientific at all, he thought with an amused smile. Science never really applied to anything having to do with the spell, after all. As the shadow walked away, he felt a very weird split happening in his mind. It was like his perception had separated into two distinct sources. One was his body, the other, his shadow. With a bit of trying, he managed to focus on the second source. Instantly, his vision blurred. Whoa! Sonny blurted, surprised. Whoa, the shadow heard from the other end of the room. Sonny blinked. In his mind, there now existed two pictures. One was of his room's door, with an indifferent shadow standing in front of it. The other was of a pale young man sitting on a chair, wide-eyed and bewildered. That's me. He raised an arm and waved it in the air. Simultaneously, the pale young man raised and waved his. I can perceive the world through my shadow? He sat for a while, thinking. An ability like that opened up a lot of possibilities. With his, child of shadows, attribute allowing him to see and move stealthily in the darkness and, shadow control, allowing him to send out a sneaky shadow as a scout, he was pretty much a perfect spy. A spy was someone who gathered information without exposing themselves to a lot of risk. A role like that suited Sonny's taste very much. Of course, spies were also able to strike from the shadows with deadly precision. Armed with information, they were masterful ambushers. With the prior knowledge of the opponent's weaknesses, their attacks were surgical and lethal. But any direct confrontation would mean putting himself in danger, so Sonny wasn't very keen on becoming an assassin. After all, his aspect still lacked the means of directly enhancing his combat performance. Shall we test it? He looked at the shadow and gave it a command. With an exaggerated sigh, the shadow bent down and nimbly slid under the door. Instantly, he could see both the room and the hallway outside. Sonny closed his eyes to focus on the picture projected from the shadow. Moving stealthily from one shadow to another, it glided down the hallway. With a bit of timing and consideration, his scout was practically invisible. Sonny passed by a couple of sleepers and listened in on their conversation. Not finding it very interesting, he continued forward. Finally, the shadow stopped at a corner. To its left were the elevators, to its right the way to the girl's dormitory. All sorts of provocative images immediately entered Sonny's head. Oh my, he thought, blushing. Yes, with this ability, it was also very easy to fall into utter depravity. But no, no. He couldn't do it. Not because of some high moral principles. It's just that, with his reputation of a pervert, the chances of being asked if he had done something unbecoming were pretty high. So he needed the ability to honestly answer no. So. I probably shouldn't. Right? Right? Of course you're right. Don't even think about it. Back in his room, Sonny sighed with a lot of regret. Then he directed his scout to hide in the shadow of a passing sleeper and followed him to the elevators. Sometime later, Sonny's shadow was hiding in a corner of a large dojo. He was observing his fellow sleepers who, under the guidance of Instructor Rock, were going through the motions of the introductory combat class. Today was mainly dedicated to testing their general competency and abilities. After that, the sleepers were going to be separated into groups based on their level, such as novice, advanced or expert, as well as their weapon of choice. Some would be assigned a personal tutor or paired together. Currently, sleepers were taking turns delivering their strongest punches to a white plate attached to a special measuring machine. After each strike, the machine would display a number corresponding to the sleeper's physical strength. In theory, a machine like that was not hard to build. However, considering that many of sleepers had combat-oriented aspects that enhanced their might in a variety of ways, it was actually a marvel of engineering and durability. Their technique and training also affected the final result. Most people were getting numbers ranging from 10 to 14. It was considered a good result, something that only the most athletic people could reach. However, a lot of sleepers, obviously those with enhancing aspects, were able to achieve a score of 15 or even 16. I would probably get 10 or 11, Sonny thought, feeling a little bored. Then he suddenly perked up, noticing that it was turn for Nephi's, the highest rated sleeper of their batch, to strike the plate. The slender girl approached the machine and, without much preparation, delivered a sudden, crushing blow. 
Sonny wasn't very well-versed in martial arts, but even he was impressed by the flawless economy and speed of her execution. She had a lot of training. Nephi's was becoming more and more intriguing. What's her actual background? After a short pause, the machine displayed the result, 16. Sonny felt a bit disappointed. Not that impressive. I was expecting more. She was the proud bearer of a true name, after all. After that, only Castor remained. This time, Sonny couldn't even see the flying fist, it was just too fast. The machine trembled and took more time calculating. Finally, two numbers appeared. 21. Everyone gaped at the display, stunned. More than a few admiring looks were thrown at Castor, who simply bowed and took a step back. Instructor Rock smiled. Not bad. Now, we will move to sparring and evaluate your general level of training. I need two volunteers to begin. Nephi's was the first to step forward and walk to the center of the ring. A couple of seconds later, a tall and extremely muscular sleeper followed and faced her. The rules are simple. Make your opponent's back touch the floor or throw them out of the ring. Use whatever abilities and techniques you find appropriate. Oh, the show is starting. Watching sleepers fight each other was not only entertaining, but could also provide Sonny with knowledge of their powers. Back in the room, he leaned forward and rested his chin on his palms. Go Nephi's! The tall guy attacked without wasting any time. His muscles bulged, threatening to tear the soft fabric of his white dobok. He advanced like an unstoppable mountain, sending a vicious kick flying. A second later, he was lying on the floor with a dumbstruck look on his face. Nephi's didn't even change her stance. Instructor Rock gave her a cheerful look and grinned. Next. What followed could only be described as a massacre. One after another, Nephi's managed to defeat almost every single sleeper present in the dojo. She didn't seem to be faster or stronger than them, but each time someone entered the ring to fight her, they would inevitably end up beaten and thrown to the ground. Sonny watched the process with a growing sense of amusement. However, at some point, even he felt a bit of unease. Nephi's moved with the calm precision of a battle machine. Her technique was clean, graceful, and ruthless. No matter what type of attack was thrown at her, she was able to either predict or instantly react to it, then deflect and turn it against the attacker with the minimum amount of effort. It didn't matter whether her opponent was poor, rich, or a legacy. Everyone would end up dealt with in a matter of seconds. What's more, through the whole process, the composed expression on her face didn't even change once. It was like Nephi's was made out of metal. Is, is she even human? Sonny thought, suddenly apprehensive. What was he going to do if this changing star were to end up as his enemy? The best course of action would be to run away. Or better yet, try not to antagonize her, to begin with. After all, the sun was also a star, and shadows didn't mix well with sunlight. Finally, Castor was the last one remaining once again. However, he didn't seem to be perturbed by the miserable failure of every other sleeper. With a soft smile on his lips, the young man stepped into the ring. Castor and Nephi's faced each other. Their eyes locked for a few seconds, and then Castor slightly bowed. Lady Nephi's. Please excuse me in advance. What is he going to? A moment later, Sonny opened his eyes in shock, Chapter 27 Measure of Power. It seemed like Castor suddenly ceased to exist. However, it was only an illusion. The truth was that he was just moving so fast that the human eye wasn't able to keep up with his movements. If it wasn't for the special properties of Shadow Sight, Sonny wouldn't have been able to perceive anything either. Even then, he only noticed a hazy blur streaking through the air. In a fraction of a second, Castor covered the distance between him and Nephi's and delivered a devastating blow. However, despite his astonishing speed, she somehow managed to react in time, slightly turning her body to deflect the strike. But it still wasn't enough. Although Nephi's had managed to avoid being hit squarely in her center of gravity, Castor's fist ended up connecting with her shoulder, sending the girl into a spin. Not wasting any time, Castor disappeared again. His plan was very simple. While Nephi's was still under the impression that the enemy was in front of her, he was going to use his unnatural swiftness to circle around and attack from the back. The young man appeared behind the oblivious girl, ready to finish the fight with one decisive strike. Just as he planned, she seemed to be preparing to attack in the direction he had been seen just a split second ago. 
Gratified, Castor shifted his weight, putting it all into his fist. However, at the last moment, Nephi suddenly changed her stance and threw her elbow back with frightening force. Castor's eye widened. It was all a feint, and now that he had committed to a strike, there was no simple way to stop. No matter how fast he was, he was still subject to the laws of inertia. The elbow was approaching his face with a profound feeling of inevitability. And yet, Castor still managed to avoid it, even if it was just by a hair's breadth. His speed advantage was just too big. He then proceeded to trip and push Nephi's, sending her flying to the ground. However, just before she was about to as the mats, the young man carefully grabbed the collar of her dobok and gently pulled, slowing down the fall and allowing Nephi's to land on the floor without any impact. Lying on her back, the girl blinked a couple of times and looked up at him. The whole altercation lasted no more than two seconds. Back in his room, Sonny opened his eyes in shock. So that's an ascended aspect? That's, that's cheating. A sleeper had no business being that fast. The powers bestowed upon them by the spell were supposed to be in their infancy. But? Castor was a legacy, after all. Who knew how many soul shards were fed to him prior to enrolling into the academy? Back in the dojo, Instructor Rock grunted and gave Castor a nod. Nephi slowly rose to her feet. The rest of the sleepers were gawking at the young man with reverence, whispering among each other in hushed tones. It seemed that his performance left them with a deep impression. However, Castor himself wasn't very elated. He glanced at Nephi's with an unreadable expression. That was because, unlike the rest of them, he came to a certain realization. The truth of the matter was known only to him, Nephi's, Instructor Rock, and Sonny, who was very observant and quickly picked up on such things. The thing that sleepers failed to notice was that Nephi's did not use her aspect ability when facing Castor. In fact, she had not used it at any point during today's testing. No one even knew what her ability was. And yet, despite his powerful aspect, Castor barely managed to clutch a victory against her. What a monster, Sonny thought, full of unease. The shadow hiding in the corner of the dojo seemed to agree with him wholeheartedly. After that, the introductory combat class was over. Sore from the beating they received, sleepers headed for the showers. Sonny waited for a bit and then directed his shadow to sneak into the boys' locker room. He wasn't very interested in watching a bunch of teenagers changing clothes, but there was a slight possibility that Castor would either comment on his duel with Nephi's or answer some questions about his incredible aspect ability. Just as he had expected, the young man was surrounded by a group of newly converted fans. They were congratulating him on his victory, full of adoration and excitement. However, Castor himself seemed to be in a bad mood. His expression was somber, and there was a grim heaviness in his eyes. In fact, his face grew darker with each craze he received. Castor, that was incredible. You aspect is overpowered, am I right? That Nephi's girl stood no chance at all. True name? Who needs that? She's just a wannabe. Finally, Castor raised his head and pierced the last boy who had spoken with a cold look. That boy, just like him, was one of the few legacies in their batch of sleepers. He frowned, surprised by Castor's rection. What is it? Castor gritted his teeth. I might have expected such behavior from them, but you should know better. The other legacy raised an eyebrow. Why? Is there something special about that peasant girl? Castor's eyes widened. Peasant, peasant girl? Do you really not know who she is? No. Sonny thought impatiently. So just get to it and say it out loud. Luckily, the arrogant sleeper had the same sentiment. Castor opened his mouth several times, as though not sure what to say. Finally, he shook his head and answered. She is Nephi's of the Immortal Flame Clan. As soon as he said that, the arrogant legacy became deathly pale. Not paying him any attention, Castor continued. I trust that I don't need to tell you about her grandfather. Her parents were smile of heaven and broken sword. In his room, Sonny almost fell from the chair. Even he knew who a mortal flame and broken sword were. The former was the first human to conquer the second nightmare and become a master. The latter, the first one to conquer the third nightmare and become a saint. They, as well as their companions, were among the most famous heroes of the human race, someone who had managed to change history with their own two hands. 
If what Castor said was true, then Nephi's wasn't just an aristocrat, she was royalty. No wonder he addressed her as lady. Why didn't he just call her princess instead? But that didn't make any sense. Echoing his thoughts, the pale-faced sleeper asked in trembling voice. Then why, why is she so? Castor sighed, because they're all dead. The immortal flame clan is long gone. For a few moments, the locker room was completely silent. Castor looked down. She's the only one left. Late at night, when everyone was already asleep, Sonny furtively entered the dojo. Looking around, he made sure that no one was there and then curiously approached the ring where Nephi's and others had been tested earlier. He stopped at the center of the ring and stood there for a while, remembering how she had dealt with dozens of sleepers of their batch before being defeated by Castor. Monsters, both of them are monsters, he mumbled, bitter and disheartened. Shaking his head, Sonny left the ring and then he looked at his shadow. Do you agree? The shadow hesitated for a few seconds, then stuck out its chest and crossed its arms, trying to appear cocky, disdainful and unperturbed. However, its act wasn't very convincing. Yeah, you're right. Exactly. What's the big deal anyway? Both Immortal Flame and Broken Sword, Nephi's father and grandfather, were as monstrous in terms of power as one can get. But they still failed to protect their family from being eviscerated. So, power wasn't that important in the end. Even royalty was not safe from the cruelty of the world. Sunny sighed and proceeded to the measuring machine. Making a fist, he swung it and delivered his best punch. The machine hummed for a few seconds and then displayed a single number. Nine. Oh, come on. I deserve a ten, at least. Feeling very indignant, he struck the plate again, almost hurting his fingers. However, the result was the same. Damn it. Sonny paced for a bit, trying to control his anger. It seems he was destined to be a weakling. After all, the force of the strike depended on mass and acceleration. Acceleration could be improved with technique and exercise, but mass was something he had little control of. He was already done growing, and his height was not going to drastically increase in the future. No matter how hard Sonny trained, he was always going to be a lightweight. How is this fair? Suddenly filled with resentment, he punched the plate again, putting all of his frustration into this one strike. At that moment, a strange instinct suddenly awakened in Sonny's mind. Following the command of this instinct, his shadow flowed up and wrapped itself around his hand, sticking to it like a black glove. In the next moment, the punch connected. The machine trembled from the force of the strike. Sonny's yelped in pain and took a step back, cradling his bruised fist. After a while, the result was displayed. However, it wasn't a 9 anymore. It wasn't even a 10. It was 18. He looked at the displayed number for a long time, expressionless. Then, a wide grin slowly appeared on Sonny's face. I see. So that why? Of course. He clenched his fist again, looking down at the black, shadowy glove. Ah, what an invaluable helper indeed. Now we're talking. Chapter 28 Training Montage Days flew by. Sonny only had four weeks to prepare himself for the journey into the dream realm, so there wasn't even a minute to spare. He was relentless, pushing his body and mind to the limits in an attempt to absorb as much knowledge and skills as possible in that short amount of time. In the day, he studied with teacher Julius, slowly learning how to survive and take care of himself in the absence of civilization. Their lessons ranged from comparatively simple, like various ways to produce fire, to much more obscure and esoteric, like celestial navigation. What was so hard about celestial navigation? Well, as it turned out, the dream realm was not consistent in terms of star geography. Different regions had different stars and constellations, as well as a different number of moons. While the sun seemed to be the same, its behavior was highly unpredictable. Still, with sufficient knowledge, one could find ways to study the skies and subsequently navigate themselves. Most of these lessons were, supposedly, already included in the various school curriculums and known to the majority of sleepers. However, learning something from a textbook and learning the same thing from an actual awakened were two completely different matters. Teacher Julius had a habit of going much more in-depth when explaining his subject. Thanks to this time-consuming habit of his, Sonny not only learned about the what, but also often gained glimpses into the why. 
This nascent understanding of the underlying principles of the dream realm environments gave him the ability to face any situation with at least some measure of readiness. Even the lessons in dead languages, which Sonny had initially judged to be useless, turned out to be much more interesting than he could ever imagine. This was, in large part, because it concerned the spell itself after all, the spell communicated with humans in one of those dead languages. By knowing the language, he was able to understand its various remarks and descriptions better. The simplest example of this was Nephi's and her true name, Changing Star. While technically correct, this translation failed to properly convey the exact meaning. By understanding the grammatical structure of the rune language, it was easy to extrapolate and see that the more correct translation would have been Star of Change. More than that, there were different runes for change, each with its own connotation. Depending on what exact rune was used to relay the meaning of the name, it could also mean ruinous star or star of misfortune. A small change in wording and connotation could mean a world of difference in real life. Sonny, who had never seriously studied before, found the process of acquiring vast amounts of theoretical knowledge strange, numbing, and exhausting. However, in a sense, it was also exhilarating. After all, Knowledge was something that only the privileged had access to. It was also this authority over knowledge that kept them in the position of power, creating a vicious circle of inequality. The poor had no opportunity to study, and without the advantage of good education, they had no way to stop being poor. The weirdest part about all of this was that Sonny was now one of those privileged people. More than that, he was at the pinnacle of social hierarchy. Not only had he gained access to an unlimited amount of knowledge, but even his basic needs like food and shelter were also taken care of by the government, allowing him to fully focus on the single goal of developing himself as an awakened. This sudden transformation would have sent him into a whirlpool of philosophical reflection if he had any time to spare. But he didn't, because teacher Julius also insisted on holding practical lessons every other day. Even if some of them had to be done in virtual reality simulations, he insisted on using the full immersion stations with enhanced physical feedback. As a result, Sonny was bone-tired and utterly exhausted. The good thing was that with such amount of exercise, coupled with his newly reforged body, Sonny had never been in better shape. Even without combat training, he could feel his strength, stamina, and agility improving by leaps and bounds. Basically, the peculiar rebirth he had experienced after completing the first nightmare had enhanced the innate potential of his body, bringing it to the peak of the human condition. However, it was up to him to realize that potential with sweat, effort, and a lot of hard work. Practical application of wilderness survival techniques provided him with the opportunity to do so. And as though this wasn't enough, Sonny secretly collected information about other sleepers and practiced shadow control every night. His shadow was independent enough to be sent on scouting missions without his direct control. It would sneak here and there, listening in on the conversations and observing different classes where sleepers had to demonstrate their aspect abilities. Then, after Sonny had finished his supper and returned to his room, it would come back and share everything it had heard and seen during the day. The only problem with this arrangement was that the shadow, despite its outward snarkiness, turned out to be rather naive. It didn't quite understand how the human world worked, and as such, often failed to distinguish between useful information and meaningless chatter. So, most of the time, Sonny would receive nothing of value or juicy gossip instead of important secrets. This is how he learned that in the sleeper center, romance was in the air. After all, there were a hundred beautiful young people locked underground in close proximity to each other, with the added spice of a deathly threat hanging above their heads. Many felt that life was short and it was their time to seize the day. Passion bloomed in the shadow of approaching danger. Sonny was excluded from this whole side of the thing, of course. Firstly, he had already positioned himself to be perceived as an unlikable lunatic. Secondly, he simply had no time for anything except for his lessons and training. And lastly, he was wary of getting too close to anybody, afraid that a situation would arise where he would have no choice but to divulge his true name. Apart from gathering information and slowly learning about the scope and details of various aspect abilities, and, to a lesser extent, flaws, he was also experimenting with shadow control. The results were very promising. He quickly found out that his shadow was able to enhance various objects and not only his body. If it wrapped itself around a weapon, the weapon strike harder and deliver more damage. If it was applied to an armor, the armor would become sturdier and harder to break. The enhancement was rather substantial, too. It was roughly twice as much as the initial value. 
All in all, this ability, if used correctly, could make him a powerhouse among the sleepers. Many combat aspects could deliver more speed or damage, many could provide more defense and protection, but none were as well-rounded and versatile as Shadow Slave. With the added utility of Shadow Sight, Shadow Step, and Shadow Scout, it was truly incredible. Just like that, day after day passed, slowly turning into weeks. Before Sunny even knew it, the winter solstice was already here, chapter 29 the last day on earth. On the day of the winter solstice, Sunny woke up feeling tired and drowsy. No matter how much he tried to shake off this listlessness, it wouldn't go away. In the end, he just stayed in the bed for a while, wrapping himself in a blanket. He was already familiar with this feeling of never-ending, ensnaring sleepiness. It was the same in the days before his first nightmare. It was also quite similar to what he had experienced while slowly dying of hypothermia on the slopes of the Black Mountain. Remembering the cold embrace of approaching death, Sonny couldn't help but shiver. This was his last day on Earth, at least for a while. By nightfall, the spell was going to take him away once again, this time to challenge the vast expanse of the dream realm. What was he going to face in that ruined magical world? Would luck be on his side this time, or would there be another disaster? Ugh. There was no point in guessing. He had already done everything in his power to prepare for the inevitable. He studied hard, trained hard, and kept his secret safe. His aspect was better than most, and his will to survive was long tempered by the harsh reality of the outskirts and the even harsher ordeal of the first nightmare. All in all, he was ready. With a sigh, Sonny got out of bed and went along with his morning routine. If this was going to be his last hot shower in a long while, he was going to really enjoy it. If it was going to be his last scrumptious breakfast for the time being, actually, he had no appetite. The cafeteria was full of sleepers, but no one was talking. Everybody was in low spirits and seemed to be uncharacteristically introspective. There was no usual laughter or boisterous conversations, only the legacies remained calm and collected. However, even they kept to themselves. Sonny thought about the last time he was preparing to enter the spell and, with a bit of trepidation, approached the coffee machine. During his stay in the academy, he had long discovered that a lot of people were in a habit of adding sugar and milk to their coffee. So, on this auspicious day, he decided to give it another try. After all, it was nice to have a tradition. A few minutes later, he had taken his usual seat near Kasha, the blind girl. Despite their compulsory closeness, they had not talked to each other even once, just like two strangers forced to share the same space by circumstances beyond their control. Sonny did not see a reason for anything to change today. However, as soon as he took the first sip of coffee, Kasha suddenly turned her head and stared at him with her beautiful, blind blue eyes. Unnerved, Sonny looked around, checking if someone else had attracted her attention, and, after making sure that there wasn't anyone standing behind him, asked. W what? Kasha was silent, as though hesitating if she should reply, and then suddenly said. Happy birthday. What? Sonny frowned, trying to comprehend the meaning behind her words. Then, a flash of surprise appeared on his face. Oh, right. It's my birthday today. He had completely forgotten about it. He was turning 17 today. Wait, how did she know about this? Sonny gave the blind girl a strange look, opened his mouth, and then decided to let the issue go. She was just too creepy. Ah, uh, thanks. With a nod, Kasha turned away and seemingly lost interest in having a conversation once again. Which was for the better. Sonny returned to his coffee, finding it not too bad this time. Of course, sugar and cream were making most of the work. However, he did feel a little bit more awake after drinking it. Seventeen, huh? Sonny was never sure that he would make it to this age alive. And yet, despite everything, he did. Life was sure unpredictable sometimes. If anyone would have told him a year ago that he was going to celebrate his 17th birthday by drinking real coffee with real milk and sugar, he would have laughed in their face. But now it was a reality. Unwillingly, Sonny remembered all the people who used to celebrate his birthdays with him a long time ago. Before his mood turned sour, he decisively dispelled these thoughts and forced himself to smile. This is not bad. Let's do it again next year, when I'm already an awakened. Cheering himself up like that, he finished his coffee and left the cafeteria. There were no classes today, but he still visited the wilderness survival classroom and said his goodbyes to teacher Julius. 
The old man got pretty emotional when sending him off. He gave Sonny one last tip a dozen or so times in a row and even promised to apply for a research assistant position to be opened after the young man had become a full awakened. Sonny left, thanking him for his time and patience. After that, there wasn't much to do. When the sun was close to setting, Instructor Rock gathered them in the foyer of the sleeper center and led them outside. In the snowy parks that surrounded the white building, other awakened were leading their own batches of sleepers to the same destination. It was the Academy's medical center. The center looked more like a shrine than a hospital. Its interior contained both highly advanced technology as well as some of the best healers among the awakened. For the duration of their first journey into the dream realm, the bodies of sleepers would be kept safe in specially designed pods and sustained by the magical powers of those healers if anything unfortunate were to happen on the other side of the spell. Of course, whether or not they would wake up in the end wholly depended on the sleepers themselves. To Sunny's surprise, after entering the medical center, Instructor Rock did not take them directly to the wing containing sleeper pods. Instead, he led them to a comparatively deserted floor and then opened the doors to a spacious gallery that was brightly illuminated by the beautiful crimson rays of the setting sun. There, they saw rows and rows of wheelchairs. In each wheelchair, there was a person with a blank, strangely peaceful expression on their face. All these people were completely silent, motionless, and still. They did not show any reaction to the appearance of guests. They all seemed to be empty. In the eerie silence, Sonny felt his hair standing up and a creeping terror sipping deep into his heart. Instructor Rock looked at the empty people with solemn eyes. There is a reason I brought you all here. Look well and remember. Some of you may know who these people are, for those of you who don't, they are called hollow. He gritted his teeth. Each one of them was once either a sleeper or an awakened. Some of them were weak, some of them were strong. Some were even incredibly powerful. All of them have perished in the dream realm. There, their souls are gone, Sonny realized, horrified. If you're lucky, once your spirit is destroyed, your body dies with it. But if not, you'll become just like them. Hollow. Instructor Rock glanced in the direction where Castor and Nephi stood, and then added. So don't die out there. Half an hour later, sleepers had been led to their personal rooms and were preparing to enter the pods. In one of the rooms, the blind girl, Kasha, was helplessly trying to orient herself in the unfamiliar space, touching the walls and strange pieces of machinery with her hands. Tears were streaming down her beautiful, doll-like face. In the other room, proud legacy caster was staring listlessly at the floor. His lips were moving, repeating one strange phrase over and over again. He was trembling. Somewhere else, changing star Nephi's, the last daughter of the immortal flame clan, was looking down at her hands. Underneath her skin, soft white radiance was slowly growing brighter and brighter. Her face was contorted in a grimace of harrowing agony. And finally, there was a room where Shadow Slave Sunless, lost from light, turned away from the sleeping pod and glanced down at his shadow. Well, are you ready? The shadow shrugged and didn't answer. Sunny sighed. Yeah, me too. With that, he stepped forward and climbed into the pod. In the vast echoing darkness, he heard. Welcome to the Dream Realm, Sunless. Chapter 30 Starless Void Sunny was expecting to first look at the place where his arrival to the Dream Realm was going to take place from above, just like it had happened at the beginning of the first nightmare. Back then, time had magically moved in reverse, giving him an opportunity to see hints of what he was going to face. Instead, immediately after hearing the greetings of the spell, Sunny found himself blind and drowning. As he instinctively tried to open his mouth to scream, salty water rushed inside, making him choke and twitch. More than that, he couldn't see anything. No, it's not that he couldn't see, it's just there was no source of light around. Usually, darkness wasn't a problem for Sonny, but, for some reason, his sight wasn't working anymore. Maybe the seawater he was submerged in was blocking it. If it wasn't for the special space perception that the affinity to shadows gave him, he would have been completely disoriented. With its help, though, he barely managed to understand which side was down, and which side was up. Luckily, Teacher Julius's lessons had included swimming. Swearing to thank both the old man and Master Jet once he came back, Sonny forced himself to stay calm and began to swim upward. In a few long intense seconds, his head broke through the surface of the water. Sonny was finally able to draw in a deep, hoarse breath. Breathe, breathe. You're still alive. 
After sucking in enough air to soothe his burning lungs and compose himself to a certain degree, Sonny carefully spun in the water, trying to take in his surroundings. What met him was an endless, jet-black expanse of undulating waves. Above them was an empty black sky. There was no moon, no stars, just a dark vastness of repressive nothingness. Sonny blinked a few times, cold dread taking hold of his heart. This is, a sea? An ocean? Was I dropped in the middle of an ocean? No, it couldn't be. There had to be solid ground somewhere nearby. As he was gripped by a momentary panic, a remote sound suddenly drew his attention. Sonny turned around and saw a triangular dorsal fin moving in his direction. Luckily, it was still hundreds and hundreds of meters away. Wait, if it's so far away, then how come I can see it so clearly? Despite being submerged in water, Sonny still felt like there was suddenly cold sweat all other his body. By his estimation, that dorsal fin was at least five meters tall. It was rapidly approaching, growing visibly larger with each second. Damn you, spell! With eyes full of horror, Sonny spun again, desperately trying to find something, anything, to save him. And there, a short distance away, he finally noticed a black mass protruding slightly above the water. Not wasting even a second on thinking, he started to swing his arms and legs, swimming in the direction of the black mass with a considerable speed. However, no matter how fast he swam, the giant shadow of the unknown creature was closing the distance between them much faster. A small part of Sonny's mind managed to preserve its rationality even when faced with this boundless, primal fear. Not allowing himself to slip entirely into panic, Sonny tried to think, and then silently commanded his own shadow to wrap itself around his body. Instantly, his speed increased twofold. Just seconds before the unknown colossus got to him, Sonny reached the black mass, stretched out his hands, and pulled himself out of the water. He rolled away from the edge, scratching his skin on the uneven rocks, and jumped in fright when the whole surface underneath him shuddered, as though something massive had collided with it. As Sonny backed out, terrifying jaws appeared from the water, with rows and rows of giant teeth, each one as long as he was tall. He opened his eyes wide, understanding that the rock he had climbed on was not tall enough to save him from the monster. Why is it even trying to eat me? I'm too small to be considered a filling snack for something this enormous. However, before the monster had a chance to attack, a colossal tentacle suddenly broke through the water and rose into the air like some strange, black tower. Before too long, it fell down, entangling the owner of the giant maw and pulling it back under the water. Sonny lost the feeling in his legs and plopped on the ground, his mouth opened. His whole body was shaking. A few seconds later, the dark sea was calm again, as though nothing has happened. The indifferent waves continued to move silently under the lightless sky. So, it wasn't trying to eat me, he realized, frozen. It was trying to run away. A few minutes later, Sonny was pretty sure that nothing was going to devour him, at least not immediately. With that certainty, he was finally in a state of mind to stop trembling and explore his surroundings a little. The black mass he climbed onto turned out to be a single stone platform of around 12 meters in diameter. Its surface was mostly flat, covered with grooves, and somewhat dry. Due to the regular shape of its edges, it seemed more like something man-made than a natural formation. But then again, here in the dream realm, it was hard to be sure that something man-made was actually made by humans, as opposed to, better not to think about it. The platform wasn't connected to anything, existing as a tiny island in the sea of darkness. There wasn't anything else above the water for as far as Sunny was able to see. After discovering that fact, he also realized something else. It was that he was wet, cold, and completely naked. Ha! In his defense, the clothing situation was the last thing one would think about when trying to save themselves from abyssal monsters. Also, it's not like someone was here to witness his stark paleness and private bits. Still, it was sort of cold. Sonny summoned the puppeteer's shroud and watched as dark gray garments covered his body. It even came with a pair of high, soft-soled leather boots. Clad in gray fabric and lusterless leather, he suddenly felt much safer. Not to mention, warm. After that, Sonny sat down in the middle of the platform, as far away from water as he could, and tried to remember the unique characteristic of every explored region of the dream realm he could think of. Unfortunately, none of them matched the starless, dark void. Of course not, he thought with a bit of resentment. Even if some unlucky humans had ever come here, I doubt that they were able to return to the real world alive. 
not with those things hiding underwater. Not yet desperate enough to leave the platform and try to swim away in search of land, Sunny decided to wait and see. Maybe something was going to change as time went by. With a soft sigh, he habitually looked for his shadow. However, due to the total darkness that surrounded him, it couldn't really be seen. He just barely felt its presence. This must be a paradise for you, right? All this gloom and not a star in sight. The shadow, of course, did not answer. Anyway, good job earlier. With a nod, Sonny lay down, using his hands as a pillow. Not thinking about much, he stared into the black sky and waited. The sound of the undulating waves was, actually, quite relaxing. After a while, he closed his eyes and listened. Minutes merged together, growing into hours. Suddenly, Sonny caught a slight change in the sound of the sea. It was as though something was shifting. He opened his eyes and noticed that one corner of the sky was slowly turning gray. Soon, a glimpse of a pale sun could be seen rising above the horizon. A new day had come to the starless void. And with it, the dark sea suddenly surged, chapter 31 low tide. The black, opaque water suddenly surged and seethed, as though a living creature desperately trying to avoid the pale light of the coming dawn. Sunny slowly rose and, after some thought, carefully approached the edge of the stone platform. Looking down, he blinked and then kneeled to make sure that what he saw wasn't an illusion. The sea seemed to be receding. Slowly at first, and then faster and faster, the water level was dropping. The circular stone formation he had been taking shelter on used to barely protrude out of the waves, but now there were meters and meters of wet rock between him and the restless surface of the sea. As the sun climbed up, the monstrous ebb tide continued. Soon, Sonny found himself standing on the edge of a tall cliff, with a hundred meter drop separating him from the churning waters. Beneath him, the rock formation broadened and changed shape. However, from his vantage point, it was hard to determine what that shape was, exactly. At that time, the dark surface of the water began to be punctured here and there by sharp crimson blades. As it dropped even further, it was as though a crimson forest was slowly rising from the black depths. The trees were made of something resembling coral, growing chaotically into each other and stretching toward the sky. They were colossal in size, with irregular protrusions entwining and merging together, looking monumental and airy in the black and red reality of the sunlit void. The labyrinth formed by this strange reef stretched as far as Sunny could see, broken here and there by protruding cliffs, sudden chasms, and distant natural features. Half an hour later, utterly shocked, Sunny stared down and realized that the sea was completely gone. If not for the black seaweed left hanging on wet rocks and scarlet pillars of coral, he would even doubt if it was ever there. His small circular island had turned into the peak of a strange, towering, irregularly shaped cliff. Looking down, he felt his head spinning. By then, the night had already fully retreated, letting morning finally take its place. I'm not seeing things, am I? Sonny thought, pinching himself. What the spell was that? Despite the sudden disappearance of the dark sea and its hidden monsters, Sonny was in no rush to climb down from his circular stone platform. Firstly, he felt that if the sea was able to disappear, it was surely able to come back, perhaps at any moment. Secondly, he did not know what dangers the coral labyrinth was hiding. Perhaps there was something even scarier than the owner of the giant tentacle down there. But that did not mean that he wasn't going to explore. Coming back to his spot in the middle of the platform, Sonny sat down and commanded his shadow to separate itself from his body. Then, taking control of it, he approached the edge of the platform and nimbly slid down. Habitually moving from one shadow to another, he began the descent. At this moment, Sonny was glad that shadows had no weight and were not affected by gravity. While the shadow was busy climbing down, Sonny yawned. Say, don't you think that you need a name? Although his shadow was already too far away to hear him, they still could communicate through their shared connection. Of course, the fact that it could did not mean that it would. The shadow was sort of taciturn, mostly because it didn't have vocal cords and was unable to speak. Plus, its temper wasn't that great. How about? Shameless? No? What about? Shady? Also no? Hmm, what about something simpler, like? What? Well, do you have suggestions then? Alright, alright. We'll shelve this conversation for later. By the time he was done with this short monologue, the shadow had already reached the bottom of the cliff. 
The range of shadow control was not limitless, but it was just barely enough to explore their nearest surroundings. Entering the labyrinth, Sunny found it to be extremely disorienting and convoluted. The paths between coral pillars were sometimes broad, sometimes narrow. They twisted and turned without any logic, often leading to dead ends or even back to where he started. More than that, some paths entered inside the coral mounds, turning into dark tunnels. The labyrinth was vast and multi-layered, making Sunny's head hurt after multiple fruitless attempts to memorize the layout of the nearest pathways. In the end, he sent the shadow up, forcing it to climb on top of the crimson forest and start jumping from one sharp coral blade to another, knowing full well that he himself would not be able to do the same. Soon, he circled the strange cliff and froze, scared by the sight of what was happening in its shadow. There, the corpse of the giant shark-like creature that had briefly pursued him the previous night was laying on the ground, the pillars of coral around it shattered and broken. More precisely, half of it was there, with grotesque innards spilling out of the terrible wound and stretching far away into the distance. The other half was gone, as though it had never existed. Around the corpse, hundreds of smaller monsters were scurrying, tearing away and devouring its flesh bit by bit. Each of them was about two and a half meters tall, looking like a weird mix of a demonic crab, a centaur, and a nightmare. They had four pairs of long, segmented legs that ended in scythe-like protrusions. At the front, a human-like torso was protruding from the carapace, also clad in thick chitinous armor. The head, if it was even the appropriate word, was situated directly on top of the torso, with no neck in between. It had two narrow eye slits and a viscous-looking mouth with several slimy mandibles. Instead of hands, the monsters had two enormous pincers. Currently, they were all using those pincers to tear off chunks of meat off the desiccated corpse and stuff them into their mouths. From time to time, a fight for an especially juicy piece of meat would break out, ending up in a few monsters being torn apart and quickly devoured by the victors. Sunny swallowed. Both because the sight of heavily armored, powerful monsters made him nervous and because looking at them feasting, he suddenly felt very hungry. Each of them seems like trouble. And there are hundreds of them. His luck, like always, was awful. At least I don't have to wonder why the labyrinth feels so empty. All the inhabitants are having a party. Feeling a little bit comprehensive about turning his shadows back to the monsters, Sunny commanded it to look back and study the cliff he was taking shelter atop of. Something about it was making him feel uneasy. The shadow turned around and looked up, taking in the sight of the strangely shaped cliff. It took Sunny a few minutes to shift his perspective and recognize it for what it was. That's a finger. That's a hand. That is, a sword? He blinked. It's a statue. Indeed, the cliff was man-made. It was an ancient, colossal statue at least 200 meters tall. The scale of it was so massive that it boggled the mind. From what Sunny could see, it depicted a knight clad in an elaborate plate armor, with seven shining stars carved into his breastplate. In his hands, he was holding a gargantuan sword, pointing it to the ground. However, the most striking thing about it was that the giant stone knight was missing his head. In fact, the roughly circular platform Sonny was standing on turned out to be the top of his neck. And by the looks of it, the head wasn't missing by design, it was as though something, or someone, had violently tore it off at some point in the distant past. Sonny walked around the platform, looking down from all sides, but didn't notice the head lying anywhere near. What on earth is this place? Without any hints to find the answer, he led his shadow back to the giant's neck and settled at the western edge of it, studying the feasting monsters. He didn't move until the sun was about to set. Just as Sunny expected, as soon as the sun touched the horizon, a deafening rumble could be heard coming from somewhere below. The monsters instantly stopped their feast and scurried away, some hiding inside the coral pillars, some simply burying themselves in the soft soil. A few minutes later, the first streams of black water appeared in the labyrinth. Their volume quickly grew, and soon an apocalyptic flood devoured everything around. The sea was returning with the approach of the night. Sunny stared at this unimaginable process, thoughts churning in his head. In an hour, the circular platform was the only thing above the dark waters once again, chapter 32 making a choice. With an empty stomach and a head full of thoughts, Sunny returned to the center of the platform and sat down. After a while, he beckoned to his shadow and said, Wake me up if anything happens. Then, he closed his eyes and tried to fall asleep. His consciousness quickly slid into the sweet embrace of darkness, giving Sunny some well-needed rest. 
In the middle of the night, however, a sudden impulse stirred him awake. Sonny jumped to his feet, his groggy mind full of tense apprehension. He was afraid that the owner of the giant tentacle had come back to finish the job. Or maybe some other horror from the depths had sensed him and decided to snack on human meat. However, the sea was quiet and calm. He didn't hear any abnormalities around the knight's statue. What is it? Sonny whispered, addressing the shadow. The shadow silently pointed him in a particular direction. Turning his head, Sonny squinted. He quickly understood why it was a good idea to wake up. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been able to see. Out there in the distance, a few kilometers away, a small orange light was shimmering in the darkness. Its reflections were rising and falling with the movement of waves. It was too far away to make out any details, so Sonny just stared at it for a while. Pretty soon, the light disappeared. Other sleepers? Natural phenomenon? Or some monster laying a trap? Memories of nightmarish deepwater creatures immediately came to his mind. Shaking his head, Sonny lay back down and attempted to return to his slumber. However, this time sleep was escaping him. Pangs of hunger were still not unbearable, but slowly becoming more and more intense. The thirst, however, was worse. In the end, he remained awake up until the sun rose again, sending the dark sea in retreat. As soon as the morning came, the pincer monsters crawled back from their hiding spots and rushed to the giant carcass to continue their feast. Sonny watched them for some time and then walked to the opposite side of the platform to take a look in the direction where he had seen the mysterious light the previous night. At a considerable distance from the headless statue, five or six kilometers away, the ground rose naturally and formed something akin to a hill. On top of that hill, an especially massive coral pillar rose to the sky. From the looks of it, its upper branches were just high enough to stay above water in the night. Various ideas stormed into Sonny's head, but at the end of it, only two questions were really important. First of all, would he be able to find the way through the labyrinth and cover that distance during the day? And more importantly, should he even attempt to do it? After all, there was no indication that the source of the mysterious light was something beneficial, as opposed to dreadful and deadly. Not having enough information to make a choice, Sonny settled back to study the monsters. He did, however, send the shadow to investigate as far into the labyrinth as the range of shadow control allowed, hoping to chart at least the beginning of the path that could potentially lead him to that hill. Logically speaking, he was as safe atop the headless statue as he probably could be in this strange place. The only problem was, he was going to die soon because of thirst or hunger. Both problems were solvable if he were to venture down. He could desalinate the seawater in a number of ways taught to him by teacher Julius, with materials that were present pretty much everywhere in the dream realm. He could also prepare traps and hunt a pincer monster to eat. With their massive size, just one of them would be enough to feed him for weeks. He could easily see such a routine, hunting by day, returning to the statue at the approach of the night. It was probably his safest choice. However, this way of doing things lacked one vital element, the potential for improvement. It was well suited for keeping Sonny alive, but had no way of giving him hope. If he was destined to spend the rest of his life in the small area surrounding the headless statue, devouring monsters and trembling at night in fear of being devoured by something bigger in turn, well, he would rather just jump down and end it right now. That pretty much meant that the only choice left for him was to try and reach the source of the orange light. And if Sonny was really trying to attempt it, he had to do it before the pincer monsters were done consuming the giant carcass. That way, at least, the surrounding segment of the labyrinth was going to be free of them. Firm in his choice, Sonny decided to leave the headless statue the next morning. He would spend the rest of today exploring paths through the labyrinth and preparing himself mentally. With that, he closed his eyes and concentrated his perception on the moving shadow. In the night, a sudden storm descended upon the dark sea. Sonny was stirred awake by the shadow in time to prepare himself for the crushing winds and the pelting rain. Usually, rain always put him in a bad mood. But this time he was too thirsty to think about anything except for fresh water. Staying low so as to not be blown over the edge of the platform, Sonny cupped his hands and waited until they became filled with rainwater. Then he raised them to his mouth and greedily drank. Strikes of lightning illuminated everything above the churning sea. If anyone were to see Sonny now, they would have noticed a wide grin on his face. The storm continued to rampage for several hours. Sonny crouched in the middle of the platform, enduring its rage. 
More than once, a tall wave would crash into the headless knight's neck, threatening to wash him away. But Sunny held tight to the deep grooves in the stone surface of the platform, sticking to it like glue. By morning, when the storm finally dissipated, all of his muscles were sore. But there was no time to waste. As soon as the monsters came back to the carcass, with a few stragglers quickly following behind, he slid over the edge of the platform and began to nimbly climb down. Sonny had to thank wilderness survival classes once again, since he had been taught the basics of rock climbing as well. Teacher Julius was adamant about giving his student a crash course in all possible forms of traversal. Additionally, Sonny had already scouted the optimal way down and memorized the best holds and indentions to grab onto with the help of his shadow. Soon, his feet finally touched the ground. Despite the fact that leaving the safety of the headless statue was going to put him in considerable danger, Sonny instantly felt his mood improving. Remaining passive for the last couple of days did not suit his character well. Now, even if his plan were to end in failure, at least he was going to go down doing something that he had decided to do. Trying and failing was better than not trying at all. The black mud was deep enough to slow him down, but not to the extent he had been afraid of. With some practice, Sonny was soon able to walk at an acceptable speed. What's more, as long as he stuck to the shadows, his steps were light and silent, producing no squelching noises from the mud. He headed for one of the paths that were supposed to lead him to the distant hill and entered the cool shade of the crimson labyrinth. Immediately, a strange feeling enveloped his mind. It was as though the world beyond the labyrinth did not exist anymore, and all that was left were its twisting, dark paths. This thing almost seems endless. Shaking his head, Sonny sent the shadow to scout ahead, hoping to be notified of any latent danger in advance, and began to move forward. His life now depended on whether or not he would reach the distant hill before the sun began to set. He didn't even want to think about what would happen if he were still inside the labyrinth once the dark sea came back in an unstoppable flood. The shadow moved ahead of him, not meeting any hurdles. Sometimes it would climb high to scout the direction of different paths, allowing Sonny to choose the optimal route most of the time. However, he still had to backtrack a considerable distance once or twice, ending up either in a dead end or on a path leading in the wrong direction. Despite that, everything seemed to be going smoothly. Sonny even had time to carefully study the interior of the labyrinth, noticing more details of its composition, as well as a frightening amount of unrecognizable bones hiding in the mud beneath his feet. Because of how well things were going, he lowered his guard a little. His arrogance was also to blame, with his extensive preparations and skillful control of the Shadow Scout, Sonny subconsciously patted himself on the shoulder and assumed that everything was going to be fine. That's why, when the mud directly in front of him started to move, he was a fraction of a second late to react. In the next moment, a massive pincer shot out of the ground and tore through the air, threatening to cut his body in half with one crushing strike, Chapter 33 Carapace Scavenger. Crap! This was the only thought in Sonny's head as he awkwardly fell backward, allowing the pincer to close right in front of his face with a loud clack. The jagged, chitinous blades were so close that he could clearly see bits of mud sticking to their surface. Sonny landed on his back, narrowly avoiding the unexpected strike. The good thing was that he managed to avoid being injured or even killed. The bad thing was that he was sprawled on the ground, unable to quickly create distance between him and the attacker. The massive pincer was still hovering above. Just as this realization dawned on Sonny, he desperately rolled to the side. In the next moment, the pincer lunged down, sending small tremors through the mud. If not for his quick reaction, Sonny's chest would have been caved in by that blow. He was just beginning to stand up when the pincer swiped sideways. Luckily, Sonny was ready. Instead of trying to dodge or block the attack, he went with it, letting the pincer collide with his outstretched hands and cushioning the blow. As his arms screamed in pain, Sonny used the force of the blow and allowed his body to be sent flying through the air. This way, at least, he would get out of the pincer's range. He might not have been taught how to fight, but one thing he knew very well was how to fall. Instead of breaking his neck or having the breath beaten out of him by the landing, he braced his body and nimbly rolled before stopping some distance away from the ambushing monster. I take it back. Sonny though, remembering his sarcastic critique of heroes' battle rolls. Rolling is an integral part of any respectable monster fighting technique. Then, he looked up, trying to ascertain the situation. In front of him, the attacker had finally shown itself. It burrowed from under the mud, casting a vast shadow over kneeling Sunny. Its tiny eyes were full of rage, hunger, and malice. 
It was one of the pincer monsters he had spent so much time observing. Towering over him at almost three meters in height, the bulky creature moved its mandibles and produced a jarring, piercing screech. Why aren't you devouring the giant carcass with the rest of your buddies, you crab bastard? However, the answer to Sonny's indignant plea was rather obvious. The monster seemed to be in a rather bad shape, half of its eight side-like legs were broken, and there were cracks in its thick carapace, each oozing with viscous azure blood. Additionally, he was missing one of its two pincer arms, which seemed to have been torn off entirely at the shoulder. If not for this pathetic state, the creature would have had no need to hide in the mud, hoping to catch easy prey. It could have just followed the other monsters and joined on the feast. Sonny was just unlucky to stumble directly upon its ambush. He had relied too much on the scouting abilities of his shadow, forgetting that it wasn't much more observant than an awakened human. It was also weightless and inaudible, that's why the monster did not react when the shadow had passed over its trap a minute earlier. On the other hand, Sonny could also consider himself lucky, by the same logic, he would not have been able to dodge the creature's sudden attack if not for its crippled, slowed state. But pondering on his luck could wait for later, right now, Sonny had a far more pressing thing to do. Namely, try to survive. Get back here, he ordered the shadow and jumped to the side. In the next second, the space he occupied a moment before was torn apart by the attacking monster. Its heavy pincer crashed into the side of a coral pillar, sending crimson shards flying in every direction. Sonny caught his balance and continued moving. He was hoping that the bulky, heavily armored, wounded creature would not be able to match his speed, but unfortunately, it turned out to be surprisingly agile. Its side-like legs pierced the mud behind him, and the pincer was already flying through the air again, threatening to decapitate the young man at any second. Sonny ducked, dodging the pincer, and finally caught a second of reprieve. His eyes darted around, desperately searching for something to use as a weapon. Almost instantly, he noticed a long, smooth, sharp bone left behind by some unknown creature sticking from the mud. Without slowing down, he bent down and grabbed the bone, pulling it out with one forceful tug. The bone was almost one and a half meters long, ending in a narrow, sharp tip. It was almost like a spear. The problem was, even with the added length of this makeshift spear, Sonny's range of attack was still shorter than the monster's. He also doubted that it was capable of piercing the hard carapace. In short, he had to get close and aim for one of the cracks in the creature's armor. However, he didn't dare to. At that short of a distance, the monster could easily crush him into a paste by using just its weight and hulking frame. A crazy idea entered Sonny's mind. A bit shocked, he momentarily couldn't decide whether it was the product of audacity or foolishness. Either way, he wasn't insane enough to actually consider it. At that moment, the pincer lashed out again. This time, Sonny was a little late to evade, and as a result, a sharp pain pierced his left leg. It was grazed by the edge of the pincer. The puppeteer's shroud held, not allowing the monster to draw blood, but the force of the impact was enough to throw Sonny tumbling to the ground. There was no time to recover. As his eyes opened wide, Sonny understood that it was time to act crazy. So, instead of trying to dodge, he stopped moving and allowed the monster to grab him across his torso with the pincer. Immediately, a terrible pressure descended on his ribs. Sonny felt as though he was going to be split apart, but his armor, received from defeating an awakened tyrant, resisted the crushing bite of the monster's pincer. Every muscle in his body tensed, delaying the moment when his insides would be turned into mush. In the next second, Sonny's shadow fell from above, wrapping itself around the puppeteer's shroud. With the protective properties of the armor enhanced, he was able to better resist the pincer's pulverizing embrace. Sonny and the monster appeared to be at an impasse. The young man couldn't free himself from the monster's grip, while the monster could not kill the prey by cutting it in halves with its pincer. They stared at each other. Then, an insane fire ignited in the creature's eyes. It clicked its mandibles and raised Sonny in the air, bringing him closer to its mouth, obviously intent on biting his head off. Why is everyone trying to eat me? Am I that tasty? Sonny didn't struggle as the monster brought him close to its mandibles. He knew he only had one chance to live. In the last moment, Sonny allowed the shadow to flow from Puppeteer's shroud onto the sharp bone he was still clenching in his hand. Then, he gathered all his strength, leaned forward and thrust the bone forward with as much power as he could. Guided by his hand, the dark bone spear shot forward and pierced through the creature's tiny eye, sinking in deep. 
The other eye of the monster narrowed. Gritting his teeth from the unbearable pain in his ribs, Sonny twisted the bone, trying to do as much damage to the creature's brain as possible. For a couple of seconds, nothing happened. Then, he felt the pressure on his body diminishing. The pincer opened, letting Sonny fall down. As he hit the mood, the hulking monster crashed to the ground, too. The bone spear was still sticking from its head, bathed in the streams of azure liquid. Sonny moaned and drew in a raspy, painful breath. You have slain an awakened beast, carapace scavenger. You have received a memory, azure blade. Your shadow grows stronger. Chapter 34 Only Steel Remembers Sonny was sprawled in the mud, trying to catch his breath. The subtle voice of the spell echoed in his ears. Your shadow grows stronger. Immediately, he felt a slight change. His body grew a little bit stronger, his vision a little sharper, his skin a little smoother. The change was minimal, but apparent. What was that? He had a guess, and it was easy to confirm. Sonny summoned the runes. Shadow Fragments, 14 1000. Previously, he only had 12 of the mysterious Shadow Fragments, with no knowledge on how to acquire more. Now it seemed that the process was automatic, he only had to kill an enemy to absorb a part of their shadow and enhance his own core. More than that, the number of fragments he was able to receive wasn't directly correlated to the number of slain enemies. After a bit of thinking, Sonny came to a preliminary conclusion, Dormant Soul Cores gave him one fragment, while Awakened Ones gave two. However, only enemies he defeated directly more or less counted. Killing the Mountain King's larva, a dormant beast, had given him one shadow fragment. Finishing off the veteran slaver, a dormant human, another. Mountain King itself was an awakened tyrant, which meant that it had five awakened cores. With each giving Sunny two shadow fragments, he ended up with a total of twelve. And now, after killing the carapace scavenger, he had fourteen. Interestingly, he didn't receive any fragments from the deaths of Shifty, Scholar and Hero, even though they perished as a result of his machinations. It seems he had to finish an enemy off with his own two hands to absorb a part of their shadow. Well, or at least by summoning an ancient dead god. The process was quite similar to how normal awakened increased their power, with the only difference being that the steps of extracting and consuming the corresponding material, soul shards, were skipped in favor of instant absorption. That meant that shadow fragments could not be stored, and subsequently could not be bought or traded. He won't have an opportunity to receive them as a reward for completing missions, providing services or selling various spoils. If Sonny wanted to grow stronger, his only option was to fight and kill. No peaceful life for me, I guess. Previously, Sonny thought that he at least had the choice to choose a relatively safe path. Many awakened never left the confines of human citadels and never faced nightmare creatures, choosing instead to perform various jobs in the dream realm just as they would in the real world. They received payments in the form of soul shards, which were simultaneously the fuel of one's progression and the universal currency inside the citadels. Sonny was never set on pursuing such a life, but not even having a choice was sort of irritating. Luckily, there was a bright side, too. Without the need to use soul shards to strengthen his core, he would be able to spend everything he earns freely and without concern. After all, after he kills an enemy and absorbs the shadow fragments, the soul shard would still be there, ready to be collected and exchanged for something Sunny might need in the future. That would effectively make him twice as efficient in terms of earning and spending, which was not a small advantage. Additionally, there was the matter of the shadow core. Since both Sunny and his shadow were tied to it, strengthening the core would not only increase Sunny's power, but also enhance the shadow. So, if he were to use it to further empower himself, the actual effect would be stacked, producing a twofold enhancement. So, for each shadow fragment he collected, Sonny would actually be able to rip twice as much benefit as an awakened would from a soul shard. Not bad. Not bad at all. Ah, the future was bright. Provided he survives and gets the opportunity to even have a future, of course. Sitting up, Sonny moved his eyes and found the cluster of runes describing his memories. Azure Blade, had he finally gotten a weapon? Memory, Azure Blade. Memory Rank, Awakened. Memory Type, Weapon. Memory Description, on this forgotten shore, only Steel remembers. Ha! Huh. Interesting. Not very informative, but interesting. Sunny summoned his new weapon, and a sharp, light sword immediately appeared in his hand. It was about a meter long, including the handle. 
The blade was straight and single-edged, ending in an angular tip. It was forged out of azure steel, with a beautiful layered pattern. Deep inside the steel, white sparks could be seen. The crossguard was minimalistic and simple, offering almost no protection to the wielder's hands. If Sonny knew his way around cold weapons, he would have called it a Tang Dao. However, he had no idea about such things, all he could gather was that the blade was single-edged, which meant that it was probably meant for slashing and cutting as opposed to piercing, and that the handle was long enough to accommodate two hands. Also, the sword was pretty. He summoned the shadow and made it wrap itself around the azure blade. Immediately, the steel became bluish-black, with a scattering of white sparks. It looked like a starlit night sky. Sunny stood up and waved the sword a couple of times, getting accustomed to its weight. The sharp edge whistled as it cut the air. Well, now I finally look like a real awakened. After that, he cast a gaze at the corpse of the carapace scavenger and grimaced. Eh, this part was not going to be pleasant. After some time, he managed to break open the cracked carapace and cut away a few strips of tender, pink meat. He also did not forget to extract the radiant crystal from the beast's chest, the soul shard. Without much hope, he tried to absorb the shard, remembering how it was supposed to be done, just as he expected, nothing happened. They're really of no direct use to me. With a shrug, Sunny places the shard and the meat in a makeshift rucksack he weeped from black seaweed and looked at the sun. The day was still young. He still had a good chance of making it to the distant hill before the sea came back. However, his left leg was banged up in the fight with the scavenger beast, so walking wasn't as easy as it was before. He gritted his teeth and began limping. Hours passed. Due to his bruises and increased vigilance, Sonny's progress slowed down considerably. He was sweating and grinding his teeth, feeling pain with each step. What's worse, the further he reached into the labyrinth, the more confusing and entangled the paths became. Even with the shadow's help, he constantly had to backtrack and struggled to move in the right direction. Crap, crap, crap. If nothing changed, Sonny would not reach his goal. Which meant that he'll be crushed to death by the returning sea. Not allowing himself to think about dying, Sonny tried to walk faster. However, he couldn't be too hasty, making a wrong turn would have taken precious minutes away from him, so he had to choose the way carefully. Additionally, missing to notice another ambush could end his life directly. Curses. Just when he was beginning to feel desperate, his shadow suddenly saw something that momentarily sent Sonny into a stupor. Some distance further down the path, beyond a few turns, the corals widened, creating a small clearing. And in the middle of that clearing, someone was walking across the mud. The first thing Sonny saw was fair skin, a lot of skin. The tall, lithe girl was only dressed in a makeshift skirt and a crude brassiere, both made out of seaweed. However, it didn't seem to bother her. With a calm expression, she stopped and looked back. The wind was playing with her short silver hair. It was Nephi's, the changing star. In one hand, she was holding the end of a strange golden rope. And on the other end of the rope, Kasha, the blind girl, was carefully following behind Chapter 35 A Shadow, A Star, and An Oracle. Gray sky above, black mud below, an endless sea of crimson in between. On this dreamlike backdrop, two beautiful girls were walking across the labyrinth. One was delicate and fragile, with blonde hair and cerulean, aimless eyes. She was dressed in a simple tunic, with leather sandals on her feet and a cloak the color of sea waves draped around her shoulders. The other was tall and lithe. She had silky silver hair and clear, gray eyes. Her revealing clothes were crudely made out of black seaweed, leaving her fair skin and athletic build exposed. She was poised, alert, and barefoot. A golden rope connected two girls together. Wow! What a sight, Sonny thought. He suddenly regretted that he was not an artist. The picture just begged to be made into a painting. Wait, why am I thinking about that? People. I found people. His heart skipped a bit. If Nephi's and Kasha were here, then the orange light from before, most likely, had something to do with them. Which meant that they knew how to get to the tall hill. Which meant that Sonny didn't have to be crushed to death by the high tide. Uh, so what do I do now? He wasn't the best at ingratiating himself to other people. In fact, he was the polar opposite people usually instinctively avoided him. And that was in normal circumstances. This time, however, he had spent a whole of four weeks making sure that everyone in the academy hated his guts, 
Good job, Sonny. Still, he was at least useful. In this situation, an additional body was already a great boon when facing hungry monsters. And he wasn't just anyone, his ability to scout ahead alone was worth a lot. Surely they'll understand that, right? With a heavy sigh, Sonny stepped into shadows and hurried to the clearing. He reached it in a minute or so, hiding and observing the two girls before making a final decision. Helping herself with the wooden staff, Blind Kasha slowly approached the middle of the clearing and extended her hand, finding Nephi's and touching her on the shoulder. Why did you stop? Nephi supported the blind girl and glanced at the sky. It's getting late. An awkward pause hung between two girls. After some time, Kasha asked. So you think we should turn back? Nephi's blinked and cleared her throat. Yes. Sunny was a bit amused by their exchange. What is she, a strong silent type? Then he returned to his dilemma and grimaced. How do I approach them? Damn, why is this so hard? It's not like I'm trying to ask them out on a date. I mean, one of them, both of them? What am I thinking about? Just go and say hi. But then, if he suddenly appeared out of the shadows, not at all like a creep, how high was the probability of them getting spooked and attacking him before noticing that he was not a monster? Wait, why would they, arg, to hell with this? Deciding on the safest approach, Sonny commanded his shadow to abandon its hiding place and move to a spot where Nephi's could clearly see it. He could clearly sense the shadow rolling its eyes as it obeyed the order. As soon as the shadow started to move, Nephi suddenly snapped her hand sideways. Immediately, a long sword appeared in it, cutting the air as it assumed a defensive position. Before the shadow could even take two steps out of its hiding spot, it was already pierced by changing star's gray eyes. The shadow froze. It seemed a bit startled. Kasha took a step back. Naf? What is it? Nephi's didn't answer immediately, carefully observing the shadow. Then she simply said. There's a shadow. Kasha's doll-like face paled. A shadow? Scavengers? The tall girl tilted her head a little. No. It's a human shadow. This was clearly not what Kasha expected to hear. With an expression of surprise, she asked. A human shadow? What, what is it doing? Nephi's hesitated. After a while, she answered in a flat tone. It's waving at us. After a whole minute of silence, Kasha finally found the words to react. What? I said, it's waving. Yes, I know. I mean, why is it doing that? Nephi's opened her mouth, then closed it again. I don't know. Maybe it's a distraction to lure us into a trap. At this point, Sonny decided that it was time to talk. He inhaled deeply, then said in a friendly tone. Actually, I just sent it ahead to make sure that you don't stab me with that sword before realizing that I'm human. Immediately, Nephi's turned her head, pinpointing the exact location where Sunny was hiding in a blotch of shadows. Her sword slightly shifted, aiming at the new threat. If you're human, why are hiding in the shadows like a creep? God damn it. I'm not a creep. Sunny hoped. But his flaw was merciless, he had to provide an answer and a truthful one at that. I mean, you're changing star Nephi's. To be honest, I'm a little afraid. Nephi's did not answer. Because of her hard-to-read face, it was almost impossible to determine whether she believed him or not. However, he included her true name in his answer for a reason. If he was some monster pretending to be human, he wouldn't have known it. Luckily, Kasha was more expressive. Are you the boy who sat with me in the cafeteria? Sunny smiled. Meanwhile, Nephi's glanced at the blind girl. Do you know him? Kasha nodded. I recognize his voice. His name is Sunless. He was in second to last place in the rankings, right above me. The tall girl frowned, as if trying to remember. Then she asked. The pervert? The smile disappeared from Sunny's face, replaced by exasperation. Oh, come on. Kasha hesitated and didn't answer. Hey. I'm not really a pervert, you know. I just, um, said a few things. To a few girls. It was all a misunderstanding. Nephi's was silent for a few seconds, and then, finally, dismissed her sword. 
Okay. You can come out. Sonny limped out of the shadows, summoning his own back. It flowed to his feet and reattached itself, visibly shaking. The bastard was laughing at him. Stopping a few meters away from Nephi's, he raised his hands, showing that he didn't mean the girls any harm. Changing star gave him an inquisitive look. What happened to you? She was referring to his limp, bruises, and overall banged-up look. Sunny sighed. Carapace scavenger. Nephi's raised an eyebrow. You managed to get away alive? You bet I did. Sonny subconsciously straightened his back. I didn't get away. I killed it. To prove his point, he gestured at his rucksack, full of delicious monster meat. Nephi's looked him over again, re-evaluating her opinion of him. Now, there were hints of approval in her eyes. Carapace scavengers were only beasts, but they were still awakened. With the addition of their mighty physique and natural armor, defeating one was not an easy feat for any sleeper, who all had a dormant core. Let alone someone from the very bottom of the ranking list. Come to think of it, it was even a bit too outstanding. Sonny lowered his eyes. Eh, it was already wounded. Nephi shrugged. A kill is a kill. You did well. After that, she fell silent, as though not planning to say anything else. Sonny also wasn't sure what to say. Luckily, Kasha came to the rescue. Are you seriously injured? He shook his head. No, it's just that my ribs and leg are bruised, I'll be fine in a day or two. My armor is pretty resilient. He wasn't worried that they might be tempted to kill him to get the puppeteer's shroud. That was because memories were destroyed at the moment of their owner's death. So they only could be transferred voluntarily by a living person. Well, there was always torture and blackmail. But he doubted that any one of the two beautiful girls would stoop to that. Sonny cleared his throat. Before stumbling on the scavenger, I was heading for the tall hill with the massive coral pillar on top. But after the fight, my speed decreased. Now I'm worried about not making it in time. Do you perhaps know the way? Kasha smiled. Actually, we spend the last days on that hill. We were just about to go back. Nephi's didn't say anything, looking at the sky. Sonny licked his lips. Well, can I come with you? They're not going to say no, right? The blind girl turned he head to her companion, a clear question written on her face. Naf? Nephi's lowered her eyes, staring at Sonny. After a while, she said. No. What? Problem. No problem. What's wrong with you, princess? Can't you speak faster? Feeling his heart beating wildly in his chest, Sonny smiled. Well. All right, chapter 36 bonfire. The rest of the way to the tall hill did not take a lot of time. With Nephi's leading the way, taking all the right turns at all the right places, there was no need to explore the labyrinth and backtrack after encountering a dead end. Additionally, there were no scavengers around. In fact, they could have moved ever quicker if not for Kasha, who walked slowly even with the help of her staff. Guided by the golden rope, she carefully explored the ground ahead before taking each step. The uneven paths of the crimson forest were not an ideal surface for a blind person to walk on. Sunny didn't say much, periodically casting an incredulous glance at the strange pair. No matter how he looked at it, Kasha seemed to be dead weight. Perhaps it was cruel to say, but in the merciless reality of the dream realm, misguided kindness was a sure way to end up dead. Before meeting and observing the girls, he still had hoped that Kasha's terrible flaw hid an unexpected and powerful aspect. But from what he saw, it wasn't the case. If she couldn't even walk properly, what kind of power was there to hide? Nothing could outweigh the ruthless fact that the blind girl couldn't protect herself, and thus would only drag her companions down. One had to be a fool or not fond of living to allow that to happen. So, which one of these descriptions suited Nephi's? Somehow, he felt that neither did. The sunset was not far off when they reached the hill. After climbing it and approaching the massive growth of coral, Nephi's dismissed the golden rope and immediately summoned it again. This way, it was untied and appeared in her hands in a neat bundle. Ah. So it's a memory. Sonny wondered what qualities the magical rope had. Soon, his curiosity was satisfied, right in front of his surprised eyes, 
the length of the rope suddenly began to increase. Soon, it was thrice as long as it was before. Nephi's calmly tied both ends of the rope into loops and then threw one of them into the air, accurately coiling it around a prominent protrusion near the top of the coral pillar. Then, she tested if the rope would hold, swiftly climbed up and waved from above, giving Sunny the signal to follow. After hesitating for a second, Sunny approached the rope and grabbed it. He couldn't help thinking that this would be the perfect opportunity to cut his head off. With him helpless while climbing and Nephi standing on the top of the pillar, yeah. The vivid picture appeared in his mind. Stop being paranoid. Sonny thought, trying to calm himself down. It's not that he was sure of changing Star's impeccable moral qualities. Instead, he was certain of one thing, if Nephi's really wanted to kill him, she wouldn't have needed to wait for an opportunity. She could have just cut him into ribbons whenever. Simultaneously scared and reassured by this though, Sonny nimbly climbed up and joined Nephi's at the top of the coral mound. He then turned around and watched curiously, wondering how Kasha was going to get to them. The blind girl dismissed the wooden staff and approached the rope. Then she caught it in a hand, traced it down to the loop at the end, and placed her foot inside. As soon as she was done, Nephi's grabbed the rope and started pulling, lifting Kasha little by little until she had reached the top. She only had to grab Nephi's hand and make a step to join them. Ha! Efficient! The coral mound was much larger than the circular stone platform of the giant knight's neck. In fact, it was almost like a small island. At the highest point of the island, hidden behind some coral blades, the girls had made a little camp. There were piles of seaweed to sleep on, strips of scavenger meat drying under the sun, and a fire pit. Sunny pointed to the makeshift fire pit. Was it you two nights ago? I've seen an orange light in the distance. Kasha's face darkened. Yes, this was the first time we made a fire. But it turned out to be a really bad mistake. Nephi sighed. Sunny raised an eyebrow, surprised. Why? The blind girl touched her hair and turned her head to Nephi's. At night, any light will attract monsters. We were attacked by scavengers first. And then, then. She paled and didn't finish. But she didn't have to, the memory of the colossal tentacle was still fresh in Sonny's mind. It seemed that he was lucky to meet these two when he had. If not, he was certainly going to make a fire tonight to roast some scavenger meat. Ah. Uh, I see. Nephi's looked at the sky and cleared her throat. It should be fine now. We still have time before the sun sets. After that, she got busy making the fire. Kasha simply sat on a pile of seaweed and waited. Not knowing what to do, Sonny lowered himself to the ground and let his tired, bruised body rest. After a while, he said. I have fresh meat in my rucksack. Do you have water? Kasha smiled. Yes. After that, she extended an arm to him. A second later, a beautiful bottle made of patterned blue glass appeared in her hand. That's a memory I have. It's always full. Sunny took the glass bottle and looked at it with envy. An endless supply of water, huh? Sure beats my super loud bell. Thank you. He brought the bottle to his lips and greedily drank the cool, delicious water. Indeed, no matter how much he drank, the amount of water inside did not seem to decrease. Is it really endless? Kasha touched her hair again. Ah, uh, not really. If you turn it upside down and let the water flow, it will stop in half an hour or so. But then it will be full again pretty soon. At that time, Nephi's was already done making the fire. Without looking up, she took Sunny's rucksack and opened it. Immediately, the soul shard rolled out. The tall girl looked at it, then at Sunny. Then she put the shard back in and pulled out the meat. Sunny became tense, preparing a misleading answer. But Nephi's did not ask. So, he pretended like nothing had happened and continued his conversation with Kasha. It's still a great memory. Getting drinkable water is not an easy task. Kasha nodded and smiled, pleased by his words. Soon, the rich smell of roasting meat permeated the air. At the same time, the sun was beginning to approach the horizon, a loud rumble came from somewhere beneath, and first traces of the black water began to appear between crimson walls of the labyrinth. Sunny looked east, where the skies were already growing dark. Then he uncomfortably shifted. Do scavengers come all the way up here? 
Nephis turned the meek and nodded. Yes. But, only at night. In the day, most of them seemed to disappear. Sunny grinned, having an idea of why there weren't a lot of monsters in the labyrinth in the day. That's because they all gather near the place I had been spending my time recently. You should have seen it, the tall cliff, to the west of here. Well, it's actually a statue. Kasha opened her eyes wide. Uh, a statue? But for you to survive, it should be. Yes, it's a giant statue of a knight, at least 200 meters tall. He is missing his head, so I hit on top of the neck. Anyway, the day we were sent here, two sea creatures fought each other near that statue. When the water receded, I saw an enormous carcass lying there, with hundreds of scavengers slowly tearing it apart. Nephi's nodded. That would explain the lack of nightmare creature in the day. How long? Sunny blinked. How long what? Changing Star stared at him for a few seconds, making everyone feel uncomfortable. How long, until they are done devouring the carcass? Oh. One day more, two at most. Nephi's turned away, took the meat away from the fire, and then quickly extinguished it. There's definitely something wrong with that girl. The three of them ate in the dimming light of the twilight. The meat was juicy, tender and indescribably delicious. It was better than anything Sonny had ever tasted, even back in the academy's cafeteria. Of course, his excruciating hunger played a part in that. From time to time, they would pass the glass bottle to each other. When they were finished with their meal, the dark sea was back, and the night was upon them. Everything was consumed by absolute darkness. Of course, Sunny could easily see both Nephi's and Kasha. Under the cover of the night, Changing Star remained pretty much the same. The blind girl, however, allowed her true emotions to show, thinking that no one would see. She seemed much more lost, lonely and frightened than she did in the day. As if trying to resist these feelings, Kasha said in a bright voice. How about we formally introduce ourselves? I'm Cassie. Nephi's glanced in her direction and shrugged. Neff. Next, it was Sonny's turn. He exhaled, glad that they didn't ask his name directly. Most likely, he would still have been able to provide his human name, however, it also might have depended on the wording of the question. Relieved, he smiled and answered. I'm Sunless. But you can call me Sunny. Chapter 37 Getting to Know Each Other Sunny was slowly growing fond of having conversations in the dark. Without the burden of light, people were more relaxed and honest. It reminded him of the frequent blackouts that used to sweep through the city when he was a little kid. His family had no choice but to huddle together and spend a few hours doing nothing but talking to each other. Now, these dark hours had become some of his most precious memories. He was silent for a few moments and then said, since we're going to be depending on each other, should we share what abilities and memories we have at our disposal? This was a logical suggestion. If they were going to fight side by side, knowing each other's strengths was more or less vital. Still, he noticed Nephi's glancing in his direction with a guarded look on her face. Luckily, he was obscured by darkness. I'll start, Sonny said, both to show his sincerity and to reveal information about himself in a controlled manner. If he took the initiative to talk, he still had to tell the truth, but how much and to what extent was still for him to decide. If they were to ask and he had to answer, however, things would become unpredictable. My attributes give me an affinity to shadows. I also have a slight affiliation to divinity. Lastly, I am prone to finding myself in unlikely situations. Cassie listened carefully and then lowered her head, as though embarrassed. Ah, uh, he is telling the truth. Not that we doubted your honesty. Why not? I spent so much time earning the reputation of a pathological liar. Sonny cleared his throat and smiled, hiding his nervousness. Really? That's good to know. But, why are you so sure that I am being honest? The blind girl shifted a little. Oh. That's my ability. I can see people's attributes. Sometimes, I also receive, uh, visions. They can be about the future or the past. I mean, that's what I think, it only happened a couple of times. Sunny swallowed, but then relaxed. So, she is an oracle of sorts. Luckily, her insight is limited to attributes, otherwise, I'd be in real trouble. 
Still, I'll have to be careful around her. He finally realized how the blind girl had known about his birthday. The question was whether she had seen it in a vision of the future or in a vision of the past. If it was the former, was it safe to assume that he would certainly be able to celebrate at least one more birthday? Or did knowing the future actually affected and changed it? For example, after learning that he was definitely going to survive, Sonny might have naturally relaxed and lowered his guard. Then, he would die as the result of it. It surely seemed possible, right? That's assuming that the future could be changed. But maybe it wasn't? Then, feeling his head hurting, Sonny decided to avoid this line of thought for now. Instead, he hid his inner turmoil and said in a friendly tone. That's a good ability. Speaking of abilities, you have already seen mine. My shadow can move independently and explore. It can't affect the material world, but we share sight and hearing. That way, I can spot danger before encountering it. The shadow is fast and stealthy, it can go anywhere and is almost impossible to notice. Oh, I can also see in the dark. He smiled, expecting the girls to understand and appreciate the utility of his shadow scout. Their reaction, however, was a bit strange, Nephi slowly turned her head in his direction, while Cassie became a bit pale and raised her hands to cover her chest. Uh, what? Nephi's frowned and said in a flat tone. Have you ever used your ability in the academy? Sonny blinked. What a strange question. In the academy? Sure, of course. Why? Oh, right, they think that I'm a pervert. Crap. Before the girls could say anything, he hurriedly raised his hand and blurted. But I have never used it to do anything improper. You have to believe me. Fortunately, it was the honest truth. However, both Nephi's and Cassie looked skeptical. Sonny gritted his teeth. I had more important things to do then, than whatever you're thinking about. I spent almost every waking hour learning how to survive. Nephi's raised an eyebrow. I haven't seen you in class, even once. Sonny chuckled. Of course, you didn't. While you were busy wiping the floor with other sleepers, I was studying wilderness survival. It was changing stars turned to blink. Wilderness? What? There is such a course? Cassie seemed equally puzzled. Yes, there is. It might seem like an afterthought for most people, but for an outskirts kid like me, who never went to a fancy school or saw a private tutor, learning how to survive in the wilderness is the difference between life and death. Without it, I would have drowned the moment we were sent to the dream realm. On a rare occasion, Nephi's looked completely bewildered. She rubbed her wrists and stared thoughtfully in his direction. I see. I didn't know. Sonny grimaced and struggled to keep the venom from sipping into his voice. When he finally spoke, his tone was light and amiable. That's okay. It's natural for someone of your status not to know. When he mentioned her status, a strange smile appeared on the changing star's face. But in the end, she didn't reply. Sonny continued. Anyway, that's my ability. As for memories, I have three. One is an armor, one is a sword, and the last one is a really loud bell. Now it was their turn to share. After a short pause, Nephi spoke. My attributes give me an affinity to light and fire, as well as a strong affiliation to divinity. I have two memories, a rope. While she was speaking, Sonny was looking at Cassie, trying to read her expression. From what he saw, Nephi's was telling the truth, but also, not the whole truth. And judging by how hard the blind girl was trying to hide her true feelings, the secret hiding among changing stars' attributes was not at all trivial. Interesting. And a sword. The rope is very sturdy and can change its length. The sword is very sharp and can protect its wielder against soul's attacks, to a certain extent. My ability can be used to heal. Sonny didn't miss the wording of the last part. Can be used to heal, does this mean that its main purpose was something else? He was pretty sure that Nephi's would not reveal all of her cards, just like him. However, healing abilities were extremely rare. Having one that could heal, but was not limited to healing, that would be simply unheard of. But then again, she was changing Star, one of the few people in history to receive a true name in the first nightmare. 
If Sonny were to consider his own aspect ability, nothing seemed impossible. I wonder what her aspect rank is. Outwardly, he pretended to be excited. You're a healer? That's great. Having a healer among us is incredible luck. Cassie nodded and smiled. Neff is also an amazing fighter. You should have seen her dealing with those scavengers. Well, I also did not actually see it. But it sounded very scary. Sonny didn't need anyone to tell him how formidable of a warrior Nephi's was. He had seen it with how own two eyes. Sort of. Actually, they were his shadow's eyes. Well, whatever it had instead of eyes. Meanwhile, Cassie sighed, it's my turn? Uh, my attributes are nothing special. I guess I have an affinity to revelations and fate. My ability is like I told you before. It's not very useful. About my memories, I have three, the bottle, the wooden staff and this armor. You already know about the bottle. The staff can create wind. The armor is actually of the awakened rank, uh, Neff gave it to me when we met. It has a very powerful, protective charm. So, she's not only carrying Cassie on her back, she even gave away her only clothes? An awakened rank armor, at that? What, what is Nephi's thinking about? The blind girl turned away and added after a while. I used to be a pretty decent fencer, before. Now I can't really fight. The last two sentences were obviously related to her flaw. Sonny and Nephi's, however, both chose to keep their secret. Despite the fact that knowing your companion's flaw was also important for cooperation and having each other's backs, sharing something like that demanded a very high level of trust. Right now, there was no trust between them. And even if there was, Sonny did not plan to ever share his flaw with anyone. Nephi's, too, seemed to have a lot of secrets. After a while, he said. Good. That's good. I think we have enough tools to survive, provided we use them right. I guess it's time to sleep? In the darkness, Nephi's tilted her head, listening to his words with a distant look. All right. I'll take watch first. Sonny decided to be helpful and said. Actually, my shadow doesn't sleep. It can wake us up if something happens. Changing Star slowly smiled. I'll take watch first. Feeling a bit of coldness in her voice, Sunny sighed and shrugged. Suit yourself. What are you going to watch, huh? You can't even see anything. Whatever. Just don't blame me when something giant swallows us in the middle of the night. Then he suddenly shuddered. Wait, that was not a death flag, right? Right, of course not. No way, chapter 38 questions in the dark. Sleep was avoiding Sunny. For a while, he sat silently in the darkness, listening to the calming rumbling of the waves. In this rare moment of respite, memories of the past few days came flooding into his mind. However, he was too tired to seriously think about anything. He was warm, full, and relatively safe. For now, that was more than enough. Soon, the rhythm of Kasha's breathing changed, indicating that she fell asleep. Nephi's was guarding the camp, motionless and, as always, a bit distant. With her silver hair and fair skin, she looked like an alabaster statue. Sonny sighed. He struggled for a bit, and then said quietly. Hey. Can I ask you a question? Nephi's glanced at him and shrugged. The lack of an audible response clearly indicated that she remembered about his ability to see in the dark. Sure. Would it be too personal? Sonny hesitated. I thought you legacies come into the spell with a whole inherited arsenal of memories. I mean, that's supposed to be your main advantage. How come you only had three? Nephi's was silent for a few moments. Actually, I only had two. The rope came from Cassie. He raised an eyebrow. Oh. I see. Realizing that her answer wasn't really an answer, Nephi's thought for a while and added. We lost most of our memories when my father passed away. The ones that remained were sold one by one over the years, to keep the family afloat. This sword and armor came from my first nightmare. So that's how it was. Sonny realized that the fall of the immortal flame clan might have been more thorough than he had thought. 
Still, something about it didn't make sense. Surely, with your clan's reputation and standing, there were other ways to make money. Without any strong reaction, Nephi simply said. There were other reasons. Then, she unexpectedly turned her head in his direction. Can I ask you a question in return? Sunny swallowed. Yeah, go ahead. Nephi tilted her head. How did you know that I'm a legacy? What? That's it? Simple. I heard Castor mention it. He was scolding other sleepers to make them treat you with respect. She gave him a nod and turned away. What thoughts were hidden behind her calm gray eyes, Sonny did not know. Some time had passed before he gathered enough courage to ask the question that he really wanted to ask. Before doing it, though, he made sure that Cassie was sound asleep and lowered his voice. Can I ask another question? Without getting a negative response, he continued. Why are you burdening yourself with her? A corner of Changing Star's mouth curled up slightly. Why? Wouldn't you? Sonny gritted his teeth, feeling the flaw pushing the truthful answer out of his mouth. No. To be honest, he wanted to believe to the last moment that the answer would be yes. But one of the things he had lost after the nightmare was the ability to lie to himself. Truth was merciless. It's not that Sonny did not pity the blind girl or didn't want to help her. It's just that he knew with certainty that it was simply not something he could do. He was barely able to save himself, let alone carry a helpless person across the dream realm. If he tried, they would just die together. Still, he couldn't help but be a little disappointed in himself. Nephi's, however, did not seem to judge him. She showed no reaction at all. After a few moments, she simply said, because I want to. Because, she wants to? That was not the response Sonny expected to hear. He was pretty sure that she would either lecture him about virtue and compassion or disclose some obscure way to make Cassie's seemingly weak ability incredibly useful. However, she did neither. Nephi's expected him to believe that she was putting her life in danger, to the point of sacrificing an awakened armor-type memory, because that was something she simply wanted to do. Ridiculous. At first, he dismissed her response as a non-answer. But the more he thought about it, the more disturbed he felt. Because, maybe, it was actually the truth. Due to the circumstances of his life, Sonny had never really done things because he wanted to. Most of the time, he was doing them because he needed to. It was never a question of want, it was always a question of must. For him, this was a basic rule of life. But was it really? Or was it just a matter of perspective? Nephi's had certain advantages in her upbringing, but they weren't as ample as he had imagined. She had no wealth and no arsenal of relics to empower her. However, she did have a mentality that was different from Sonny's. It wasn't impossible for her to have the audacity to disregard need in favor of something as frivolous as desire, and do things that a normal person like Sonny would never do, like helping a blind girl simply because that was what Nephi's wanted to do. Perhaps, that mentality was the greatest advantage of all. Perhaps, that was the real barrier that separated legacies from the rest of them. That was a lot to think about. However, before Sonny could gather his thoughts, Nephi suddenly spoke again. My turn. Ah, uh, does she mean it's her turn to ask a question? Indeed, that was what she meant. Changing Star once again turned to Sonny and, after a long pause, suddenly asked. Do you know the legend of Odysseus? A what, who? What sort of a weird question is that? Bewildered, Sonny shook his head. Then, remembering that she couldn't see him, he said. No. Nephi sighed and turned away. A few moments later, she softly said. Odysseus was a hero in an ancient war. In the legends, some humans back then had powers akin to the awakened. Achilles with an aspect of indestructible body, Diomedes that was so ferocious even the god of war was wary of him, Ajax who was as strong as a giant. Odysseus was not the strongest, and not the bravest. However, he was the most cunning. Sonny blinked, staring at the silver-haired girl. What? Where did this come from? Why is she suddenly so eloquent? Meanwhile, Nephi's continued. In the end, Odysseus's cunning ended the war, and he prepared to sail home. 
However, the gods cursed him to endlessly wander the seas, never to return. Over the years, he survived one horror after another and lost all of his companions. Then, shipwrecked, he found himself on an island where the beautiful fairy, Calypso, lived. Changing stars' ethereal, strangely wistful voice resounded in the darkness, creating an enthralling atmosphere. Sonny couldn't help but listen with the utmost attention. Calypso fell in love with Odysseus and invited him to her palace. For many years, they lived together in harmony. The island was like a paradise, filled with all kinds of wonders, delicacies, and delights. As long as loving Calypso was by his side, Odysseus was even immortal. But, the longer he stayed, the more time he spent sitting on the shore, looking at the sea with bleak eyes. Nephi smiled. In the end, Odysseus built a makeshift boat and abandoned the island, leaving all its delights, the beautiful fairy, and even his immortality behind. So, my question is, why did he leave? Sonny blinked. What? What kind of a mind game was that? He even considered that Nephi's was mocking him, but it didn't seem to be the case. It looked like she was sincerely interested in the answer. Weirdo. He thought for a bit, and then said without too much conviction. Maybe it was because he was far away from home? A fleeting smile appeared on Nephi's face. Far away, from home. H.M. all right. After that, she turned away and lowered he head, becoming like a statue again. It seemed like their conversation was over. Grumbling internally, Sonny lay down and tried to fall asleep. However, the image of bleak-eyed Odysseus kept appearing in his mind. After a while, he whispered. Well, did he make it back home? Soon, Nephi's replied. Yes. He returned to his wife and son, and they lived happily ever after. Satisfied, Sonny smiled and turned on his side. When he was already half asleep, he heard Changing Star's quiet voice one again. This time, it was barely audible and aimless, as though not directed at anyone. Odysseus was the first human to break the will of gods. In the morning, Sonny and Nephi's were the first to get up. While the sun was rising and the sea was retreating, they made a fire and began preparing a simple breakfast. With Kasha still asleep, they did not talk to each other much. It was like the last night's conversation did not happen. However, after some time, they somehow ended up discussing the plan for the next few days. Nephi's had some ideas. With what you told us about scavengers crowding to the west, the logical step would be to start moving east as soon as we can. Of course, north and south are also acceptable, but that won't put as much space between us and the enemy. Sonny nodded, agreeing with that logic. We have explored to the east a little, but not enough to confidently make it to the next high point in a day. That's why the best course of action would be to spend today scouting a path to that group of cliffs over there and move the camp tomorrow. He sighed. Do you have any idea where we are? Would there be a human citadel to the east? Nephi shook her head. I've never heard of a region that fits the characteristics of this place. In any case, we have to move to find out more. We'll either find a citadel, encounter an unconquered gateway, or die. East is as good of a direction as any. Plus, it's the safest, because there's a horde of monsters to the west. At that point, Cassie suddenly sat up straight. Her eyes were wide open, and her face was a little pale. She looked nervous and excited. Nephi's frowned. Cassie? What's the matter? The blind girl turned to them and smiled. Ah, uh, a vision. I had a vision. Like, a prophetic dream? Sonny thought, trying to come to terms with this new reality of someone being able to see the future. Or the past. Meanwhile, Changing Star stretched her hand, as though prepared to summon her sword. Are we in danger? Cassie energetically shook her head. No, it's not that. People. I saw a castle full of people. She smiled and pointed with her finger. I don't know how far it is, but I'm sure that it's in that direction. Sonny and Nephi's looked at each other, not knowing whether to be glad or petrified. Cassie's small, delicate finger was confidently pointing west, chapter 39 journey to the west. In the ensuing silence, the smile slowly disappeared from Cassie's face, replaced by confusion. Feeling the sudden tension, she asked. Ah, uh, what's wrong? Sonny sighed. No, nothing is wrong. 
It's just that that direction is the one we wanted to avoid. After some thought, he added. That's where I came from yesterday. There's a lot of scavengers down there. The blind girl's face fell. Oh. Nephi's, who was quietly listening to them, gave him an indecipherable look and finally spoke. Tell us more about the castle. A shadow of the previous excitement returned to Cassie's eyes. With a serious nod, she began describing her vision. I dreamt of a vast, ruined city built of weathered stone. It was surrounded by tall, impregnable walls. Various monsters were wandering its narrow streets. In the center of the city, there was a hill, and on that hill stood a magnificent castle. She smiled, but there were no monsters in the castle. Instead, it was full of people. I think, no, I'm sure that they were awakened. Some were guarding the walls, some were going about their lives without a care in the world. There was food, safety, and laughter. Well, that sounds great. If this castle really existed, then all of their problems would be solved. Sonny cleared his throat. Did you see anything else? Cassie frowned, trying to remember. Then, her face cleared. Yes. I saw Sonny leading me through the gates of the castle. That means we will make it. A brilliant smile appeared on her doll-like face, beaming with so much joy that Sonny couldn't help but curl his lips. Inwardly, however, he was stuck on a certain detail of Cassie's vision. It was that, when talking about reaching the castle, the blind girl only mentioned the two of them. Was there some meaning behind it? Sonny turned his head a little and secretly glanced at Nephi's, trying to discern if she had picked up on that little discrepancy, too. Changing star, however, was as enigmatic as ever. Without showing much emotion, she thought for a while, and then slowly nodded. Okay. Then we will go west. While the sea was still retreating, they had their breakfast and then spent some time planning for the journey and preparing to abandon the temporary camp. In the process, Sonny had a chance to get to know the girls a little better. It was then that he came to a sudden realization, which almost made his head explode from bafflement. That mind-blowing realization had to do with Nephi's. Back when they first met in front of the academy's gates, Sonny had formed a certain impression of the confident, distant girl. Later, her behavior and the different revelations about changing stars past only served to reinforce that impression. Nephi seemed to exist a bit apart from the world. She was mysterious, aloof, and rather cool. Her taciturn character and strange speech patterns made people interacting with her feel unnerved and rattled, often revealing more than they had been planning to. The less she talked, the more she seemed to know. That silent, indifferent confidence was arresting, and sometimes even oppressive. However, that impression turned out to be completely wrong. The actual truth behind the matter had nothing to do with being cool and aloof. After talking to her a bit more and observing their interactions with Cassie, Sonny almost fainted when he realized that Nephi's was simply an incredibly, ridiculously, painfully awkward person. It was as though she had no idea how to talk to people. Every time she tried to convey something, she would either use the wrong words or stumble in the middle of the sentence and fall silent. Her tone never matched what she was trying to say. Often, she would forget to put correct intonations in her speech, making questions sound like statements or vice versa. Added to that was the fact that, like many introverted people, Nephi's was not in a habit of openly showing her emotions. It's not that she didn't have feelings, it's just that she was really bad at emoting them. As a result, her face always looked cold and neutral. That's why, most of the time, she simply chose to talk as little as possible or not to talk at all. All of that added up together, then multiplied by her general weirdness, was ultimately responsible for creating the false image of a mysterious, unapproachable ice princess. When in fact, she was just shy and completely inept in communicating with people. After coming to that realization, Sonny tried with all his might but still failed to stop himself from staring at Nephi's with wide eyes. He just barely managed to not let his jaw hang open. What the hell? That's not in line with how a protagonist should be. In his mind, Nephi's had definitely been the type of person to be the main character of any event. At the center stage, there were always confident, strong people like her and Castor. People like himself and Cassie, on the other hand, were relegated to exist far away in the background. Now, however, no, that line of thought was also wrong. 
The fact that Changing Star had problems with expressing herself and lacked social skills did not mean that she was not strong. In fact, it might have meant the opposite. She still achieved everything that she had achieved, but with the added layer of adversity, she was still dangerous. At that moment, Nephi finally noticed that Sunny was staring at her. She looked at him and, after a long pause, asked in an emotionless tone. What? He blinked, extricating himself from this sudden flood of thoughts, and cleared his throat. Ah, uh, nothing. I was just going to ask when are we setting off? Nephi appeared to be thinking. After a while, she turned away and said. Soon. You, you really can't manage more than one word, can you? Utterly bewildered, Sonny hid his emotions and smiled. Ah. All right then. In the gray light of morning, they abandoned the tall hill and ventured west, retracing their steps from yesterday. Knowing the path, the small party made quick progress. Nephi's was walking in front, her sword arm ready to strike at any moment. A bit behind her was Sunny. This time, the responsibility of holding the golden rope and guiding Cassie along was entrusted to him. Of course, the actual person, creature? Leading them was his shadow. It scouted ahead, carefully observing the labyrinth for signs of danger. The labyrinth was just as it was before, confusing and seemingly endless. Crimson blades of coral protruded from the black mud, creating a vast, tangled forest. However, today something about it felt different. It wasn't long before the shadow stumbled onto a mass of hulking, hungry scavengers, Chapter 40 Weak Point. Halt! Sunny whispered, observing the group of scavengers through his shadow. As soon as the word left his lips, Nephi's immediately summoned her sword. After studying the surroundings for a second, she turned her head and glanced at him with a question in her eyes. Kasha, meanwhile, froze in place and hesitantly raised her staff. Sunny counted the monsters, one, two, three, five. Curses! The hulking beasts seemed like the losers of the pack, similar to the one he had killed. However, their wounds were not as pronounced and terrible. Each of them was much more of a threat than the mangled one from before, and there were half a dozen of them at least. There are scavengers on the path ahead, six of them. They're slowly moving in our direction. Nephi's cast a gaze forward. There was a calculating look on her face. They're done with the carcass? Sonny thought for a moment and then shook his head. No, I don't think so. But maybe there's not enough meat for everyone anymore, so some stragglers had no choice but to leave with an empty stomach. Nephi's nodded and gestured to a nearby branching path. We'll circle around them. The three sleepers hastily moved forward and changed paths, giving a wide berth to the group of monsters. Tense and grim, they continued walking, trying to stay on course and not get lost in the labyrinth. However, in the next hour, they had to turn in a random direction again and again, avoiding other scavengers. The distance between them and the giant statue was not shortening at all. At some point, they were catching their breath near one of the numerous dead ends of the Crimson Labyrinth. They had no choice but to wait, since a large number of creatures was moving past their hiding spot, separated from them by a long length of a twisting coral passage. Sunny sighed and shook his head. We can't go on like that. At this rate, we'll never make it to safety before sunset. Cassie was the first one to react. Maybe, maybe we should turn back? That was a reasonable suggestion. However, Sonny felt reluctant to agree. Nephi shared his thoughts. With a blank expression, she said. It will only get harder tomorrow. She was right. By tomorrow, there would be even more scavengers flooding the labyrinth. Then what should we do? Changing Star tilted her head, thinking. After a while, she turned to Sunny. Fight. Fight? Fight against dozens of those monstrosities? Was she crazy? Sonny tried to hide his derision as he spoke. I know that you are skilled with the sword, but have you forgotten that each of those things is a whole rank above us? We won't survive in a fight against many. Nephi's nodded. We avoid large groups. Cut down smaller ones. After a moment, she added. If there's one or two of them, there's a chance. Sonny wanted to retort, but couldn't find a good reason. In the end, he gave up. Fine. Nephi stared at him for a while. Then, she suddenly asked. 
Have you studied the corpse of the scavenger you had killed? What was that supposed to mean? A bit surprised, Sonny shook his head. No. He was too busy being in pain and trying to make it to safety before the sea returned. And why would he study a corpse? Wait. I think teacher Julius mentioned something. After a short pause, Nephi spoke. Scavengers have three weak points on their bodies. The first one is obvious, it's their joints. Anything that has to be flexible can't be too rigid. So, there's gaps in the armor above the joints. By targeting the joints, you can diminish their mobility and attack capacity. Oh, so, by studying a dead monster, one could better understand their strengths and vulnerabilities. This idea was so obvious that Sonny admonished himself for not realizing sooner. Meanwhile, Nephi's continued. The second one is the same. It's where their torso connects to the carapace. If you manage to accurately hit that spot, you can heavily injure a scavenger and deal serious damage to its body. However, unless you succeed in severing its spine, the wound won't be fatal. It'll still be able to fight for a while. Sunny couldn't help but notice that Changing Star's awkwardness seemed to disappear whenever she talked about things that she felt confident about, like ancient heroes. Or killing things. Curious. The last weak point is on their back, approximately at the level where the eyes are. There's a slightly concave, discolored cavity in their armor. It is where several armor plates connect. The chitin there is comparatively thin. If you can pierce through it, you can destroy the brain directly. That will be a killing blow. That is good to know. However, that weak point was too high to be hit by a human, after all, scavengers were more than two meters tall. As though reading his thoughts, Nephi's added. That weak point is very hard to target. Circling around a scavenger is almost impossible due to their size, speed and the attack range of their pincers. She looked at him and calmly said. If we stumble on a single scavenger, I'll be the bait. My task will be to make it turn around and then restrain it, exposing the third weak point. Your task will be to kill it. Sunny gulped. What if there's two of them? As usual, Nephi's paused before answering. Don't die. It wasn't long before they were left with no choice but to attempt to fight against a scavenger. Behind them, there was a long stretch of the labyrinth with no suitable branching paths for them to turn onto. Ahead of them, there was a small clearing with only one other passage leading out of it. Not far into that passage, a massive scavenger was moving slowly in their direction. Sunny quickly described the situation and waited for changing Star's feedback. Without much delay, she gave him a nod. We fight in the clearing. After that, Nephi's gently guided Cassie to the wall of the labyrinth and helped her find a place to sit. Wait here. We'll be back. After some thought, she added. Soon. As Nephi's moved to walk away, Cassie grabbed her hand. Her face was pale and tense. Neff, you, be careful, okay? Nephi's blinked and tilted her head a little. Then, she smiled. Ah. Uh, sure. With that, she and Sunny hastily headed for the clearing. By the time they got there, the scavenger was seconds from appearing. Sonny's shadow flew out of the passage and reattached itself to his feet. Without having to discuss things with Nephi's, he quickly hid in the shadows and waited there, hoping for a chance to attack. Nephi's, on the other hand, strolled to the center of the clearing and calmly stood there, her shoulders relaxed and her back straight. An elegant longsword appeared in her hands, carelessly pointed to the ground. Not knowing what else to do, Sonny silently repeated her words. Don't die. A second later, the scavenger walked into the clearing. When his tiny eyes spotted Nephi's, an evil light ignited in them. Without wasting even a second, the massive monster screeched and rushed forward to attack. Its huge pincer shot forward with terrifying speed, tearing the air in its path. Nephi swiftly sidestepped, dodging the pincer, then leaped backward, removing herself from the path of the rushing monster. Simultaneously, her sword flashed in the air, cutting deep into the joint of one of the scavenger's front legs. Azure blood spattered on the ground. Of course, this small wound was too insignificant to slow the scavenger down. With surprising agility, it twisted and delivered a crushing sideways swipe. Nephi's, who just barely landed on her feet, had no choice but to deflect the blow with her sword. 
She managed to disperse most of the impact by holding the blade at the right angle, but the remaining force was still enough to throw her off balance. At that moment, the second pincer came down. Instead of trying to regain her equilibrium, Changing Star went with the fall and somersaulted over one hand, ending up distancing herself from the monster a bit. Her sword lashed out again. The follow-up attack followed almost immediately. However, Sunny did not care about the details anymore. The only thing he cared about was that, through this risky series of dodges and leaps, Nephi's had managed to circle to the opposite side of the clearing, forcing the scavenger to turn its back to the shadow in which he hid. It's now or never. Gritting his teeth, Sunny lunged forward. Before Changing Star finished her last dodge. Before the scavenger's pincer crashed on her from above. Before Sunny had time to become scared. He closed the distance between himself and the monster and jumped with all his might, landing on top of its carapace. Then, he used all of his weight to thrust a hand forward. Azure Blade shimmered into existence in his grip and was immediately swallowed by the shadow. A breath later, the dark blade hit precisely into the concave, discolorated cavity in the scavenger's armor. With a crack, the chitin broke, allowing the tip of the sword to sink deep into the scavenger's body. The monster shuddered, and then heavily fell to the ground. Sunny was thrown from its carapace, landing in the mud with a roll. That, that easy? It was already over? As though to answer him, the spell's voice resounded in the air. You have slain an awakened beast, carapace scavenger. Your shadow grows stronger. Chapter 41 Strength in Numbers Sunny was sprawled in the mud, looking at the sky. He didn't even have to catch his breath since the whole fight took less than 10 seconds from start to finish. No one was dead, wounded or even bruised, well, with the exception of the scavenger. It was completely out of his expectations. He glanced at the monster's corpse to make sure that it was actually dead, then summoned the runes and took a look at the number of shadow fragments in his possession. Shadow fragments, 16 slash 1000. It was actually true. The mighty awakened beast perished just like that. And, although Nephi's did most of the work, he was the one to deal the killing blow. Why can't it always be so easy? Sonny got back on his feet and dismissed the Azure Blade. Then, he remembered the words Master Jet had once told him, no one can survive in the dream realm alone. Back then, he noted her advice, but didn't really believe it. After all, he had always strived to be self-sufficient, not allowing himself to depend on anyone. In Sonny's mind, this was the true meaning of strength. However, now he was beginning to suspect that this logic was flawed. Indeed, having someone to share your burdens meant the difference between heaven and hell here in the dream realm. If he was alone, fighting against a single scavenger might have been the end of him. Similarly, even though Nephi's was far more skilled than Sunny, it would have been extremely hard for her to defeat the armored monster alone, being that its weakest point was out of her reach. But together, they had accomplished it with relative ease. The whole was greater than the sum of the parts. In other words, there was strength in numbers that surpassed individual power. In that sense, being able to depend on a group was not a sign of weakness, but, on the contrary, an important facet of personal strength. Lone wolves would always be at a disadvantage. That was another lesson to learn. It's not like I had much of a choice. He walked over to Nephi's and checked if she was okay. Apart from slight damage to her makeshift seaweed clothes, everything seemed to be all right. She glanced at Sunny. Memory? He shook his head. Nephi sighed. It seemed that she was a bit impatient to get herself a suit of armor of her own. If Sonny was a gentleman, he would have suggested to loan her the puppeteer shroud for a while, but alas, he wasn't. That armor was extremely valuable and had cost him a lot. Plus, unlike Changing Star, the picture of Sonny wearing nothing but a seaweed loincloth would have been more disturbing than aesthetically pleasing. So, he said nothing. Meanwhile, Nephi's headed for the dead scavenger and said without turning her head. Bring Cassie. With a sigh, Sonny turned around and left the clearing. Soon, he approached the place where the blind girl was waiting patiently for their return. Hearing his footsteps, she flinched and raised her head. S. Sonny? How did she recognize me? Ah, must be the way I walk. Yeah, it's me. Everything is over. Come on, I'll bring you to Nephi's. Using the wooden staff, Cassie stood up and turned to him. R, are you guys all right? 
Sunny smiled. Of course. We dispatched that critter in no time. Didn't even get a scratch. Cassie smiled with visible relief. Good, that's good. Oh, right, the rope. Sonny took the rope and guided the blind girl back to the clearing. On the way, he felt a bit weird. With the delicate girl walking behind him, he couldn't help but think of his little sister. As a toddler, she used to follow him around too, as though they were glued together. As the familiar pain stabbed him in the heart, Sonny gritted his teeth and tried to think about something else. It was all in the past anyway. Back in the clearing, Nephi's was done breaking apart the scavenger's carapace. The shimmering soul shard was already in her hand. Without saying anything, she tossed it to Sonny. He caught the crystal and looked at her with surprise. Why are you giving it to me? Nephi's blinked and stayed quiet for a few seconds. Then she said, as a matter of fact. I don't have pockets. Oh. Still a bit bewildered, Sonny put the soul shard into his rucksack, but why wouldn't she just absorb it? He opened his mouth to ask the question, but she seemed to realize something and added. We'll divide the spoils later. Ah. All right. Nephi's, meanwhile, turned to Cassie and said after some deliberation. I was careful. Then, she smiled. Your shadow grows stronger. Your shadow grows stronger. Your shadow grows stronger. Sonny was feeling somewhere in between of being ecstatic and peeved. Throughout the day, they managed to kill three more scavengers, each time with not much risk to anyone except for Nephi's. The process was largely the same, after discovering the monster, he would hide in the shadows, while Nephi's would act as bait. Then, when the time was right, Sonny would stealthily approach and finish the fight with a precise strike of the azure blade. He was wondering if that was what being in the main hero's party felt like. To anyone else, maybe with the exception of Castor, dancing around a deadly awakened beast would have been a tall task, most likely ending with the dancer's death. Nephi's, however, had managed to do it over and over again seemingly without too much strain. What's more, her performance was based solely on skill, with no aspect ability involved. In that regard, even Castor couldn't have done better. She was swift, calm and precise. Every move she made was calculated and perfectly timed. She seemed to innately understand the flow and logic of combat, which gave her the ability to roughly predict what actions the mindless beasts would perform in the next seconds. Then it was just the question of physical prowess to evade and even manipulate them to a certain degree. Sunny had always known that skill and experience were more important than raw power, but by watching Nephi's, he vividly understood just how vast the difference between them was. Even though his divine aspect allowed Sonny to exert more strength and speed than Changing Star, in an actual fight, he would never stand a chance. Of course, he was also an important part of every encounter. His role as the finisher was not trivial, and not just anybody would have been able to accomplish four kills with four strikes. Even though Sonny was not taught any elaborate techniques, he was still a somewhat experienced fighter. He had good physical coordination, combat intuition, and most importantly, a cool-headed mentality. Not to mention the fact that they were only able to ambush the scavengers so effectively due to his shadow scouting them out in advance. All in all, it was an almost equal cooperation. Still, watching Nephi's fight was nothing short of sobering. Trying not to get too dejected, Sunny summoned the runes. Shadow Fragments, 22-1000. Eight Fragments Today. Pretty excellent. Currently, they were waiting on the edge of the labyrinth path leading directly to the giant statue of the Headless Knight. There was a group of scavengers between them and the statue moving past without any haste. The sunset was near, but they still had time. Slowly, minutes flowed by. At some point, Nephi's gave the command to move. Helping Cassie along, Sunny followed Changing Star and quickly traversed the open space between the labyrinth and the statue. Now, they only had to get on top of it. However, it wasn't that easy. Scaling the 200-meter-tall monument would have been hard in normal circumstances, but now, they also had to somehow pull Cassie up. Leaving her behind until they were at the top would not have been safe. In the end, Nephi's and Sunny took turns pulling the rope every 20 meters or so. Cassie would hold onto the rocks and wait until they climbed higher, and then the process would repeat. It was slow and torturous, and by the end, Sonny's muscles were sore and almost on fire. But they managed to get to safety before the dark waters washed them away. 
As the night began to descend, the three sleepers sat in the center of the circular stone platform and rested. As they did not bring any materials to make a fire and it was already too late, there was no way to cook food. They ended up chewing on the strips of dried meat, passing the bottle of limitless water around. After some time, Nephi's gave Sonny a sign to take out the spoils of today's journey. He took out the four shimmering soul shards and put them on the ground. Without any discussion, Changing Star moved two crystals in his direction and took two for herself. Then, she gave one of hers to Kasha. Sonny watched it in silence. By the time Nephi's and Cassie had absorbed their soul shards, he still didn't make a move to take his. After a while, he took another crystal out of the rucksack and moved all three to Nephi's. The silver-haired girl looked at him with surprise. Don't you want to grow stronger? Sonny grinned. Of course, I do. But these won't do me much good right now. It's no secret that you are the main fighting force of our group. He sighed. The stronger you are, the better our chances of survival will get. Plus, it's not a gift. It's a trade. Nephi's raised an eyebrow. A uh, trade? What do you want? Sonny deliberated for a few seconds before answering. It's rather simple. I will give you these soul shards, and all other soul shards I earn on the way to that castle. Then, he looked her in the eyes and said. In return, you will teach me how to fight. Chapter 42 Essence of Combat Nephi's looked at him and contemplated. This time, she remained silent longer than usual. Sonny felt a bit nervous under her gaze, knowing that he was being evaluated. With Changing Star's skill and insight, it wasn't hard to imagine just how much she had gleaned from his battle performance. Both his current level and future potential must have been pretty much laid bare in front of her. Were they enough to make teaching him worth her while? After some time, she took the soul shards and nodded. Okay. Sonny smiled, congratulating himself on a successful deal. Not only did he receive a lot while not losing much, but he had also managed to create a bit of a favorable impression of himself in the eyes of Nephi's and Cassie. As far as performances went, this was a great one. So when do we start? Nephi shrugged. Now. Now. Sonny glanced at the sun, which was already almost gone. Were they going to train in complete darkness? It wasn't really an obstacle for him. Changing star, however. We will start with some words. That will be enough for today. After hesitating a little, she added. Cassie, you listen too. Sonny and Kasha turned to Nephi's, listening to her like two obedient students. Despite the fact that their age was more or less similar, both knew that, in terms of martial prowess, their companion had authority that was as beyond theirs as a dragon's might was beyond that of a worm. Nephi's thought for a while and then said. Mastery of combat can be divided into two aspects. One is body, and the other one is mind. Training the body is not easy, but it is rather simple. All you need is repetition and experience. In a fight, things happen too fast to consider every detail in the moment. That's why your technique must exist in your muscles and bones, so much so that it almost becomes an instinct. She paused. You can achieve initial results through repetition. Then, it must be cemented through experience. The more battle experience you have, the deeper a technique will be assimilated into your body. There is no other way. A thousand hours of training won't be as impactful as one real fight. Only those who survive countless battles can be truly in command of the body. That simultaneously made a lot of sense and no sense at all. On the one hand, the principle of improving through practice was quite logical. On the other hand, Changing Star's statement made it seem like all those lofty legacies with their years of training were nothing but harmless children. After all, no matter how good their tutors were, they had no real battle experience. But then again, she did wipe the floor with every one of them excluding Castor, with no apparent difficulty. So maybe her statement was true. That, however, posed a question of its own, just what kind of life had Nephi's led to possess rich battle experience at the tender age of 18? Should I stop calling her princess? Meanwhile, Nephi's continued. Training the mind, however, is not simple at all. That is because, once you reach a certain level of skill, the mind is where the true combat takes place. 
The outcome is often decided before your body begins to move. And to master the mind, the first step is to understand the essence of combat. However, very few people truly do. She looked at them and asked. What do you think that essence is? Sunny hesitated. The essence of combat? What might it be? If it was some other legacy, he would have been tempted to say something stupid like honor, valor, or duty. But he already knew that Nephi's did not fit into the image of a noble aristocrat he had in his mind. She wasn't someone who followed empty words. After a minute or so, Cassie finally answered. Victory. And almost at the same time, Sonny said. Survival. Changing Star shook her head. No. Then she rubbed her neck and pierced them with a cold, fierce gaze. The essence of combat is murder. Cassie flinched and opened her eyes wide. Sonny frowned a little. Nephi's, however, did not seem to care. In the same calm tone, she continued. At the core of it, there is only this, you are trying to kill your opponent, and they are trying to kill you. In the end, one of you will be killed, and the other one will be the killer. Everything else is just noise. Her words sank deep into Sonny's heart and reverberated there, causing something inside of him to resonate and awaken. Style doesn't matter. Weapons don't matter. Reason and intent do not matter. The only thing that matters is to be the last one standing. In this way, anything you do in combat must be viewed as only serving one of two purposes, either to kill your enemy or to prevent the enemy from killing you. Nephi's lowered her eyes. If you can understand that, you will have enough clarity to master the mind. After that, Sonny couldn't fall asleep for a long while. He lay on the cold stone, looking into the darkness and thinking about what Nephi's had taught them. Repetition, experience, clarity. These were the three keys to becoming a fearsome warrior. All three were important, but the last one was the most vexing. Was it really how Changing Star had said? Was there nothing at the core of being a warrior than a cold will to kill? Intuitively, he felt that it was indeed so. This ruthless truth was, in a sense, an amalgamation of all his life experiences. After all, for someone like him, life was nothing but a constant battle for survival. Someone always won, and someone always lost. The former got to live for a few more days, the latter, no one cared what happened to them. Of course, life was life, and combat was combat. To most people, they weren't one and the same. But what about the awakened? The sole purpose of their existence was to fight against the nightmare creatures. Very few could escape that fate. After coming to the academy, Sonny allowed himself to think that he had escaped the fate of always having to struggle at the edge of survival. But now, it seemed like he had just exchanged one battle for another. This was an uncomfortable thought. However, if he looked at it from a different perspective, did it actually mean that he always had a crucial advantage? Most of those chosen by the spell were forced to somehow adjust to this merciless way of life. But he had always lived like this. Was he actually one of the few perfectly suited to be an awakened? With this thought, Sonny fell asleep. In the early morning, he was awakened by a piercing scream, chapter 43 repetition. Sonny was on his feet even before fully waking up. Somehow, Azure Blade was already in his hand. His shadow was hovering beside him, ready to either wrap itself around the sword in case he needed to attack or around his body, in case it was already too late for that. He tried to understand what was going on. Nephi's was nearby, her longsword raised in a defensive stance. Cassie, where's Cassie? Fearing what he might see, giant tentacles reaching for them from the darkness, he looked around. The eastern horizon was just beginning to show the first hints of dawn, adding a tiny shade of gray to the blackness of the world. In that blackness, there were no signs of danger. Finally, he saw Cassie. The blind girl was stumbling at the edge of the platform with a horrified expression on her face. With her blonde hair in a mess, she was stretching her hands out, clearly lost in space. Of course, there were no walls for her to find. The platform was open to the elements, and the only thing waiting for Cassie was a plunge into the dark, tumultuous waters. Before Sonny knew what he was doing, he was already running. That wasn't a very smart thing to do after all, he did not know what had caused Kasha to scream and if there was some hidden danger nearby. Plus, it was still too dark for Nephi's to see. 
His sudden lunge could have caused her to lash out with the sword before asking questions. All of these were good reasons to wait and observe first, but in an uncharacteristic and completely irrational manner, Sunny acted before thinking. He caught Cassie moments before she took a step off the platform and, holding her tightly in his arms, dragged the blind girl back. I got her. Sunny yelled, letting Changing Star know that there was no need to stab him with a sword. And then, in a quiet voice, he said to Cassie. I got you. It's all right. Everything is fine. Calm down. He felt the girl's body trembling and looked around again, trying to understand what had scared her so much. But there was nothing. Nephi's was listening to the sea for the same reason. After a few seconds, she asked. Do you see anything? Sonny helplessly shook his head. No. He helped Cassie sit down in the center of the platform. While Nephi's stood guard above them, he looked the blind girl over to make sure that there were no wounds on her body. Everything seemed to be fine. She's not hurt anywhere. Changing Star looked down. Although her face remained indifferent, he could tell that she was a bit flustered. After a second or two, she asked in something that might have been her version of a calming tone. It sounded pretty much exactly the same as usual. Cassie? What happened? Magically, that did seem to calm the blind girl down a little. At least enough for her to speak in a quivering voice. Cassie extended one hand and pointed down. Th, the head. I saw, oh gods. Sunny frowned and looked at Nephi's. Did she see a vision? The past? The tall girl was silent for a moment. I don't know. It never happened before. Both of them turned to Cassie, not sure what to do. Since there was no apparent danger around, they took turns trying to calm the horrified girl down. However, after that one sentence, she fell quiet and refused to speak again. Nothing seemed to help. After a while, Nephi sighed. Let's leave her be, for now. Maybe she needs time. Sonny was about to retort, but, truth be told, he didn't have any ideas either. In the end, he just nodded. Okay. I'll keep an eye on her. Changing Star, however, had other ideas. As the sun was rising and the surging sea was receding, Nephi chose to give Cassie some space and led Sunny to the edge of the platform. However, she made sure to always have the blind girl in the periphery of her vision. Kasia sat hugging her knees. Her eyes were closed, but small tremors that periodically ran through her body betrayed that she was awake. Sunny's eye twitched. Are you sure it's okay to leave her like this? Nephi's gave him a complicated look. Yes. Then, after some thought, she added. Cassie is strong. Sunny wasn't sure how to answer. If Changing Star considered someone to be strong, then they most likely were. However, strong was the last word that came to his mind when he thought about the delicate, beautiful, blind girl. Wasn't she someone who constantly needed their help? But then again, there were different kinds of strength. Kasha was still alive and sane despite her debilitating flaw. How many people could have done the same, if you say so? Then, Nephi's made him summon the Azure Blade. After studying it for a while, she nodded and took her longsword out of the air. Despite its size, it was an elegant weapon. The narrow, double-edged blade was much longer than that of the Azure Blade, with an incredibly sharp, symmetrical tip. The whole blade, as well as the simple cross-shaped guard and the pommel, seemed to be made out of silver and reflected the pale morning light. The handle was tightly wrapped in black leather. Putting the two swords side by side, Nephi spoke. Your sword can be used with one hand, but its true potential can only be revealed when held in both. It is created primarily for cutting and severing, hence the higher center of gravity. However, it can thrust as well. Then she gestured to hers. My sword is a bit more versatile. It is created for both cutting and thrusting, and it has a double edge. However, the principle of wielding these two swords is effectively is the same. She took the sword in both hands, placing one near the guard and another near the pommel. Then, she performed a downward slash. They are both leverage-based weapons. When held with two hands, one hand pushes, she pushed the sword down with the hand near the guard. While the other hand pulls. The hand near the pommel simultaneously pulled the handle up, giving the blade a tremendous boost in speed. 
This is how you generate force and perform powerful strikes. Now, your turn. Sunny looked at his sword and gripped it with both hands, mimicking Nephi's pose. Then, he raised it and slashed down, making sure to enhance the force of the strike with his lower hand. Changing Star observed him. You need to understand that a strike doesn't come from the hands. It comes from your whole body. Power comes from your feet, your hips, your core, your shoulders, and is only then transmitted to your hands. Like this. She demonstrated the downward slash again. This time, Sunny paid attention to the overall stance and movements of every part of Changing Star's body, as opposed to only the sword. He wasn't a novice to fighting, instinctively, he already knew how to deliver a proper punch, even if, before, there wasn't a lot of strength in his body. The principles of striking with a sword were largely the same, so Sunny quickly understood the overall concept. He performed the simple downward slash a few more times. After each time, Nephi's gave him pointers and corrected his mistakes. Some time later, she was finally satisfied with his form. Good. Sunny smiled, proud of his achievements. Nephi's looked at him thoughtfully and nodded. Now, do it a thousand more times. The smile froze on Sunny's face. A thousand? Did she say a thousand? He blinked. Ah, uh, sorry. How many times? Changing Star tilted her head and thought for some time. Well, we don't have much time today. So, yes. Only a thousand. Ha. Ha ha. Only a thousand, eh? Sonny forced himself to sound polite. I see. All right. As Nephi's walked back to sit with Cassie, he turned to the sea and raised his sword. One, the azure blade whistled as it cut the air. He raised it again. Two, push and pull. This is how you generate force. Three, strike with your whole body, not just your hands. Four, as Sonny raised his sword and slashed down over and over again, only one thought eventually remained in his mind. Repetition, experience, clarity. Repetition. By the time he was done performing a thousand strikes, Cassie was finally ready to speak Chapter 44 Cassie's Dream. Chapter 44 Cassie's Dream. With pretty much every muscle in his body sore, Sonny walked over to the girls and fell on the ground. After catching his breath, he looked at Kasha. Cassie? Do you feel better? Several seconds later, the blind girl slowly nodded. That's a relief. He shifted and hesitated for a bit. Kasha didn't look too well. Her face was still very pale, with a distant, dazed expression on it. Her body at least was no longer trembling. Sonny wasn't very good at talking to people, let alone placating them. He wasn't sure what to say. He cast a gaze at Nephi's and sighed inwardly. Who knew that one day he would turn out to be the most sociable person for as far as the eye could see? What a joke. Can I have some water? Cassie turned to him and scowled, as though confused by the question. Then, she suddenly gasped and opened her eyes wide. Oh. Oh, sorry. Yes, of course. She summoned the limitless water bottle and offered it to Sonny. He took it with a grateful smile and greedily drank a few gulps before giving the bottle to Nephi's. Eventually, it returned to Cassie. You drink some too. After she did, he awkwardly patted the blind girl on the shoulder. Everything seems to be fine now. Uh, did you dream of another vision? You can tell us. If you want. Cassie hesitated for a bit before saying. I, don't know. Maybe it was just a nightmare. Sonny and Nephi's exchanged glances. They both doubted that what Cassie saw was a simple nightmare. After all, people usually did not dream in the dream realm. The blind girl, meanwhile, continued. I don't really remember. It's all in fragments. Sonny carefully considered his words, not wanting to pressure Cassie too much. You can just tell us what you remember. Maybe we'll be able to make sense of it together. Kasha sighed and tentatively nodded. After a long pause, she finally found the courage to speak. At first, I saw a boundless darkness locked behind seven seals. Something vast was churning in the darkness. I felt like if I directly saw it, I would lose my mind. 
As I watched, terrified, the seals broke one after another, until only one remained. And then that seal broke, too. She trembled a little. After that. I don't know. It was as though my mind shattered into a thousand shards, each shard reflecting its own image. Most of them were dark and scary. Some I have already forgotten. The other. Cassie fell silent, remembering. I saw the human castle again. Only this time, it was at night. There was a lowly star burning in the black skies, and under its light, the castle was suddenly consumed by fire, with rivers of blood flowing down its halls. I saw a corpse in a golden armor sitting on a throne, a woman with a bronze spear drowning in a tide of monsters, an archer trying to pierce the falling sky with his arrows. Finally, she looked up, her face full of horror. In the end, I saw a colossal, terrifying crimson spire. At its base, seven severed heads were guarding seven locks. And at the top, a, a dying angel was being consumed by hungry shadows. When I saw the angel bleed, I suddenly felt as though, as though something so precious that it can't be described with words was taken from me. Her voice became quieter. Then, I felt so much sorrow, pain and rage that what little remained of my sanity seemed to disappear. That was when I woke up. I think. Nephi's and Sunny remained silent for a while, trying to make sense of what Cassie had told them. Even if Nephi's had an idea, she didn't show it. Sonny, however, was totally lost. He couldn't even begin to decipher the hidden meaning behind the vision, if it even was one. Previously, Cassie's vision about the castle was pretty much straightforward. It showed her a human fortress and even the direction in which it was situated. This time, however, her dream was disjointed, full of weird symbolism and vague, uncertain images, much more like a charlatan's prophecy than a vision gained through an aspect ability. Finally, he sighed. Maybe it actually was just a nightmare. Your previous visions weren't like this, right? Cassie silently shook her head. Sonny scratched the back of his head. Well, people don't usually dream in the dream realm, but you do. Perhaps seeing a random nightmare once in a while is a side effect of your ability. The blind girl turned to him, a faint relief written on her face. You really think so? He hesitated, trying to find the right words. Why not? It's a possibility. Inwardly, however, he felt uneasy. A dying angel being consumed by shadows, why does it sound so ominous? I should try and stay away from angels in the future. Gee, what has become of my life? A sentence like that doesn't even sound insane anymore. With that, they were finally ready to welcome a new day. Some time later, they were sitting on the western edge of the stone platform, looking at the scavengers below. Sonny's shadow was busy scouting a path to the next high landmark. Were there always that many? Sonny glanced at Nephi's and shook his head. No, there were much more. They seemed to be almost done with the carcass. I doubt it will last until nightfall. Which meant that, by tomorrow, all these beasts would be roaming the labyrinth, making it hard for the three sleepers to make any progress. It would be best to leave today and put some distance between themselves and the horde before the scavengers were done with their feast. However, without scouting a path in advance, there was a chance of not making it to safety in time. Both options were risky. Nephi's frowned, seemingly thinking the same. After a while, she said. I don't want Cassie to spend another night near this statue. Let's leave now. Sonny thought for a while, then opened his mouth to offer his own opinion. However, a sudden commotion below prevented him from speaking. Down at the bottom of the disappearing sea, amidst mounds of broken coral, the carcass of the giant shark-like monster, the remaining half of it, to be precise, was almost stripped of meat. And between its white bones, something was shimmering in the mud. Two extremely large, luminescent crystals. Sonny's eyes widened. Are those? Yes. Shards of two transcendent soul cores. Transcendent, two of them. Suddenly, he was simultaneously filled with greed and fear. Greed because of how rare and precious transcendent soul shards were, fear because the giant shark turned to a be a corrupted devil, at least. One corrupted devil, if not stopped by a saint or a large number of awakened, could potentially destroy an entire city. Sonny belatedly realized that he was much closer to death on that first night than he had previously thought. Should we? Wait and listen. He stared at Nephi's and then obediently listened to the distant, 
barely audible clamor of the scavengers. After a while, he noticed some disharmony in it. Nephi suddenly tensed up. There. She pointed in the direction of the labyrinth. After concentrating on it, Sunny was finally able to notice two massive shadows stepping out of a particularly wide passage. A second later, the creatures casting those shadows appeared in sight. Sunny gulped. Damn. The monsters looked like the scavengers, but not quite. To start with, they were much larger, towering above the surroundings at more than three meters of height. Their carapace seemed to be thicker. It was colored in deep black and scarlet, like an ancient armor drenched in blood. Here and there, vicious-looking spikes were growing out of the carapace, making their every move much more dangerous. Additionally, instead of heavy pincers, their upper arms ended with long, curved, terrifying bone sides. Sonny felt cold sweat running down his spine. What the hell are those things? Nephi tilted her head. Monsters, I guess. Nightmare creatures with one soul core were called beasts. They were dangerous and strong, but mindless. If they were able to develop or were created with a second core, they became monsters. Monsters were much more devastating and possessed some rudimentary, warped form of intelligence. They were the next step in a nightmare beast's evolution. And these two seemed to be bigger, deadlier versions of carapace scavengers. Sunny and Nephi's watched as the two monsters approached the carcass. The scavengers were visibly afraid of them, rushing to get out of the way. Those who were too slow were mercilessly thrown to the side or cut apart by the bone sides. Rivers of azure blood were flowing into the mud. What are they doing? Did they come to absorb the soul shards? Finally, the monsters reached the carcass. Each of them took one of the shards. However, instead of absorbing them, they simply turned around and carried the precious crystals away. The scavengers made way, following the shards with their little, hungry eyes. Sunny blinked and looked at Nephi's. Do we still leave now? Changing Star frowned and hesitated. A few moments later, she shook her head. No. We'll go tomorrow. Then, she turned west and observed the retreating monsters. Get your shadow to follow these two back. Chapter 45 Sound of Laughter because of the shadow fragments Sunny had absorbed in the last few days, the range of shadow control has increased a little. However, it was still far from being enough to explore deep into the labyrinth. He only got the general direction in which the two large monsters were moving. They were going west. After telling this to Nephi's, there was pretty much nothing else for him to do. In the end, Sunny decided to simply rest. The next day was promising to be full of hardships and danger so it was in his best interest to let his body recover as much as it could. Some time later, Sonny was lying on his back, staring at the gray sky. Cassie was sitting beside him, lost in her thoughts. Nephi's was meditating. At least, that's what it looked like, she might as well had been asleep, for all Sonny knew. After a while, Cassie turned to him. Sonny? He tilted his head to look at her. Yeah? The blind girl hesitated. Do you, do you think we'll be able to return home? Sonny glanced at her and furrowed his brow. A few seconds later, he turned away and looked at the sky again. Sure. Cassie smiled. You really think so? Why? What's with all these questions? He sighed and tried to find the right words. Because of her. He pointed at Nephi's, knowing that Cassie won't see it. There was no one else on the stone platform, though, so it was pretty obvious who he was referring to. I'm also not someone to die easily. In fact, I'm willing to bet that you couldn't have found a better duo of sleepers to escort you across the dream realm. If anyone can survive this, it's us. So, yeah. I think that our chances of making it back are pretty high. Cassie suddenly giggled. Aren't you a little too full of yourself? You were in the second to last place. Sonny shrugged. That's only because someone smart told me to keep a low profile. Otherwise, I would have ranked higher. Then, with a grin, he added. Much higher. Third to last, at least. The blind girl couldn't help but laugh. The melodic sound of her laughter made Sonny feel much better. He had not heard anything like that ever since coming to the dream realm. It was nice to see that people were still able to preserve a bit of mirth even in this hellish place. Come to think of it, this was the first time he heard Cassie laugh at all. 
Back in the academy, she was always dull and bleak. After the sudden outburst, Kasha's expression slowly turned wistful. A few seconds later, she asked. What do you miss the most about home? Sonny tried to think of something, but failed. He wasn't sure that he even had a home in the real world, the tiny room he had been renting previously was nothing but a temporary shelter from the rain. As for the real world as a whole, his life there wasn't that pleasant either. Finally, he said. I don't particularly miss anything. Cassie was very surprised. Really? Don't you miss your family? Sonny smiled. I don't have a family. Well, I guess I have a sister somewhere. But we haven't seen each other in many years. Oh. The blind girl fell silent. Several seconds later, she said quietly. I miss my family the most. There was longing and sadness in her voice. Sonny didn't know what to say, so he stayed silent. Mom and Dad must be really worried about me right now. No, no, actually, they wouldn't be worried. They would be heartbroken. They must think that I'm as well as dead already. Sonny glanced at her and sighed. You seem to care about them a lot. Cassie turned to him in confusion. Of course. Isn't it normal? Sonny stared at the gray sky. The wind smelled of rain. After a while, he said. I wouldn't know. In the evening, Nephi's made Sonny perform the thousand strikes again. After that, they ate the last strips of dried scavenger meat and took turns sleeping, so that one of them could always keep an eye on Cassie. Thankfully, nothing happened during the night. When the morning came and the dark sea retreated, they prepared to leave the giant statue. Nephi's was the first one to climb down. Before that, she had a few words to say. Today will be different from before. There will be much more scavengers roaming in the labyrinth. We might not be able to create an ambush or avoid fighting several of them at once. She looked at Sonny. If anything happens, your job is to bring Cassie away. We can retreat by using passages that are too narrow for the scavengers. If we get separated, proceed to the high point by yourselves. Don't wait for me. Do you understand? With a somber expression, he gave her a nod. Nephi's returned it. Good. Time is of the essence, so let's go. With that, she began the descent. After Nephi's reached a point twenty or so meters below them, she found purchase and waited. Using the golden rope, Sonny lowered Cassie down. Just like while climbing up, they took turns helping the blind girl. Luckily, climbing down the statue was much easier. Soon, they reached the ground. Entering the labyrinth, the trio moved forward with haste. The shadow was ahead of them, scouting for monsters and optimal paths. Despite that, their progress was slow and chaotic. They had to constantly change direction to avoid groups of scavengers, often ending up in dead ends or moving further away from their destination. Sonny, who played the role of the scout and navigator, felt his brain slowly starting to boil. At some point, however, they inevitably ended up in a situation where a fight was unavoidable. There was a large group of scavengers at their heels, and a pair of them blocking the path ahead. Neither of the two groups had noticed the sleepers yet, however, since there were no other passages to turn into, it was only a matter of time. Nephi's considered their options for a few seconds. There was a scowl on her face. Finally, she said. If there's only two, we can take them. Sonny looked at her with uncertainty in his eyes, but there's no time to set up an ambush. He wasn't quite sure how they could fight two scavengers at once. Despite how good of a teacher Nephi's was, he only practiced with the sword for a day. Facing against a scavenger alone was risky. Changing Star shrugged. It's almost the same. I'll attack first. You follow behind in the shadows and finish one off once they turn. Then, we kill the second one together. The whole plan was based on the assumption that Nephi's could survive under the onslaught of two scavengers, both attacking her simultaneously. Sonny was very impressed by her prowess, but he wasn't sure that it was possible. There was a large probability that Nephi's would die. He still remembered that she wasn't present in Cassie's first vision, but what else could they do? A bit rattled, Sonny gritted his teeth. All right. After a short pause, Nephi summoned her sword. 
Then, she stepped forward. Chapter 46 Experience After finding a good hiding spot for Cassie, Sunny and Nephi's proceeded forward to face the scavengers. Soon, they saw two hulking silhouettes in the distance. With her lips pursed together, Nephi's threw over her shoulder. Keep up. Then, like a runner preparing for a race, she got down on one knee, inhaled deeply, and lunged forward. Damn! Sunny dove into the deep shadow cast by the wall of the labyrinth and followed, running as fast as he could. However, the distance between them kept growing. Suddenly, he remembered walking behind Nephi's as they crossed the bridge to the academy. Was it his fate to always follow behind her? Changing Star's running speed was incredibly fast. She was practically flying through the air, like an arrow let loose from a bow. One of her arms was stretched backward, holding the sword with its point to the ground. The other was cutting the air with each stride. It took the two scavengers a couple of seconds to realize what was happening after noticing her. By that time, she was almost upon them. With madness burning in their eyes and viscous saliva dripping from their mandibles, the monsters screeched and charged forward. Nephi's did not slow down, as though planning to ram them with her body. Sunny's heart skipped a bit, for terrifying pincers shot through the air. At the last moment, Nephi's fell backward, falling on her side. The inertia carried her forward as she slid through the mud, passing between the scavengers. Then, she twisted her body and stopped herself by plunging the sword into the ground. A bit slower, and she would have been impaled by one of the scavenger's legs. Crazy. She's crazy. By the time Changing Star got back to her feet, one of the scavengers had already turned around. However, Sonny couldn't see what was going on as his sight was blocked by the bulky carapace creatures. He only heard the sound of chitin striking against steel. There was no time to worry about that anyway, since he had his own problems to solve. Due to the insane maneuver that Nephi's had pulled off, the second scavenger lagged a little behind the first one. It was just about to turn around when Sunny finally got close enough to launch an attack. Silently cursing, he ran up a narrow protrusion on the coral wall and jumped, aiming to pierce the weak point at the scavenger's back from above. His shadow was already wrapped around the azure blade, but at the last moment, the scavenger suddenly moved, slightly turning its torso to the right. The blade missed the concave spot where the armor plates connected and instead hit one of them square in the center, sliding helplessly across adamant and chitin. Crap! Instead of killing the beast with one decisive blow, Sonny ended up dealing no damage at all. What's worse, he landed right on top of the scavenger, practically hugging it from behind. In the next moment, the scavenger shook its carapace, throwing the irritating human off. Sonny flew sideways and crashed into the labyrinth wall feeling breath being knocked out of him. Suffocating and disoriented, he fell gracelessly into the mud. Not good. By some instinct, Sonny rolled to the side. Something tore past him and hit the wall, sending pieces of crimson coral flying through the air. Then, he was lifted into the air and thrown backward. But by that time, however, he had already come to his senses. Twisting his body, Sonny managed to land on his feet and take a few steps back without falling. In the next second, his sword was in front of him, held in both hands just like Nephi's had taught him. The scavenger was already charging at him with a menacing fire burning in its eyes. Repetition. Experience. The shadow flowed from the azure blade to his hand, then spread to his arm, shoulder, and then finally covered his whole body. Sonny instantly felt stronger, faster, more resilient. But was it enough? No. To survive, he would definitely also need some luck. One pincer flew at him from the right, the other from the left. There was no time to retreat or dodge sideways. So, instead, Sonny did something that made every instinct in his body scream in protest. He jumped forward, closing the distance to the charging monster. The pincers clashed together with a loud crack behind his back. Instinct or not, it was the only logical step. After all, the attack range of his sword was much shorter than that of the scavenger. He could only fight back by getting close. Before the beast had time to react, Sonny did what he had recently done thousands of times. His muscles moved even before his mind gave the command. With one fluid motion, he raised the sword over his head and slashed downward, pushing with one hand while pulling with the other. His whole body moved in concert to deliver a powerful blow. The azure blade whistled as it cut the air. 
Then, it hit the joint of one of the scavenger's front legs and cleaved right through it, severing the limb entirely. Blue blood sprayed everywhere. Sunny had less than a second to be amazed. I actually did it? But there was no time to be distracted. Due to the loss of its front leg, the scavenger lost balance for a moment, careening forward and down. However, he had seven other legs. This wasn't going to last long. Coincidentally, though, at this exact moment, his other front leg slid in the mud, bringing the monster even further down. Sunny did not waste this chance. Taking a step forward, he thrust the azure blade up, pushing it into the scavenger's mouth. A severed mandible fell to the ground as the monster impaled itself on the sword with its own weight. The massive body of the nightmare creature convulsed before falling still. It was dead. Sunny slowly exhaled, only now feeling the pain in his chest and at the back of his head. He carefully touched it and grimaced. His hand came back wet with blood. At least I'm alive. You have slain an awakened beast, carapace scavenger. You shadow grows stronger. You have. With no time to listen to the spell, Sunny tugged on the sword to dislodge it from the monster's head and hurried to help Nephi's. However, it was too late. The other scavenger was lying in the mud, clearly dead. His limbs were still twitching, indicating that the fatal blow was delivered just moments ago. It seemed like Nephi's had managed to sever its spine by piercing the weak spot at the base of the beast's torso with her long sword. He couldn't see the silver-haired girl behind the bulky carcass. As Sunny approached it, he heard the sound of rugged, strained breathing. Then a shaky voice came from behind the scavenger. Deep don't, don't come any closer. In the deathly silence of the battle's aftermath, Changing Star's voice sounded strange and subdued. Sunny suddenly felt as though someone had squeezed his heart in a fist. Stealing himself, he took another step forward. Nephi's was standing in front of the dead scavenger, trying to catch her breath after the intense fight. There was a bloody gash on her shoulder. However, it didn't look life-threatening. Sunny's attention, though, was instantly drawn to something else. It seemed that at some point during the fight, the tall girl's makeshift seaweed top came apart, leaving her naked above the waist. She was covering her chest with one arm. Behind the arm, squished, the supple fullness of her. Sonny flinched as though someone had stung him and hurriedly turned around. His face was burning. Without thinking about it, he even made his shadow look away. An awkward silence followed. After some time, Sonny forced himself to speak. R, are you all right? Nephi's was slow to answer. Yes. Good. Ah. Uh, Good. I'll, uh. I'll go fetch Cassie then. All right. Feeling as though an army of monsters was chasing him, he walked forward on stiff legs and then quickened his step, barely holding himself from running. Her fault. It's her fault. She should have communicated things clearer. Trying to get the vivid image out of his head, Sonny hurried to the place where Cassie was waiting for them. By the time they returned, Nephi's had already fixed her top and was wearing it as though nothing had happened. However, Sunny couldn't help but feel that the look she gave him was somewhat weird. Forget it. After checking the wound on his head, Changing Star said, It's just a bleeder, nothing serious. Tell me if you feel dizzy and nauseous or have a strong headache, though. Since Sunny had none of these symptoms, he kept quiet. Nephi's looked down at his clothes and sighed, Memory? He opened his mouth to say no, but then fell silent. Come to think of it, when he killed the scavenger, the spell did say something else after informing him about the absorbed shadow fragments. At the time, he was too busy to pay it any attention. Let me check. He summoned be runes and quickly found the cluster representing his memories. Memories, silver bell, puppeteer's shroud, azure blade. Whom? Nothing new. Then what was the spell talking about? Suddenly, he noticed a new set of runes in the neighboring cluster. His eyes widened. Echoes, Carapace Scavenger, Chapter 47 Echo. Echo, it's an echo. Sonny couldn't believe his eyes. Echoes were an extremely rare type of reward that Awakened could receive after slaying nightmare creatures. Chances of getting one were very low. In the real world, an echo could be sold for an unimaginable amount of money. That's because they were much more precious than memories. Without delaying it much further, he dove into his sea of soul. 
There, very few things had changed, a lonely black sun was still hanging above the calm, silent waters. It was orbited by spheres of light that represented his memories. This time, there were three of them. Just like before, Sonny couldn't get rid of the feeling that something was stealthily moving just beyond the periphery of his vision. However, this time, he didn't pay it any attention. He wanted to see his echo. It, too, was represented by a sphere of light. However, this sphere was much larger and hovered further away from the shadow core. With a thought, he commanded it to descend. The sphere slowly floated down and touched the dark water. As Sunny came closer, walking on the surface of the sea, its radiance slowly faded away, revealing the monster contained within. A hulking, menacing carapace scavenger was calmly standing in front of him. There was no madness in its eyes, or any feeling at all, for that matter. After all, it wasn't really alive. It was just an echo. Shining runes appeared in the air around the scavenger. Echo, carapace scavenger. Echo type, beast. Echo core, awakened. Echo attributes, strong, armored. Echo description, a cursed soldier of the fallen legion. Before Sonny knew it, a wide grin appeared on his face. That scavenger was now his, it could be summoned and used to fight against his enemies, carry heavy cargo or perform other tasks. What's more, it was a whole rank above its master, which meant that it was much stronger, more resilient and fearsome than a dreamer with a dormant core should normally possess. With this echo by their side, many things would become easier. Following an impulse, Sonny raised a hand and brushed it against cold, black chitin. He just wanted to touch his new possession. However, the moment his palm touched the scavenger, a strange thing happened. The soul of sea suddenly surged a little, and a new set of runes appeared. Transform Echo into a shadow? Sonny flinched and snatched his hand back. What the hell is that about? He had never heard anything about transforming echoes into something else, let alone shadows. Then again, he had never heard about shadow cores and fragments, too. It seems my aspect holds more secrets than I thought. Sonny licked his lips and hesitated. Then, he cautiously said. Yes. However, nothing happened. A moment later, the runes changed. Not enough shadow fragments to perform a transformation. Shadow fragments required, 24 slash 100. He frowned, disappointed. I see. So there is another use for the fragments. They can either enhance my own core or do something weird to echoes. How do I know which use is more beneficial without knowing what a transformation actually does? An echo was plenty useful by itself. Sonny felt that it would be wiser to concentrate on strengthening himself, at least for now. I'll experiment with it later. With that, he left the Sea of Soul. Since he had spaced out for quite a bit, Nephi's was looking at him with a silent question in her eyes. Sunny grinned. Her pupils slightly widened. Cassie, on the other hand, was more expressive. An echo? You actually got an echo? Yes. Since the larger group of monsters was now minutes away from catching up with them, Sunny didn't waste any time and summoned the scavenger. The hulking beast immediately appeared in front of him, seemingly sewn together from tiny sparks of light. Soon, its black chitin became fully corporeal. Following Sunny's command, it shifted a little and raised its mighty pincers. Nephi's observed the echo with an unreadable expression. Then, a corner of her lip slightly curled up. Good. Sunny looked at her with a smile. I think we can task it with carrying Cassie. Outside of battle, it will help us the most. The blind girl's mouth fell open. Carry me? Like, like a mount? He chuckled and slapped the scavenger on its carapace. This bad boy can fit a petite girl like you with no problem at all. Trust me. I've been clambering these things a lot for the past few days. It's actually quite spacious on top of them. Especially if they're not trying to kill you. Cassie hesitated. Well, okay. If you think it's for the best. Sonny and Nephi's helped the blind girl to climb on top of the Echo. Then, they used the golden rope to create makeshift reins for Cassie to hold onto. After quickly retrieving soul shards from the dead scavengers, the sleepers hastily left the passage, narrowly avoiding another battle. With Cassie riding comfortably atop the scavenger, their overall speed dramatically increased. 
Sunny and Nephi's were jogging in the front, hoping to recoup the time lost in the first half of the day and reach the high point with an hour or two to spare. From time to time, they had to take detours to avoid fighting groups of carapace monsters. However, with a monster of their own by their side, the mood and mental state of the three sleepers were much better. For the first time since coming to this place, Sonny felt somewhat calm. Of course, this calmness didn't last long. At some point, he noticed that the wind had picked up a bit. Almost simultaneously, Cassie asked them to stop. Nephi's and Sonny looked at her with deep frowns. It seemed that they both had a bad premonition. What is it? The blind girl let go of the reins. Do you hear anything? They looked at each other, then shook their heads. No. Why? Cassie scowled. Help me get off this thing. After they helped her, she stood motionless for a while, listening. Her scowl deepened. Then the blind girl cautiously kneeled and put her ear to the ground. What do you hear? Cassie licked her lips. It's murmuring. Suddenly, a drop of water fell on Sunny's face. He raised his head and looked at the sky. There, dark stormy clouds were gathering with unnatural speed. Pretty soon, they were bound to cover it completely, including the sun. And when that happened, his eyes widened chapter 48 the storm. We need to move, now. As Nephi's turned to him, Sonny grabbed Cassie and helped her stand up. His face was even paler than usual, and there was a panic look in his eyes. Now! Help me get her back on the scavenger. The silver-haired girl raised her head and looked at the sky. Soon, her expression darkened. Without saying anything, she did as he had asked. Cassie seemed a bit disoriented. She grabbed the reins and helplessly turned to her friend. Naf? What is going on? Changing Star glanced at her. When she eventually spoke, her voice sounded heavy. A storm is coming. Meanwhile, Sonny sent his shadow to climb on top of a tall pillar of coral and looked ahead, trying to understand how far the cliffs they were aiming for were. From the look of it, there was still a considerable distance to go. However, the giant statue was already much further away. Going back now would have been suicide. He turned to Nephi's. We're about three or four kilometers away from the cliffs. Do, do you think we can make it? She scowled. If we take the most direct route. Maybe. Sonny hesitated, then asked. What about the monsters? Changing Star looked ahead and gritted her teeth. We'll have to cut through. That's it? That's the plan? As he was fruitlessly trying to come up with some devious trick to save them, Nephi's turned her head and glanced at him, puzzled. What are you waiting for? Run. As they darted forward, heavy drops of rain were starting to fall on the ground. Strong winds were howling between the coral blades, sending bits of mud and seaweed flying. With storm clouds gathering in the sky, sunlight dimmed, and a cold twilight descended upon the labyrinth. Sonny was running with all his might, as though his life depended on it because it actually did. He was leading their small group, choosing the straightest path toward the cliffs with the help of his shadow. Nephi's was a step behind him. The scavenger carrying Cassie was stomping through the mud with its eight legs in the back. Without the need to avoid monsters and death breathing down their necks, they moved with amazing speed. Side passages and crimson walls were flashing past them in a blur. There was no need to hold back and conserve strength for the long run if they were late to reach the cliffs by a minute, their lives would be over. They had to give it their all. Sonny was ready to fight a series of bloody skirmishes all along the way, but, to his surprise, the inhabitants of the labyrinth did not give them much trouble. The scavengers seemed to be as panicked as they were. The bulky beasts were busy trying to hide inside the coral mounds or burrowing underground. On the rare occasions when one of them showed aggression, a quick slash of the sword or a threatening clack of a pincer was enough to make the monster change its mind. However, no matter how fast they were moving, the storm was faster. The rain quickly turned into a pelting downpour, each drop becoming a torrent. The winds grew in strength, striking against their bodies with enough force to make them stumble. The light dimmed even further, reducing visibility to almost zero. Finally, a blinding bolt of lightning tore through the darkness, followed almost immediately by a deafening thunderclap. In the next moment, the ground under Sonny's feet trembled, causing him to lose balance and fall. He rolled in the mud and tried to stand up, 
but slipped and fell again. Someone's arm grabbed him by the shoulder and helped him rise. In the darkness of the storm, Sunny saw changing Star's face. She opened her mouth and shouted. Don't stop. Run. He almost couldn't hear her behind the roaring wind and rain. By the time Sunny began to move, the dark, salty water was already as high as his shins. He gritted his teeth. The sea was coming back. He couldn't determine where the water was coming from, but with each minute, it was rising higher. Soon, it was up to his knee, then up to his waist, making running almost impossible. The speed of the group slowed down considerably. It was then, in a sudden flash of lightning, when they saw a dark mass of stone ahead. They had made it to the cliffs. Almost at the same time, a terrible rumbling sound came from the depths of the labyrinth. Turning back, Sunny saw a colossal, crushing torrent of black water rushing through the crimson forest. Some distance away, a tardy scavenger was caught by it and thrown against the coral walls. The unbreakable carapace of the mighty creature cracked and burst open like a rotten egg. Curses! He turned to Nephi's. Time is up. Start climbing. She caught him by the arm. Dismiss your echo. Sonny didn't know whether the scavenger could scale the cliff. In any case, Cassie wouldn't have been able to hold on if it did. He helped the blind girl get down and then sent the monster back to the Sea of Soul. Nephi's lowered herself to let Cassie climb on her back, then tied them together with the golden rope. Not wasting any time, she gritted her teeth and stepped forward to grab onto the wet rocks of the cliff wall. They began the ascent, rushing to get as high as possible before the black torrent hit. Some time later, Sunny screamed. Brace! In the next moment, a wall of dark water hit the rocks mere meters beneath their feet. As Sunny held for dear life, the whole cliff shuddered. A few boulders fell from somewhere high above, missing his head only by chance. Somehow, all three of them were still alive. However, things were far from being over. The black water was still rising, now with frightening speed, threatening to swallow them at any second. They had to keep climbing, and they had to be faster than the surging sea. Sonny cursed as he searched for the next hold to grab onto. To survive, he had to scale the face of the cliff with crazy speed. However, hastily climbing wet rocks was a recipe for disaster, one slip of a hand, and he would plunge down to be crushed against the cliffs, drown, or be eaten by some giant monster. The torrential rain and hurricane wind made everything even worse. And yet, there was no choice. He frantically kept climbing, tearing his skin on sharp rocks. Every muscle in his body was in agony. If not for the shadow wrapped tightly around his body, Sonny would have been long dead. But even with its help, the surging dark water was getting closer and closer. Damn it! Damn it all! No matter how hard Sonny tried, he couldn't win back any distance. Soon, the water was at his feet. The sea slowly swallowed his legs, then his torso. He kept climbing, now fighting against the weight of the water and the force of the tide that was trying to tear him away from the cliff. But it was useless in the end. When the water covered his shoulders, he felt his fingers slipping from the wet rocks. Sonny tried to hold on, but the current was too strong. He was pushed away like a weightless toy, losing any purchase. No! In the last second, a golden rope fell into the water beside him. Shaken, Sonny grabbed onto it and held with all his strength. The rope drew tight and lifted him out of the water. His feet touched the cliff wall again. Not wasting any time, he resumed climbing with the help of the rope. Finally, a strong hand grabbed him from above and dragged his body over the edge of the cliff. Sonny fell to the ground, struggling to breathe. After some time, he looked at Nephi's, who was lying in a similar position to his right, equally as drained. She was still clutching the golden rope in her hand. Cassie was sitting a few steps away from them. He wanted to laugh, but had no strength for it. They survived Chapter 49 Natural Element. For a few minutes, Sonny simply lay on the ground, letting the rain hit his face. From time to time, a bolt of lightning arced through the skies, drowning everything in blinding light. Other than that, it was almost completely dark. If not for his attribute, he would have had trouble discerning the shapes of Nephi's and Cassie, who were resting nearby. After some time, however, a feeling of uneasiness entered his mind. Something was off. Sonny scowled trying to understand where that feeling was coming from. 
Finally, he realized that it was his shadow. It was trying to draw his attention to something. Please, let me rest. I just want to rest. He was too tired to do anything. Both his body and mind were exhausted. However, the shadow was very persistent. It remained adamant. In the end, Sunny moaned and rolled over on his stomach, then slowly stood up. Nephi turned her head and looked at him. What is it? He grimaced. I don't know yet. Something feels wrong. Cassie shivered and got closer to Neff. Following his shadow's warning, Sonny looked around, trying to find any sign of danger in their surroundings. Even with his vision, he couldn't see anything out of place. The upper part of the cliffs was well above the stormy sea, forming a small island. Its surface was rugged and uneven, with several protruding ridges breaking the line of sight. There was a large space between their group and the nearest ridge. That space was littered, seemingly at random, with piles of dirt and tall boulders. Nephi's got up and summoned her sword. Do you see anything? Sunny frowned. Not really. At that moment, another lightning flashed, briefly illuminating the small island. His eyes widened. The tall boulders surrounding them were massive and irregularly shaped. They were black in color and motionless, that's why Sunny had not recognized them for what they were at first glance. All around them, scavengers were silently lying on the ground. Sonny froze, suddenly consumed by terror. The hairs on the back of his neck bristled and stood up on ends. One, two, three, he lost count because of panic and gritted his teeth. Seven, no, eight of them. It seemed the three humans were not the only ones who thought of taking shelter from the dark sea on these cliffs. He trembled. These cliffs were a death trap. Noticing something on his face, Nephi's tensed. Sonny? He slowly turned his head to her and whispered. Don't speak. Don't move. Just, stay where you are. She followed his instructions without asking for the reason. However, a silent question appeared on her face. Cassie did the same. Sonny closed his eyes and breathed in, trying to calm his panicking mind down. There were no hopeless situations. Every problem had a solution. He just had to think of one. The scavengers did not attack yet. Maybe they were asleep or patiently waiting out the storm, trying not to move in fear of attracting more terrifying monsters. Maybe they simply did not notice the humans. After all, it was unknown how well these creatures could see. Were they able to see in the dark? Probably not, or at least not as well as he could. There was still hope. Sonny opened his eyes and looked at the small island again. But this time, his perspective was different. He saw the deep darkness, the clamor of the storm that drowned out most of the sounds, the large distance between the scavenger. This was his territory. It was perfectly suited for a murderous shadow. Didn't he dream of becoming a silent assassin? Well, here was his chance. He just had to execute each step perfectly, crawl through the darkness, strike without alerting the enemy, kill each of them with one precise blow, rinse and repeat. He already knew their strengths and weaknesses, all that was left was to put that knowledge to practice. And even if he makes a mistake, there were other means to fall back onto. Echo and Nephi's could do their part if he were to land himself in danger. Yes, that could work. It had to. Sonny looked at Changing Star and Cassie. I'll take care of this. Before they could react, he seemed to dissolve into the shadows. Under the cover of darkness, Sonny sneaked forward. His steps were soft and measured, his breathing controlled. He quickly determined the optimal order of attack to minimize the chance of being discovered and proceeded to the first target, a hulking scavenger that was the furthest away from the pack. Hidden in the shadows, Sonny suddenly felt calm and focused. He felt as though he was finally in his natural element. As the looming silhouette of the scavenger approached, he slowed down and circled around his target. The monster did not move, oblivious to the lurking threat that was drawing closer with each second. Sonny held his breath and prepared to attack. He only had one chance. Do it right. With that thought, he silently lunged forward. One step, two. Sonny jumped and easily landed on the monster's carapace. The azure blade was already in his hand, its steel dark. A moment later, it plunged into the weak point on the scavenger's back, piercing the chitin and destroying its brain. 
The quiet crack of the breaking carapace was quickly washed away by the rain. It was done. Sonny felt a sense of triumph appear in his heart and quickly suppressed it. This wasn't the right time to celebrate seven targets were still waiting for him in the darkness. He retrieved his sword and jumped down from the scavenger's corpse. Then, Sonny frowned. Why was the spell silent? It didn't announce his kill, nor the absorption of the shadow fragments. Feeling his skin crawl, Sonny turned around and looked at the scavenger. At first, he was afraid that the beast was still alive, but that wasn't the case. It was as dead as could be. However, on closer inspection, Sonny noticed something that he had missed before. And when he did, his face paled, Chapter 50 Death Trap. The scavenger was dead. However, it wasn't Sonny's blade that killed it. While circling the target, he was focused on staying unnoticed and not alerting the enemy to his presence before reaching the optimal position for an attack. After that, he only saw the monster's back. That's why he didn't notice the terrible wound that ran from the top of the creature's torso to its segmented legs, obscured by the rain. The unbreakable carapace was cut open like a tin can. The scavenger's flesh and mangled organs could be easily seen through the large gap, oozing azure blood. It streamed down only to be washed away by the storm. Sonny gulped. He might have felt awkward about performing a perfect ambush on a long-dead monster if not for the fear of whatever had killed it in the first place. Looking around, he hesitated and summoned the azure blade back, then wrapped himself in the shadow. The small island was silent except for the howling of the wind. The rain was still falling down, forming a constant veil that hid away all details and distant objects. A rare flash of lightning sometimes flooded this bleak world with stark whiteness. Then, a thunderclap would come, making the skies tremble. With cold fright settling deep into his bones, Sonny cautiously moved to the next scavenger. He could tell from some distance that it was also dead, but had to come closer and make sure. Indeed, he was right, the creature was almost severed in half by the unknown assailant. Its wet innards were lying on the ground in a messy pile. The darkness had long ago stopped being comforting, becoming terrifying and oppressive instead. Sonny shivered. By the time he checked on all eight monsters and confirmed that they were all dead, he was nauseous and scared out of his wits. When Sonny had first realized that the black shapes were, in fact, scavengers, he thought that the situation was as bad as it could get. Now, he wasn't sure anymore. In fact, he was pretty convinced that things went from bad to worse. Standing near the last scavenger, Sonny observed his surroundings and thought about returning to Neff and Cassie. Maybe the terrifying killer had already left the island. They could just hide and hope for the best. He wouldn't be alone, at least. However, not knowing what kind of danger was hiding in the darkness would drive him insane long before the morning came. Plus, with his faded attribute, hoping for the best was a fool's errand. That's why, although his body was covered in cold sweat, Sonny gritted his teeth and slowly walked toward the ridge that was obscuring the rest of the island from him. Coming close, he started climbing, trying to be as quiet as possible. The ridge wasn't very high, so he was able to scale it without much effort. Sticking close to the rocks, he raised his head a look down. Then, he immediately wanted to let go and fall to the ground. Right beneath him, just a few meters away, a dark silhouette was outlined against the rocks. It was much larger than the scavengers, with jagged spikes growing out of its thick carapace. Its chitin was black and crimson, like an ancient armor splattered with fresh blood. Instead of pincers, two terrifying bone sides were protruding from the joints of its arms. Each one was long and sharp enough to split a scavenger in two. Sonny froze, afraid to move. He even stopped breathing. So that's the killer. It was one of those monsters that they had seen retrieving the transcendent soul shards from the giant shark's carcass, or another of their kind. He remembered how the two creatures had cut through the horde of scavengers, killing or throwing aside any beast that got in their way. Slaughtering just seven of them would not pose a problem for something that deadly. Not to mention getting rid of three sleepers. Careful not to make a sound, Sonny slowly lowered himself down. His whole body was trembling. Moving his arms and legs with utmost precision, he began climbing down from the ridge, praying not to be heard, sensed, or noticed in some other way. Luckily, the monster remained oblivious to his presence. Reaching the ground, Sonny took a few steps back, still facing the ridge. He had to force himself to turn around. Feeling as though his back was being pierced by invisible needles, the young man stealthily moved in the direction where he had left his companions. A couple of minutes later, he returned to Nephi's and Cassie. 
The girls were tense and nervous, waiting for his return in the darkness. Before coming out of the shadows, Sunny let them know that he was approaching. It's me. Nephi's moved, lowering her sword a little. Her face was a little grim. What is the situation, she said, careful to keep her voice low. Sunny slowly exhaled, finally feeling a bit safer. For the first time, he was genuinely happy not to be alone in this cursed place. There are eight scavengers around us. But they're all dead. The killer is one of those big monsters we saw, the thing with the crimson pattern on its carapace and sides instead of pincers. It's hiding from the storm beneath a stone ridge not far from here. A bolt of lightning flashed, illuminating everything around. In its aftermath, it looked as though two white sparks ignited in changing star's eyes. Soon, the reflection was gone, leaving them gray and inscrutable again. She tilted her head and whispered, as though talking to herself. An awakened monster. Sonny licked his lips. Yeah. So, what should we do? Nephi's thought for a while, leaning on her sword. Then, she looked at him and said. Kill it. Sonny stared at her, lost for words. Finally, he collected himself and said the first thing that came to his mind. Are you nuts? The idea of fighting that thing was pretty ridiculous, if not completely insane. Realizing that his words might have sounded a bit rude, he cleared his throat and added. I mean, have you thought this through? How are we supposed to kill that monstrosity? Nephi slowly inhaled. It's not a question of thinking things through. We simply have no choice. She glanced at Cassie, who was listening to them with a pale face, and explained. We can't leave the cliffs before morning, and neither can the monster. However, once the sun rises, it will easily see us and attack. Then, our only advantage, the element of surprise, will be gone. If we have to fight it anyway, it's better to be the ones initiating the fight. Changing Star looked around and added. It's not completely dark yet. Although barely, I can still see. Once the night comes, this won't be the case. So we will have to attack it first, and do it soon. Sonny shook his head. This still doesn't explain how we are going to kill it. That thing just dispatched eight scavengers like it was nothing. We are not its opponents. We don't even know its weaknesses. Nephi's frowned. After a short pause, she said. It's just an awakened monster. Sonny couldn't help but stare at her in disbelief. What do you mean, just an awakened monster? Have you forgotten that all three of us are only sleepers? Dormant humans are not supposed to be able to deal with awakened beasts, let alone monsters. The fact that we can reliably kill scavengers is already abnormal. She looked back at him, undisturbed, and simply answered. But we are abnormal. Sonny stood there with his mouth open, not knowing what to say. Nephi sighed. You and I both are not exactly ordinary sleepers. Aren't we? Don't try and deny it. Someone ordinary simply would not have survived in this place. He frowned, not happy about her line of thought. Meanwhile, Changing Star continued. You, me, plus the awakened beast you have as an echo, plus the advantage of a surprise attack. I'm not saying that it will be easy. We might die but there's a good chance that we won't. She looked down at the silvery blade of her sword and added after a couple of seconds. In any case, as I have already said, we don't have a choice. Sonny gritted his teeth, trying to find a logical retort. However, her reasoning seemed unassailable. He just had a really bad feeling about fighting that monster. In the ensued silence, Cassie, who had been quiet all this time, suddenly spoke. You are forgetting about the main advantage we have over that thing. Both of them looked at her, surprised. The blind girl turned to face them and slightly lifted her head. We are intelligent, and the monster is not. Her words echoed in the darkness. Sunny sighed. It seemed that a fight with the bone scythe monster was inevitable. Sometime later, he was standing in the darkness, looking at the terrifying creature in front of him. His expression was grim and somber. Tightly gripping the azure blade, Sonny slowly inhaled. The ominous feeling he had before was still there, now stronger than ever. I don't like this. With this thought, he exhaled and raised his hand. 